The House will come to order. Today, the Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Braden Bockenfeld, Faith Lutheran Preschool, Parker, Colorado, the grandson of Representative Bockenfeld. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, and the baseball of liberty and justice for all. Mr. Schiebel, please take the roll. Representatives Amabile, Armagost, Bacon, Bird, Bockenfeld, Basenecker, Bottoms, Bradfield, Bradley, Brown, Catlin, Representative Catlin. Excused. Doherty. DeGraff. Degree Kennedy. Dixon. Duran. English. Oh, English is excused. Epps. Evans. Frizzell. Froelich, Garcia, Representative Garcia, Garcia is excused, Gonzalez Gutierrez, excused, Hamrick, Hartsook, Rapperd's excused, Holtorf, Judah, Joseph, Kip, Leader, Lindsay, Linstead, Luck, Representative Luck, excused, Lukens, Minority Leader Lynch is excused, Mabry, Rep Mabry, excused. Marshall, Martinez, Morrow. Excused. Oh, remote. Morrow's on the wall. McCormick, McLaughlin, Michael Sinjane, Ortiz. Yes. Okay. Excused. Ortiz is excused. Parenti, Puglisi, Ricks. Representative Ricks. Excused. Sharbini. Rep Sharbini. Excused. Sirota. Snyder. Soper. Rep Soper. Excused. Story. Taggart. Titone. Valdeze. Velasco, Vigil, Weinberg, Weissman, excuse, Wilford, Wilson, Winter, Woodrow, Young, and Madam Speaker. Here. With 55 present, 10 excused, we do have a quorum.
We'll update that. 56 present and nine excused. We have a quorum. Representative Prenti. Good morning, Madam Speaker. Good morning. Yes, and good morning, colleagues. Colleagues, I just want to take a moment to thank you all for humoring me this week during our readings of the journal. I'm going to give you one final opportunity to choose my legislative photo session or my legislative photo for this General Assembly, and I assure you, I saved the best for last. Because can we all agree that the best photo is the one that captures the spirit of its subject in her entirety? Mr. Liuzzo. <laughs> Colleagues, your yes votes will make this my official photo of the 74th General Assembly. Madam Speaker, I move that the journal of Thursday, March 30th, 2023 be approved as corrected by the Chief Clerk. Members, you have heard and seen the motion that the journal be approved as corrected by the Chief Clerk. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. Excellent, the motion is adopted. Announcements, introductions. Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a tribute that I would like to have read at length, please. Members, we have a tribute. Mr. Schiebel, please read our tribute at length. The Senate and House of Representatives convened in the 74th General Assembly hereby extends congratulations to Katie Anthes on her retirement as CDE Commissioner. The members of the Colorado State Senate and the Colorado State House share their gratitude to Colorado Education Commissioner Dr. Katie Anthes for her leadership as Commissioner since May 2016. Commissioner Anthes has been a knowledgeable and insightful partner to the legislature implementing the laws we pass with thoughtfulness and working with teachers, schools, and district and community partners to share issues and needs back to the General Assembly. Our effective collaboration with Commissioner Anthes has made a difference for students in Colorado through legislation to support educators, increase literacy, support school improvement efforts, and expand work-based learning opportunities for students in high school. Commissioner Anthes' open, fair, and collaborative leadership style has supported meaningful and balanced education policy. The Colorado General Assembly is thankful for Commissioner Anthes' leadership, and we will miss her when she steps down this summer on request of Representative Barbara McLaughlin and Senator Janet Buckner, given this 31st day of March 2023, State Capitol, Denver. Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Speaker, I forget who's up there. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Katie Anthes is just remarkable. This commissioner has been a leader for everyone in the education world. Um, she got to go, she had the pleasure, I think, of going through COVID with everyone. Um, just, she just does so much. And it took us a long time to find someone for this job who was doing what Colorado needs with um, public education. And Commissioner Anthes was absolutely the best person ever chosen for this. And I just can't say thank you enough for all you have done for all of us. And we will miss you. Thank you. Representative Hamrick. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd just like to honor and acknowledge um, the uh, Colorado State Board of Education members. Uh, we have Chair Rebecca McClellan, Vice Chair Lisa Skarjiga, Angelica Schroeder, Stephen Varela, Deborah Scheffel, uh, Steve Durham is, is not here, uh, Carla Esser, Rhonda Solis, and Kathy Plomer. Thank you all, and my own personal congratulations, Commissioner. Well done. Representative Titone. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a tribute, and I'd like to have it read at length, please. Mr. Schiebel. 
The House of Representatives convened in the 74th General Assembly hereby recognizes International Transgender Day of Visibility. The beginning of transgender history is often considered to be with the Stonewall Riots and the figures Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. However, transgender people have always existed all around the world. In Native American cultures, two-spirit people fulfill the traditional role of occupying a third gender role in social culture. In the southern part of Mexico, Mujes are people of a third gender who view gender as something not chosen by them but by their creator. Transgender and third gender people span the diverse cultural history of the world. Today we can look to transgender people and activists and prof professionals who are making strides for the community and society as a whole. Among them are the Wachowski sisters, known for their work directing the Matrix series, actors Christine Jorgensen, Laverne Cox, India Moore, Jamie Clayton, Nicole Maines, Hunter Schaefer, and Jazz Jennings. In 2021, four-star general Rachel Levine was sworn in as the Assistant Secretary of Health, and Martine Rothblatt is the creator of Satellite Radio. The Colorado House of Representatives commends the recent increased visibility of trans people in media and politics, both in the United States and internationally. On request of Representatives Brianna Titone and Stephanie Vigil, given this 31st day of March 2023, State Capitol, Denver. Representative Titone. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you for your attention today. Uh, every year on uh, March 31st is Trans Day of Visibility, uh, really just a day to, to show the accomplishments of, of trans people all over the world. There's uh, elected officials uh, across the globe uh, here in America and in other countries. Uh, there are professionals doing wonderful things and innovations that really help our society. Uh, doctors, professionals, uh, teachers, and we're all just part of the community looking to uh, make our world a better place, just like I am here. And uh, we'd just like you to help acknowledge that. So uh, thank you for your attention today. Thank you. Representative Hill. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you everyone for your attention on this, and I love being joined by so many of my colleagues here to the point that there aren't many left in the room uh, to, uh, to address. Uh, I was thinking uh, about uh, today, uh, just anticipating uh, Trans, uh, Trans Day of Visibility, about how this, the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is structured, and if you haven't had this poetry laid out before, for you before, I won't go into incredible detail because I know we have a full calendar today, but uh, just simply put, the, the, the order of those rights is very intentional, right? We go speech, or we go, uh, you know, freedom of religion and conscience, speech, press, assembly, and then out to petition your government. So it starts with the most, the most personal, intimate things your convictions, your conscience, your identity, and it fans out to how you express it, and then it fans out to how you communicate it, how you associate with others, and then how you make action in the broader world based on those things. And so it has occurred to me over the years that there is really no fight in this world that is more, for lack of a better word, more sacred to the American experiment than to be your own person, even when other people are telling you you don't have a right to be, that you don't have a right to exist, and that violence against you is justified. Uh, so just on this day of visibility, I hope uh, we can all keep that in mind, what an important right that is, that it is the center of all of the others, and celebrate it in all of us. Representative Titone. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, if anybody's ever interested in uh, trying to get some more information about how to talk about trans people in a productive and respectful way, I have some resources on my desk I'm happy to share with you. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of bad information out there. And, you know, having conversations and having resources from trusted sources is really important to making sure that, uh, you know, we can have conversations with each other in a respectful way. So I encourage you, if you are interested in, in getting that information, I have it for you. Uh, and it's available anytime. So thank you. Thank you. Madam Majority Leader. Representative Garcia. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Speaker. It is pretty dang rad to serve with you. It is really dang rad to serve with you. Uh, members, I want to just make an announcement and acknowledge that today is also a very special day 
For those of us, and really all of us, um, in this state and in this country, today is Cesar Chavez Day. Cesar Chavez Day, Cesar Chavez was an incredible, incredible leader, warrior, advocate for workers' rights, for racial justice, for immigrant rights, for pay equity, for child care. And it is an honor to be standing here with members of the Latino Caucus as we recognize Cesar Chavez today in announcements. Representative Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I, I, I wish that we could all join in um, some of the activities that will be this weekend as it takes place in my house district, in House District 4, and that is the Cesar Chavez uh, March um, that goes from Regis University um, to the Cesar Chavez Park off of 41st and Tennyson, which is in my very home in the north side in Denver. Um, and with that, I just want to just, you know, say one of the quotes that, that means a lot um, when we're you know, talking and debating about things, whether it's in this chamber or out in our community, um, when we're fighting um, for equality. Um, this quote always comes to mind. Uh, Preservation of one's own culture does not require contempt or disrespect of other cultures. So I just want to thank you all um, in just recognizing and observing uh, Cesar Chavez Day today. Thank you. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that Senate Bill 188 and 189 be made special orders at 8.30 a.m. Seeing no objections, Senate Bill 188 and 189 will be made special orders at 8.30 a.m. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, pursuant to House Rule 14, I move that the time for debate on Senate Bill 188 be limited to six hours and that the time for debate on Senate Bill 189 be limited to six hours during special orders on March 31st. The motion before us is pursuant to House Rule 14, debate on Senate Bill 188 be limited to six hours and the time for debate on Senate Bill 189 be limited to six hours during special orders on March 31st. This is a non-debatable motion pursuant to House Rule 15E and requires a simple majority vote. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? Aye. Representative Morrow votes aye. Representatives Hartsook, Holtorf, Luck, and Weinberg are excused. Please close the machine. 
With 39 ayes, 16 no, and 10 excused, the motion is adopted. Thank you. Representative Woodrow. Members, you have heard the motion. The House will now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for consideration of special orders. Representative Woodrow will take the chair.
Eliza. The committee will come to order. With your unanimous consent, the bills will be read by title unless there is a request for reading a bill at length. I'm getting feedback if we can fix that. Committee reports are printed and in your bill folders. Floor amendments will be shown on the screen and on your iPads. Bills will be laid over upon motion of the majority leader. The coat rule is relaxed. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 188. Senate Bill 188 by Senators Gonzalez and Hawkes Lewis, also Representatives Froelich and Titone, concerning protections for assessing reproductive health care. Representative Titone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It is an honor to serve with you. Thank you. I move Senate Bill 188. Senate Bill 188 has been moved at 8.34 a.m. to the bill, Representative Titone. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, uh, Senate Bill 188. Uh, this is a bill that is going to help our patients and providers uh, to make sure that they can provide the services that patients need. Uh, it's going to make sure that we protect the patients uh, that comes seeking the care here in Colorado, and we're going to make sure that we're also helping anybody else who is in that process of getting a patient to seek the care here in Colorado. But why is that important? Uh, it's important because there are laws being placed on the books in a lot of other states that trying to reach into other states that are providing the care that we're talking about in this bill. This is care that we're providing here in Colorado. This is care that we should have a right to be able to provide to people under the constitutional rights of our state. I'm not going to sugarcoat the reasons why I'm supporting this bill, and it should be no surprise to anyone here uh, listening or watching that I'm an advocate for personally bodily autonomy. From my point of view, any decision a person makes with their doctor should be between the patient and the doctor. This goes for people managing pregnancy or seeking gender-affirming care. These medical procedures are personal decisions. Personal decisions. Even after Dobbs, states outside of Colorado have been acting egregious laws and policies to seek to limit abortions on gender-affirming care, and we call this legally protected health care in our bill. In some states, they're trying to reach out into other states to prosecute providers of the care and the people seeking or helping to receive this care. The reason for this bill is to try to limit the ability of providers, the reason for what they're doing outside of Colorado, that is, is to limit the ability of providers in other states from providing legally protected health care to patients in states where it is legal to do that. I want you to know that this bill is very legally, narrowly focused and defined. But what this bill seeks to do is put up a shield to protect the medical providers working licensed here in Colorado. It also protects patients coming here to seek services from our Colorado providers. I'm not an attorney, but my opinion that the Constitution pr protects our citizens through the Ninth and Tenth Amendments and we are within our rights to enact protections for our citizens and other citizens seeking health care in Colorado. I know for a fact that families have come to seek gender-affirming care here in Colorado because they can't get it in their states. We heard from some of those folks in our committee hearing uh, earlier this week. But they're coming here because they can't get it there because it's banned, or worse, in some cases, families are being accused of child abuse for doing it. The fact is that medical care that is recommended by medical societies from licensed medical providers is life-saving medical care. In this bill, it will be legally protected health care. The same goes for folks seeking abortions. We're going to do what we can to be sure that these people are not imprisoned, fined, sued, indicted, or have their license taken away from them 
as a provider for providing that legally protected health care. What's happening around our country right now is appalling. It's putting lives at risk. It's destroying families. People are health care refugees in our own country. But there's nothing I can do to help those people's lives in their states. But what I can do and what we can do is create a law that can help protect those people, get the care that they need without the dangers of seeking the same services in their own state. With all the things going on around our country right now, we need a law like this. I wish I didn't have to come down here to make a law that does this and that we as lawmakers have to pr protect each other from other states and other lawmakers who are doing this. I wish that the, the lawmakers in these other states would trust the people to do what's right and best for themselves in the consultation with their physicians. But this is what it's come to. So I'm asking for support on Senate Bill 188 to help legally protected health care here in Colorado for our providers, for our patients, and everyone who may be in the process of getting somewhere someone here to Colorado to seek that care. Representative Froehlich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We are Colorado, and we should be proud of our long history of respecting privacy in medical decisions. We should be proud of the fact that last year we made sure to protect our fundamental rights so that after the Dobbs decision, we our Colorado, where we honor our individuality and our privacy. We should be proud that we have clawed our way back from being the hate state to include in those protections our LGBTQ brothers and sisters and their right to gender affirming care. This is legally protected health care in Colorado. Those are three important words and the whole reason for Senate Bill 188. Other states, 24 of them, have banned abortion. And in the process of doing that, have placed draconian measures on helpers, providers, and patients. Perhaps the most uh, troubling are states in which there are bounties. $10,000 reward for someone who participates in a legally protected health care in Colorado, but has the unfortunate circumstance of living in a state outside of Colorado. The Virginia governor had to allocate additional funds to the Departments of, of Correction in anticipation of jailing women and providers. It is a chilling scenario across America. And you know what? not here. It shields up Colorado. Channel your inner General Leo Organa or your inner Luke Picard because it is shields up here. That's what this bill does. We are going to protect patients, providers, and helpers in Colorado because this is legally protected health care and it includes all access to reproductive uh, procedures and rights, and it includes gender-affirming care. We worked in the Senate on many amendments, and we're proud of the work that the Senate sent us. That is the product of um, that is the product you see before you in 188. Um, we can talk about it later. I have a maybe I'll find it and talk about it now, but. Um, <laughs> I'll find my list of long Senate amendments. That included working with um, Catholic hospitals, uh, CML, a whole host of stakeholders who had their input and their voices were heard in a series of amendments um, in the Senate. We do have one conforming amendment, and with that I move, Mr. Chair, Amendment L-29. 
L29 has and been ask moved. that it be properly displayed. Please give us a moment. L29 has been moved and properly displayed. Representative Froelich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this amendment conforms with the uh, always intent of the bill and make sure that our language conforms with all the aspects of the bill, and I ask for a yes vote. Is there any further discussion on Amendment L-29? Minority Leader Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It is an honor to serve with you, sir. All day, every day. Um, so th this amendment uh, is a result of, of us doing our homework and, and looking at this bill to discover that it was really unconstitutional. So it's unconstitutional because the bill title did, did, not, did not really cover uh, uh, the, the health care that was covered in the bill. So this bill went through two committees and the Senate unconstitutional. What this, what this amendment really does is it makes this bill constitutional and shaky at best constitutional. What, what the result of some of our limiting of debate has caused is caused us to do things that aren't good for Colorado. It's caused us to, to run bills through without really doing the work on them. And I understand the work on this probably started way, way earlier than session. However, th this is really two different bills. This stretch of this definition tries to shove it into being constitutional. This is not good legislation. This is not good governance for us to do this. This is a result of us trying to ram through a bunch of legislation without giving it the due process that it needs. This definition doesn't exist anywhere else in the world to include federal law. So the funding of these programs won't be there because we in Colorado have redefined what reproductive health care is in such a way that it doesn't conform with anything outside of this state. This is bad law. This is a, I would recommend that we continue to do work on this bill if this is really what the sponsors want to get to. Do it right. Split this two bills that have been shoved into one, into two bills. Give it the time it deserves. Do the work. Let's not let our time constraints shove us into doing bad legislation. I would urge no vote on this amendment. Any further discussion? Representative Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As my colleague just spoke, this is... Um, this is a desperate change to try to fix a bill, <clears throat> and it's unfortunate that it made it so far without the understanding of what was wrong with the bill. It is not appropriate, and it's disappointing, that any time we or one of our colleagues makes a mistake, we just change this definition. This is moving the goalpost. So we have a definition, we've had a definition that we've used, we have a universal definition, but now we're gonna change that just to satisfy one bill that we want to go through, instead of taking a step back, breaking up two, into two bills, and addressing the actual problem. I ask you for a no vote on this. This is very disappointing. Thank you. Any further discussion? Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Wow, started off, the hypocrisy of this bill, medical privacy, choice between doctor and the, and the patient, we ended that yesterday, but to the amendment, medication no longer treats injury or sickness but causes death. Reproductive care now includes causing sterility. These are, these are very different things, instead of working within the boundaries that we've established, that have been established for us, that we ran under, that we took oaths to support, 
to support life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, to secure those rights for our constituents instead of working within those bounds, now we are so far out of those boundaries that we have to redefine the very words that we're working with. We're just making up words. We're just making up things that have no basis in fact, that have nothing to do with each other. And the fact is that this, this amendment is done purely to try to stretch these two unrelated issues together. Why? Why not run them separately? Why not consider them separately? Is it because we would have to have another six hours? We would have another six hours to debate it? These are very different subjects. They're not even close to related. They're actually opposites. These two subjects are opposites. And they're considered the one. Because, because of a definition that is twisted, that is added. Just like the definitions yesterday. We, we have no idea what the words mean anymore. We are in a very, very dangerous place. We're making up words every single day. Not, not like I make up words, but like make up words like that we put into law, that we put into black and white. Please stick to today's bill and specifically the amendment. Specifically, I'm talking about making up words that are called reproductive health care to include causing the inability to reproduce. So how those are not using off-market drugs that have not been purpose approved, ever. So the hypocrisy of this bill on top of the l linguistic twisting is just, is just beyond the pale. I read a book once that had about making up words and changing the definitions of words. It's a good book, you should read it. So to the sponsors, I am curious, after everybody else discusses what they want to discuss, how reproductive health care, and this is not a judgment on any of them, but how does reproductive health care comport with gender affirming care? Other, other than it has to do with genitalia, Maybe, I mean, maybe that would be the broad, maybe that would be the broad category, but these two are opposite. To put an opposite definition in there just to, just to pull one along with the other, it, it's, it's absolutely mind-blowing what is going on in this, in this room because we cannot stick to solving problems inside the bounds that we agreed to within the constitutional parameters that now we are twisting our entire language to fit whatever tyranny you want to impose. Representative DeGraff, I, would, I appreciate your comments at the well. At the same time, I would urge us to refrain from rhetoric like tyranny today. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your leadership as we try to navigate these very difficult and complex conversations. Now, <clears throat> Yesterday we talked a lot about science. Well, this representative is going to talk about science again. So I'm going to look at this amendment here, and we're going to talk a little bit. Reproductive health care. Okay, reproductive health care is talking about reproduction. That's called reproducing. That's creating life. Okay, let's go a little bit farther. <clears throat> Reproductive processes. Functions in systems at all stages of life. Does that mean there's life at conception? Does that mean there's life in utero? Does that mean there's life at 1, 10, 20, 40? Weeks? It's in the definition, ladies and gentlemen. Well, yes, it does. Life. In fact, that's the big debate. What is life and do we protect it or not? 
Let me continue here. It includes family planning, contraceptive care. I'll get to the next one. Abortion care, prenatal, postnatal delivery care. Now, Mr. Chair, just give me a little bit of latitude, not much, because I will move on and back to the amendment. But yesterday, we spent a lot of time talking about all those things and deceptive practices. But yet in this definition, we're talking about all the things that needed to be in yesterday's bill. Now I'm going to move on, Mr. Chair, because I can tell your leadership is going to come fast. Thank you for your leadership. Let's continue. It's Delivery care, fertility care, sterilization services and treatments for STIs, which we used to call STDs, and cancer. But here is where we have a problem. with respect to reproduction and other medical services related to the reproductive process and functions at all stages of life. With respect to gender affirming health care, ladies and gentlemen, that's a category in and of itself. A category in and of itself and a very serious surgery. A very serious decision made by anyone who wants to take this journey. And we live in a free country, thank God. So if that's what you want, you can take it. But there are some things that need to be mentioned. With respect to that, how does that directly relate to the systems at all stages of life? How does that relate to those things that people in my caucus are standing up for? And as my previous colleague pointed out, because the current definition didn't suit you, now you have to change the definition to suit you and what you're trying to accomplish. Now I was talking to a medical practitioner from the University of Denver, an esteemed member of one of the best surgical teams in Colorado. Now I'm not gonna mention his name, but I know him personally. And we were talking about this very subject and how complex it is how once it's done it cannot be reversed and how concerned he is about public policy that is being promulgated in this space. And he told me in this conversation, because this is such a serious decision, a life altering and changing decision, that once you go there, you can't come back. Representative Holtorf, is that related to the amendment? Please stick Th to L29. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With respect to this new definition of gender affirming health care services, now under this bill, protections for assessing reproductive health care, which is why I'm opposed to this. I'm opposed to this change in the definition. And so are many people in the state of Colorado, and most people in my district. I would speculate, but I bet it's 9 out of 10. That would be 90%. Okay? <clears throat> now, rural Colorado is very different than some of the places here in the concrete jungle. I will admit that. We are tied to our traditional values. We are traditionalists. We are tied to traditional family values. We care about children and the youth that grow up. But here's what that doctor told me. He said, I will not, nor will my surgical team perform gender affirming health care services and surgery on anyone under 21 years of age because it is such a serious surgery or series of surgeries 
and it is so life-changing that somebody that is below the age of 21 does not have the mental capacity to make that life-changing decision. All right, Representative Holtorf, I, yes, appreciate, I appreciate your comments. Um, I don't see how this discussion of gender-affirming health care services and whether or not it fits under the, the definition of reproductive health care fits with your story. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll go back to the amendment now and talk about the new definition that says gender-affirming health care services. And, and tie that back to the bill here, protections, and then I'm going to tie it back to statute that now in this state says if you're 12 years old or older, you can request mental health, physical health care without your parents' knowledge or consent of your parents. So now under this new definition, as you broaden the title, a 12-year-old kid, 13-year-old kid, 14-year-old kid, can walk in and say, I need to be reassigned. Now, if you all don't see danger in that, Colorado, and to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, I suggest you have a long and hard conversation about the mental capacity of youth and how this amendment tied to this bill can affect our youth. Does everybody understand how many of you were 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old and you didn't know who you were or what you wanted to be or what you were going to do when you grew up? You were bullied, you were picked on, nobody liked you. Perhaps. You were the wrong size, the wrong shape, you couldn't catch a football. Now, I'm not talking about me, but some of us can relate to that. And then you're trying to find out and figure out, as you're in the tunnel, as my mama used to say, how you're going to get out of it and where you're going to end up. And then you throw this definition on top of it. And then you allow that to be part of this bill. Oh, boy. Road trip. 16, 15, 16, road trip. Let's go to Colorado. While we're skiing, we might go do this or something else. I don't know, Colorado. We have gone too far. We are going too far. My plea and request to all of you is think about what we are doing here. How long do you let that rope run out before you dally it and set up your horse? I say this not to insult anyone, not to anger anyone, I say this because I truly believe that we are going too far. Now, an old senator who's no longer in the building told me something very profound, and I've only been here four years, and I'm still pretty green, pretty new, trying to learn all this mess, as most of you are. This old boy from the Southwest who served in the House and the Senate, told me the most profound thing I've heard in this building. He said, public policy travels best when it travels down the middle of the road. You run this place too hard to the right, you're in the right bar ditch, and you're rolled upside down. You run this thing too hard to the left, and you're in the left bar ditch, and you roll that pickup upside down. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to think about running our state public policy down the middle of the road. Because I will tell you right now, I reject this amendment, I reject the new definition, and I'm watching this chamber run this thing all the way to the left, and you're rolling the thing upside down in the left bar ditch. So, absolutely vote no on this particular amendment. This is not what Colorado wants, this is not what Colorado needs, and this is definitely not what anybody from the age of 12 to 18 or even 21 should even be thinking about right now as they try to navigate who they're going to be when they grow up, straight up. Representative Bradley.
you, Mr. Chair. In the state of Colorado, we have single subject rule. No bill except general appropriation bills shall be passed containing more than one subject, which shall be clearly expressed in its title. But if any subject shall be embraced in any act which shall not be expressed in the title, such act shall be void only as so much thereof as shall not be expressed. So this attempt to redefine with the bill title concerning protections for accessing reproductive health care, so different that we had to change the definition to include gender affirming care to attempt to make this constitutional. That should scare everyone. How is gender affirming care part of reproductive health care? It's not. This is an attempt to make this constitutional when we know, according to the Colorado Constitution, that it's not. And I'll tell you, I got on the CDC and Googled reproductive health. And you know what I didn't find? I didn't find gender affirming care. You know what I did find? I found infertility, assisted reproductive technology, contraception, women's reproductive health, women's reproductive health, emergency preparedness and response, maternal mortality, maternal and infant health, sudden infant death syndrome, depression and postpartum depression, teen pregnancy, global reproductive health. I asked the people in Colorado, if these legislators vote on this, making this bill unconstitutional, you should hold them accountable. They should be held accountable. You can't just do what you want in this dome when it's unconstitutional. We all pledged to oath, to take an oath to uphold the Colorado Constitution, and this bill does not that. Thank you. Representative Detail. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to use this one because this one's a little louder. Um, the, the two topics that were brought together in this bill are brought together because they involve the same medical professionals. The topics that are being targeted by the same actors. And because it's all about bodily autonomy. Gender affirming care protections like these have been included together in California, Vermont, Washington, Massachusetts, and New Mexico. These have all been together. Gender affirming care is life saving, and trans children are beloved and cared for by their parents and providers. Gender affirming care has always been in this bill, and as, as evidence from the public debate that we had on the bill in the House and also in the debate in the Senate. Please vote yes on this conforming amendment. Is there any, further any further discussion on L29? Representative Luck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a factual question to the bill sponsor. Um, in terms of the California law, was it presented as it is here under a bill title that framed it as reproductive health care, or was it divided in... in Representative Tatone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, California has a full-time legislature, and they've ran a whole bunch of bills over time, but... New Mexico and a lot of the other states did all of these together. Representative Luck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do you happen to know um, whether they ran them together under the banner of medical services generally, or did they run them under the banner of reproductive health care? Representative Froelich. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the question. The point of the amendment is that, to clarify, gender-affirming care is included in reproductive health care provider protections. And that's the point of the amendment, and that we ask for an I vote. Is there any further discussion on Amendment L29? Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know. I think we. I think we need to look at. I think we need to look at some of this stuff and whether it's actually healthcare. A man born with a heart defect says taking estrogen, estrogen and testosterone blocker pills and a desire to become a female almost cost him his life. David Bacon of Mont California was told by his doctors in 2017 that he had two weeks to live if he didn't quit taking the cross-sex hormones he started taking in 2014. Hormone replacement therapy almost killed me. Well, I guess medication now is, uh, is life ending instead of life affirming, so that would be appropriate. Hormone replacement therapy almost killed me, Bacon, now 31, told the 
said, my experience was very traumatic and life-threatening. This care was life-threatening. Before he was prescribed the drugs, two therapists advised him that he could be at the risk of suicide if he didn't transition into his gender. Bacon suffers from a pulmonary thing I can't pronounce, a birth defect, where the heart valve that controls blood flow from the heart to the lungs doesn't form, making it difficult for blood, blood to flow. He, uh, he had nine open heart surgeries to implant heart valves made of bovine porcine animal tissues. Early in his childhood, he developed post-traumatic stress disorder from the surgeries. When he was 13, he woke up in the middle of the operation, which compounded his fear and anxiety. It was very traumatic. I already had PTSD. This just added more to it. As a child, he spent a lot of time outdoors. As a straight-up boy doing what boys do, I jumped off trees, rode bicycles, and I'm just going to try to get through this quickly to get to make sure we cover the applicable parts. And had a BB gun. I was being a boy, picking on my little sister and older sister at school. His medical condition kept him from doing strenuous activities and playing certain sports. He was homeschooled until fifth grade and given an EIP. I had a learning curve. My attention span wasn't there all the time. His mom suspected he might have ADHD. In fifth grade, he began attending public school in Georgia. He recalls coming home at school one day, feeling out of sorts with his agenda. The dinner table that evening, Bacon wanted to tell his family but couldn't find the courage. Uh, I was sitting there contemplating if I should tell my parents or not. I was unsure. His mom knew something was wrong. Let me just skip some of this. Then he decided, then he asked to take to the doctor to get puberty blockers. Her jaw dropped to the floor. Now, where he'd heard about puberty blockers, I don't know, because I certainly did not know about puberty blockers when I was in fifth grade. Bacon remembers his mom, she thought it was a phase. She coaxed him to get involved in social activities. I didn't, I didn't have a great social cycle as a kid. The next year, Bacon went to three different middle schools. He attended public school. When he reached puberty at about age 12, he became more confused. Something didn't feel right with my body. Some of the boys in middle school bullied him. I got beat up. I vividly remember in middle school. He remembers seeing the rainbow-colored signs that said, be kind, as a gay-straight alliance. He was attracted to females. I ended up not dating anyone in the 11th grade. The bullying affected his ability to focus on homework. I wanted to be female. He uh, as time went on, he began dressing more feminine clothes by the time he was 18. Committed to the idea of a complete transition. I wanted hey, to Representative be Representative DeGraff, I've let you go on for a bit. If you could explain how this ties uh, your opposition to including gender-affirming health care services under the definition of reproductive health care. That would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, this is a, I, I forgot how long this article was because the story was about, uh, is about the entire transition. And let's just skip to the end here. Specialists discuss bottom surgery. They're talking about removing it. They call it an inversion. They didn't call me, a, they called me a unicorn. It was a specialist left the room. The nurse stayed behind. They have this process called dilating uh, four or five times a day. I'm gonna skip some of that. So bottom line, let me just skip down because this is something that everybody should read if they're thinking about that this is just a just a benign operation. This is this is this is serious stuff. This gender affirming care is serious stuff. Moment of truth. When Bacon was 27, his health took a turn for the worse. Usually, health care helps your health improve, but medication used to be for treating an injury or death or illness or injury. Now it's for death. <clears throat> In this case. The, the health care that he was receiving his health caused his health to take a turn for the worse, and he went to the University of California Cardiology for tests. The results were devastating. The doctors told him that he would die unless he stopped taking the hormone replacement drugs immediately. I was living as a woman right up until the doctors told me I had two weeks to live. I chose life. Chose life. Cool. I like that. I definitely affirm his choice to choose life. His ninth open heart surgery years earlier than expected because the hormone replacement drugs had clogged and damaged the valves of his heart. I was told my valves were completely destroyed by gender-affirming health care. The valves to my heart were completely destroyed by gender-affirming health care. Okay. So we're not talking about... Representative DeGraff, I appreciate, you know, your, the conclusion of the story. That... 
I can see how that would tie into you saying that gender affirming health care is, uh, you know, might cause you know issues with heart conditions, but that does not tie back into why it should not be considered reproductive health care. So if you could tie that back in and get back to L29, that'd be great. Well, if we read the definition, yep, that the reproductive health care includes gender affirming health care services. So the definition of health care is that it includes gender affirming care as a subset of reproductive health care and what this article is going through. Now granted he had an underlying condition that was uh, exasperated by a, well his underlying heart condition but the, the valves in his heart were not just they were damaged. Now they were they were weaker they were probably they were compromised already but they were damaged by this by this treatment so I don't think you could call it gender affirming care but to call it health care is a misnomer in and of itself so I guess if you want to have if you want to have that that's uh, that level of specificity that this is <clears throat> this is not health care in general so if it is not health care in general because it does risk damaging other systems, then it can't be part of reproductive health care because it is not health care. So he goes on to talk about the subliminal messaging he got at school and basically being coerced. It's an excellent article. I think everybody should read it. I doubt you will. I'll, uh, I'll send it around to everybody so you can, uh, you can take a look at it in depth and you can see so then you then you have it and you can look at it and you can specifically ignore it just like every other thing so this is not health care if it is not health care it can't be included under reproductive health care no matter how much you want to twist this bill so i would recommend for any any sense of logic and sanity you got to vote no on this amendment. Representative Parenti and then Representative Luck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Colleagues, I want to address this amendment specifically with experiences from my own family. Some of you know that I am in the process of raising a transgender teenager. And I want to share with my colleagues who are skeptical about what transgender families and, and kids go through that we have regular and routine conversations in my household about what the process of transitioning will mean, what it looks like, and what the impact of that will be on my child's long-term situation in terms of life and their reproductive ability. Gender-affirming health care will have a long-term impact and potentially permanent impact on my child's ability to reproduce. This is a conversation that we have regularly, routinely, and is part of the conversation regarding the decision to transition. So to suggest that gender-affirming health care is not part of reproductive health care is to deny this simple fact that the decisions that my child and other transgender people make in determining their own life Members, and how they get, want I'm to sorry, live that life. Representative, one second. Members, it's getting a little loud and it's difficult for me to hear, so if you could just take your conversations off the side, much appreciated. Representative Parenti. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to repeat, the decisions that my transgender child and other transgender people make in determining what they want their life to be, how they want their body to look, what they, how they want to identify, do have a lasting impact on reproductive ability and are completely valid under this definition. And I would urge a yes vote. Thank you. Representative Luck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I request a title ruling on this amendment. The committee will stand in a brief recess to discuss whether the amendment fits on the title. 
Will the bill sponsors and Representative Luck please join me on the side of the chamber for a brief discussion. We will come back to order. The chair rules that the amendment fits under the title. Back to the amendment. L029. Any further discussion? Seeing none, members, the question before us is the adoption of amendment L029. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed nay. No. The amendment passes. Back to the bill. Mr. Minority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you can tell, we, we've got a lot of problems with kind of the, the way this bill was crafted. And so I would like to move that we refer, re-refer this back to the Judiciary Committee for consideration. That is a proper motion. Is there any discussion on the motion to refer back to committee? Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The rules in the chamber are very restrictive under the single subject rule. The reason is so you don't expand. You don't have the opportunity to expand. And you have to be focused. <clears throat> now, what it appears to me is we're, because of uh, oversight, we're running an amendment to try to expand something so it has some type of legal sufficiency now, even though it went all the way through the Judiciary Committee, hours and hours of testimony was reviewed by staffs and legislators, 
And now, you have to run this amendment. <clears throat> it's been challenged, and rightly so. Concerning protections for accessing reproductive health care. In fact, throughout the bill, there would, could be question. Because throughout the bill, you've redefined it. But now you realize you have to amend it to re-redefine it. Or, as you found out, constitutionally, it would be insufficient. It would probably, when it gets challenged in court, and I say when, it would be thrown out. That's a fact that Colorado needs to know about. And I just told you, for the 10 people watching the Colorado Channel, now you know. So absolutely opposed to this type of legislation. Absolutely opposed. Because this is what the rule says we're not supposed to be doing. So. I will continue to be a hard no. And I question if the ruling on the title challenge has been properly reviewed in a manner that takes every consideration into account. I'm not a lawyer. There's a few in the chamber. But I will tell you there's some serious questions here. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion to refer back to committee? Rep Madam Assistant Majority Leader. Thank you, members. Um, I would like to urge a no vote on this. We spent um, upwards of six hours in committee uh, through testimony. It was one of the longest bills that we've heard. This is also the second chamber of debate. I think we have landed on where we'd like to be on this bill. Thank you. Any further discussion, members? Representative Luck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I heard this bill also in committee, um, and I've also been directed that all of the work, the bulk of the work on these bills should be done in committee. And so I rise in support of this, that we move it back to committee. There are other places in this bill where I raised issue about basic definitions. For instance, a healthcare worker being defined as a patient um, that was an amendment that was made in the Senate. I didn't get a very robust response as to why a worker, a healthcare service worker, could also be or was defined in part as a patient. So there are still things that need to be worked out in this bill. And so um, I rise in support of this and ask that it go back for that, for that, uh, for that work. Minority Leader Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know full well the hard work that goes into judiciary. So thank you for doing that. However, after six hours, a bill left that was unconstitutional. I think that means we need to go back and work on this again back in judiciary. Representative Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I agree with Rep. Lynch. What does it matter how long was spent on this bill if two committees and the Senate couldn't even figure out that it wasn't constitutional. Now we have some failed ditch effort to try to make it constitutional. This is not fair to the people we represent. This is not fair to the state of Colorado. And I urge that you do not vote on this amendment. Uh, the question before us is a motion to refer back to committee. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing no further discussion, members, the question before us is to refer Senate Bill 188 back to committee. All in favor say aye. aye. Division has been called.
Members, the question is, members, the question is on the motion to refer Senate Bill 188 back to committee. A division has been requested. All those in the chamber not entitled to vote, please be seated. All those in favor of referring Senate Bill 188 back to committee, please stand and remain standing or raise your hand and keep it raised until the vote count is taken. You may be seated. All those opposed to the motion, please stand and remain standing or raise your hand and keep your hand raised in one place until the count is taken. You may be seated. The motion is lost. Back to the bill, Representative Tatone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a little bit of confusion around what gender affirming care is. So I'd like to set the record straight on what that is and, and describe some of the things that may not be aware to some people. Uh, gender affirming care is life-saving health care for transgender people of all ages. It's not a single category of services, but instead is a range of services, including mental health care, medical care, and social services. At all ages, clear, well-established, evidence-based standards of care exist for who can access what form of gender affirming care and when they are eligible to receive it. Gender affirming care is medically necessary for the well being of many transgender and non conforming people who experience symptoms of gender dysphoria or distress that results from having one's gender not identify, uh, gender identity not match their sex assigned at birth. Gender affirming care helps transgender and non binary people live openly and authentically as their true selves. Just like any other form of health care, it also helps transgender and non-binary people live safe and healthy lives. Gender affirming care is always delivered in age appropriate, evidence-based ways, and decisions to provide health care are made in consultation with doctors and parents. Collectively, representing more than 1.3 million doctors across the state of the United, uh, across the United States, every major medical and mental health organization, including the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the American Psychological Association, recognizes that medically that it is medically necessary to support people in affirming their gender identity. So. What does it mean for someone to transition? Gender transition is the process through which a transgender or non-binary person takes steps to live authentically in their true gender identity. It is a personal process that looks differently for every, that it looks different for every transgender and non-binary person. And individual paths do not always follow the same order. Some people take medication, some do not. Some adults have surgeries and some do not. From so, for some people, it can include steps as simple as changing clothes, names, maybe hairstyles to fit their gender identity. Regardless of the age at which some person transitions, how they do so is their choice to be made with their family and their doctors. So what does it mean for children to transition? Are they too young, aren't they too young to do so? Well, transgender and non-binary people who begin transitioning during childhood and adolescence work closely with parents and healthcare providers, including mental healthcare providers, 
to determine which changes to make at a given time that are age appropriate and in the best interest of the child. At all stages, parents, young people, and medical professionals make decisions together and no permanent medical interventions happen until a transgender person is old enough to give truly informed consent. Prior to puberty, transition is entirely social and may in involve changing names, pronouns, clothing, and hairstyles. During and after puberty, some medical treatments may be available, but only after significant consideration and consultation between the youth, their families, and their health care providers. What is social transitioning? Social transitioning is when someone takes non-medical and fully reversible steps to begin living and presenting publicly as their gender. This can include changes as using new names and pronouns, adapting a new hairstyle, wearing different clothing, or disclosing gender identity to others in their lives. For those who begin transitioning prior to puberty, transition is entirely social. But for many transgender and non-binary social uh, people, social transition is the first step in their gender transition journey, regardless of the age they begin transitioning. This is because it offers the opportunity to easily and quickly take small steps to begin living authentically before involving any medical interventions. So what are puberty blockers? Why are they used and are they safe? Puberty blockers or simply blockers are types of medication which can temporarily pause puberty and are fully reversible. For transgender and non-binary youth who are aware of their gender uh, at a young age, going through puberty can cause intense distress and dysphoria as it leads to their body developed into a gender that is not theirs, including in ways that are irreversible or only reversible with surgery. For example, teenage transi uh, transgender boy who does not have access to blockers will have to go through a puberty that includes growing breasts and later will require surgery later in life. In these instances, puberty blockers may be prescribed by doctors in early puberty in consultation with the child. Their parents and therapists in order to temporarily stop the body from going through the unwanted physical and developmental changes of puberty. They are used to give youth time to continue exploring their gender identity before potentially moving on to the permanent transition care when they are older. Puberty blockers are safe. They were approved by the FDA to treat precocious puberty in cisgender youth in 1993, citing minimal side effects and higher efficacy. 30 years later, puberty blockers remain a gold standard of treatment for precocious puberty in cisgender youth. All youth who are taking puberty blockers, cisgender or transgender, are monitored by their healthcare team for any side effects or complications. Puberty blockers are reversible. If a person stops taking puberty blockers, normal puberty will resume with minimal long-term effects, if any. While there may be some loss of bone mi mineral density, this can be easily addressed with calcium and vitamin D supplements. Previous research has shown that cisgender youth who take puberty blockers for precocious puberty have normal fertility and reproductive function. Puberty blockers can also be life-saving. Previous studies have found that transgender and non-binary youth who are able to receive puberty blockers report positive psychological impacts, at so, socio, psychosocial impacts, I'm sorry, uh, including increased well-being and decreased depression. Other recent studies have found that recent, uh, the receipt of puberty blockers can dramatically reduce risks of suicidality, in some cases by over 70% among transgender youth compared to those who are unable to access desired treatment. What are cross-sex cross hormones or gender-affirming hormones, and why are they used and are they safe? Gender-affirming hormones are a type of prescription medicine transgender and non-binary people can take to cause their body to begin 
physically developing into the gender they identify as. These medications allow transgender and non-binary people to live more fully as their identified gender, specifically reducing negative sociological outcomes such as gender dysphoria, depression, anxiety, and suicidality. Gender-affirming hormones, medica uh, hormone medications are synthetic versions of testosterone or estrogen, the same hormones that naturally develop at various lives, uh, levels in both cisgender men and cisgender women. These same medications are used safely every day by millions of cisgender men and women worldwide. Gender-affirming hormones are typically not prescribed until a person is at least 18 years old, although adolescents may receive gender-affirming hormones starting in their late teens. This is only done with physician approval, parental consent, and informed consent from the adolescent in question, and is typically reserved for those adolescents who have been on puberty blockers and or socially transitioned for some time. Gender-affirming hormones are safe in both youth and adults with provider supervision and appropriate management. Depending on how long a person has been taking gender-affirming hormones, the effects may be fully or partially reversible as well. The informed consent process involves discussions about side effects and benefits, as with any informed consent process for medication treatments, including discussions about fertility. Gender-affirming hormones are life-saving for transgender youth and adults. A recent study from the Trevor Project shows that the transgender youth with access to gender-affirming hormones have lower rates of depression and are at lower risk of suicide. A study by Stanford University Medical School found that positive mental health outcomes were higher for transgender people who accessed gender-affirming hormones as teenagers versus those who accessed it as adults. The third study, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, found that two years after initiating gender-affirming hormones, transgender youth reported higher levels of life satisfaction and positive effect and lower levels of gender dysphoria, depression, and anxiety. So what is gender-affirming surgery? Can minors have that surgery? There is no single gender-affirming surgery, nor does a person have to have surgery or a specific surgery to be transgender. Gender-affirming surgery includes a wide range of procedures such as plastic surgery to, to change features of the face to be more typically masculine or feminine, top surgery to change uh, the chest or torso or bottom surgery to make changes to genitals. Transgender and non-binary people are not able to have gender-affirming genital surgeries until they are adults. In very rare exceptions, 16 or 17 year olds who have been consistent and persistent with their gender identity for years have been taking gender-affirming hormones for some time and who have approvals from both their parents and their doctors have been able to receive top surgeries. In all cases, gender-affirming surgeries are only performed after multiple discussions with both mental health providers and physicians, including endocrinologists and or surgeons, to determine if surgery is an appropriate course of action. None of these surgical procedures are unique to trans people. They are the same procedures that have been safely and effectively be been given to cisgender and intersex people for decades for a host of cosmetic and medical reasons. Prior research shows that post-surgical complication rates are similarly low among transgender and cisgender people receiving the same type of surgery, if not lower among transgender people. What is the impact of parental support or lack of support on transgender young people? The single most important thing anyone can do to support the transgender and non-binary people in their lives, regardless of their age, is to support and affirm them on their journey. A simple first step is committing to using their chosen name and pronouns. If you make a mistake, to simply apologize, correct yourself, and move on. For gender, uh, transgender youth, this can be particularly important. Adolescence is typically the time when all youth begin to develop 
autonomy and independence and learn about themselves and their identity as they prepare for adulthood. When parents and families support their children through the actions such as respecting their opinions, showing interest in their activities and interest in providing a loving, affirming, and trusting home, it can go a long way towards ensuring they will successfully develop into happy and healthy adolescents and adults. Similarly, when parents, caregivers, and teachers support a transgender youth's journey and transitioning, they are helping them to live authentically and grow into the person they are meant to be, just like all other children and adolescents their age do. And parental support can save lives. Previous research has found that transgender youth who are able to socially transition and simply have their gender identity, name, and pronouns affirmed report higher levels of resiliency and positive well-being and lower levels of depression, anxiety, gender dysphoria, and suicidality relative to transgender youth who are not affirmed. What do doctors have to say about gender-affirming care? Do they think it's necessary? Every single major medical organization, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Medical Association, and the American Psychiatric Association supports the provision of age-appropriate gender-affirming care for transgender and non-binary people. These organizations represent millions of doctors, researchers, and mental health professionals in the United States. Gender-affirming care has always existed, and it's not a new phenomenon. It's just that in recent years, extremist politicians have made it into an issue for their own self-gain. And I'm just reading what this says. I'm not saying that from my own opinion in this, in this space. What is the process of, to begin receiving gender-affirming care from healthcare providers? Clear, well-established evidence-based standards of care exist for who can get gender-affirming care and when. These standards have, been, have existed for decades. In 2022, for example, the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, WPATH, released their eighth standards of care for treating transgender patients. Both the Endocrine Society and the American Academy of Pediatrics have issued guidelines as well. The process to access gender-affirming care can differ from state to state and hospital to hospital, but due to differences in state law, around who can access gender-affirming care and when. But in general, transgender patients, along with their families, if they are minors until they are under uh, age 18, will start by visiting a health care provider or clinic that specializes in gender-affirming care. Some may be referred to, to this clinic after first disclosing their gender dysphoria to a primary care provider or therapist, and others may start with a gender clinic. For patients seeking, gender, uh, seeking out gender-affirming health care, they may receive counseling for extended periods of time. If medications or surgery are part of their gender journey, they are only prescribed after further assessments to ensure that they meet prescribing criteria. This can include, but is not limited to, documentation and referral letters, parental consent, and ongoing mental health support. At all stages of gender-affirming care, it is only delivered after patients and their families have been counseled and informed consent has been given. Are people transitioning because it's trendy? It feels like everyone is transgender all of a sudden. Being transgender is not new. Transgender people have always existed and will continue to exist regardless of harmful laws that pass. One thing that has changed is that people are more willing to be out about their gender identity and sexual orientation and live openly as LGBTQ plus in all facets of their lives. This is happening because transgender people feel safer coming out. Public support for LGBTQ plus rights and acceptance of LGBTQ plus people are the highest they've ever been. Among 
another thing that has changed is people's awareness of trans people and gender identity. As transgender people become more visible and willing to live openly as their authentic lives, people are simply seeing more depictions of transgender people and encountering more transgender people in their lives. It is also true that people who are openly identifying as LGBTQ plus at younger ages. But this is because in addition to the rising support nationally uh, for pro-equality policies overall, on average, younger groups hold more pro-equality LGBTQ affirming attitudes and beliefs than older generations. This shift creates a cycle where higher acceptance leads more people to come out and more people coming out increases visibility of LGBT people and increased visibility leads to increased acceptance and increased acceptance leads to more people feeling safe coming out. Pretty simple. Are kids transitioning because of social media or because their friends are also transitioning? This is a right-wing theory. Just reading this, I'm not impugning anyone. Uh, known as rapid onset gender dysphoria or social contagion, and it has been thoroughly debunked. The American Psychological Association and American Psychiatric Association and over 120 other medical associations issued a position statement calling for the elimination of the use of this term as a diagnosis. And it's based on the lack of rigorous empirical support for its existence and its likelihood of contributing to harm and mental health burden. The statement also specifically calls out laws which uses this debunked theory just to justify anti-trans legislation. What if someone transitions and then they change their mind about it? Don't a lot of people detransition? Previous studies have found that detransitioning is quite rare, with some studies finding levels of detransition and regret as low as one to two percent. That's one percent to two percent. Transgender youth who meet criteria for gender dysphoria, who are undergoing social and medical transition are actually the least likely to detransition. And those vast majority of transgender youth remain consistent and persistent in their gender identity over time. One study uh, recently published in the Academy of uh, Academic Journal Pediatrics followed over 300 transgender youth after first initiating social transition and found that over 92% remain consistent and persistent in their gender identity five years later. However, evidence-based standards of care to ensure that no one, regardless of their age, undergoes any permanent irreversible changes without informed consent and careful consultation with medical and mental health care providers. So that's a little bit about what gender-affirming care is, and I wanted to talk to you about that first before I even got into whatever I wanted to say out of my own mouth here. The fact of the matter is, is that there are a lot of laws being passed outside of, of our state. Uh, most of them are about abortion care and people seeking abortions. They are unable to get the care that they need in their state. And these states are going as far as putting bounties on people to say, if any you know anybody who's getting that care, we'll give you $10,000 to turn them in so we can go, get, go after them. Most of that legislation is really starting to spread around to more states. And Idaho, um, I think, was the most recent one that just did it, I heard this morning. They're going after people. That's what this law is made to do. And I'll tell you a little bit about what this law actually does, because it's really important to understand the lengths that states are going through to go after people who are seeking abortions. And there's, it's not a stretch of the imagination to think that they're gonna go after people seeking gender-affirming care too. And that's why these are both being presented at the same time. The, there's a lot of 
uh, commonality in the groups that are doing this kind of work and going after people because they don't agree with their decisions on their own bodily autonomy. But I'll tell you a little bit about the bill. This bill works on criminal prosecution changes. So criminal prosecutions for receiving, providing, or assisting legally protected health care. Legally protected health care, by the way, is abortion care and gender-affirming care. Uh, will not be recognized by the state of Colorado. No arrests, extradition, search warrants, court summons, or court subpoenas will be enforced by the state of Colorado for protected health care. Civil lawsuits. Civil lawsuits concerning protected health care that are penal in nature or originating from states without jurisdiction will not be recognized or enforced by the state of Colorado. This is that stuff where they're going after people with these bounties. Don't go after people in our state with these bounties. We don't want that. Privacy. Colorado state employees will be prohibited from participating in or assisting with interstate investigations or divulging information concerning protected health care. Don't go after people in our state. It's legally protected health care here in Colorado. We have constitutional right to say that and to have a law, and we protect the people who are on our soil doing this protected health care. Wiretapping or eavesdropping related to an investigation concerning protected health care will be prohibited. Don't tattle on people getting protected health care. Protected health care providers will be able to apply to Colorado's address confidentiality program and have their personal information withheld from the internet. Don't go after the providers providing protected health care in Colorado. We don't want that. We're not going to stand for that. Protections for incarcerated people. Colorado prisons must provide pregnant people with information about abortion providers. Referrals to community-based providers of abortion care, referrals to community-based organizations that help people pay for abortion care, transportation to access abortion care, and ensue access to miscarriage management. Some states want to consider miscarriages as abortions and prosecute people and throw them in jail. Not here. That's not, that's not their fault. Professional and malpractice discrimination. Medical rewards will be prohibited from enacting professional consequences and malpractice insurance providers will be prohibited from discriminating against those providing or assistance in legally protected health care. Texas and Oklahoma, if anyone's there, they may be sued for providing, assisting, or paying for knowingly or unknowingly an abortion that incurs within the state. The legal damages for these civil actions are $10,000. This is that, that law I was telling you about where they put a bounty on you. Plus a fine determined by the court, plus court fees and attorney fees per abortion. Neither the plaintiff nor the defendant nor the patient must be a resident of the state. The plaintiff does not have to carry any standing in the case. The defendant must pay the plaintiff's legal costs and a $10,000 reward if the lawsuit is successful, and the defendant must pay their own legal costs whether or not the lawsuit succeeds. Coloradans remain vulnerable to these bounty laws even if they do not deliberately participate in abortions in Texas or Oklahoma. Not with this bill. We're stopping that. A bill failed to pass in Missouri legislature in March 2020 that would have allowed citizens to sue anyone helping a Missouri resident receive an abortion, including outside of Missouri. Many states will attempt such legislation again. Missouri, Nebraska, and Texas plan to target physicians and pharmacists providing abortion medication via telehealth to people living in states that haven't, have outlawed abortion. Health care providers in states where abortion is legal may soon be in danger of lawsuits or prosecution for homicide. 
They want to charge our doctors in Colorado and our pharmacists in Colorado for homicide. They're just doing their job. They're, they're doing their Hippocratic oath to help their patients, but these states want to put them in jail for the stuff that they do to help people. Not here. Not only do they want to prosecute them for homicide and put them in life in prison and a $100,000 fine if an abortion medication either deliberately or incidentally reaches states where it's banned. This is what's happening. This is what's happening in our country right now. And Colorado is taking a stand. And we're going to say, no, not here, not in Colorado. So I'll talk a little bit about the national context of gender-affirming care access. A growing number of states are banning gender-affirming health care. Boy, I tell you, every time I turn on the news, I see another one doing it. It's, it's despicable. And they're pursuing anti-LGBT legislation, contrary to the American College of Physicians policy, which urges non-discrimination in health care. The American College of Physicians opposes these restrictions on health care for transgender individuals and strongly objects to any unnecessary government interference with health care services. But they're still doing it anyway. The doctors say, don't do it. Don't do this to our patients. Stop harming our patients with government interference. But I've got to say, it's the party of less government that's putting policies in place to put more government in the lives of people. Representative, if we can, if we can tone down the rhetoric and keep things constructive, thank you. Thank you for your leadership. <laughs> you like that one? That was a good one. <laughs> Back to the got, bill. I got a little impassioned there. I'm, I apologize. No problem. Back um, to the bill. Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, and Tennessee have passed gender-affirming care prohibitions. Eleven other states are considering restrictions, and I don't even know if that's if, how many have passed it since this was even written here, because there are probably a couple more already. Alabama's ban is by far the harshest, leveling a possible 10-year felony sentence for providing gender-affirming health care. Arkansas's law banned both public and private insurance coverages for gender-affirming care. They want to put doctors in jail, folks. They're doing it outside of Colorado. Not here and not with Senate Bill 188. On March 31st, 2022, how do you like that? Just about a year ago, the U.S. Department of Justice wrote, a, uh, wrote to state attorneys generals warning that bans on gender-affirming care are unconstitutional and violate multiple federal laws. HHS has also called for physicians and patients who believe they have been discriminated against on a basis of gender identity and disability or disability in seeking to access gender-affirming care to file a complaint with the department's Office of Civil Rights. Federal government says you're doing something that's unconstitutional, but they're still doing it outside of Colorado, not with this bill, not here, not today, folks. We're out, Senate Bill 188, that changes all that here. Nearly 240 anti-LGBT bills introduced in 2022. I think this year, I don't know, what is it, 450? 450 anti-LGBT bills? In 2023, the Williams Institute at UCLA School of Law found that over 58,000 transgender youth and young adults are at risk of losing access to care in states that have restricted access to gender-affirming care or are considering doing so. We need to make sure that our providers can provide services to them if they need it, and they can come here to do that. They can go to New Mexico to do that. They can go to Vermont to do that. They can go to California to do that. They can go to Illinois to do that. And we're protecting those providers doing that essential life-saving health care with this bill. Studies have shown that gender-affirming care reduces depression and suicide risk. 
gender-affirming care reduces depression and suicide risk. Doesn't seem to bother the people who ban it, though, because it, they, they always say it in the committee hearings that if you ban this health care, you're going to put people at risk. Other states are doing this. They're putting people at risk. They're putting kids at risk. Kids who just want to live their lives, and they're being put at risk by government interference. Not here, not in Colorado, not with Senate Bill 188. 188, I'll just say it again, just make sure you understood that because I got excited. Not here, not with this bill. The fact is that any restrictions on the ability for Coloradans to get health care that they need is inconsistent, inconsistent with our Colorado values and individual liberty and self-determination. I'm not a scholar of the Constitution, and I kind of wish I was, because I think there would be a lot of things that I could probably pull out of my hat at the drop of a hat to, to do, to say here about personal liberties, the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which I hear a lot of in this chamber, and we're protecting someone's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in whatever they need to get the care that they need, the individual care that they need the personalized health care that they need to get from their doctor in consultation with them and for families to get the consultation that they need with their doctors and their kids with the permission and consent to get the health care that they need. That's what we're protecting here. That's what we're protecting. Colorado has turned down abortion bans time and time and time and time and time again. And when I talk to people at the doors, you know, I talk to a lot of voters who said, you know, I don't normally vote for Democrats, but there's a few things that have really gotten me angry about what the other side's doing, and that's January 6th, election denying, and abortion care, trying to take away abortion care. These are coming from the voters' mouths. And I heard it again and again and again and again. That's why we're here with this bill. Senate Bill 188. This is what the people want. They're tired of being abused and trying to have their rights taken away from them. We're not just going to help the people in Colorado. We're going to help the people outside of Colorado who need to come here for that care. We're going to help the doctors, the doctors that went to school for years and years and years to become doctors. And I wish our Dr. Yudira Caraveo, who's now Congresswoman Caraveo, was here because she would be in support of this bill. She belongs to those national organizations of doctors saying that this is necessary care and this should be provided and this should never be taken away from anyone. We're protecting those doctors. We're protecting those patients, and we're protecting anybody else who may help them get the care that they need. I urge you to vote yes on Senate Bill 188, because gender-affirming care and abortion care is health care, and it needs to stay here in Colorado and be accessible to everyone who needs it. Representative Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I want to take this debate in a little bit different direction than we've been going so far. Um, and I do want to thank my colleague from Jefferson County for going through a, a significant portion of the bill, because now I don't have to do that. We can get right down to the stuff that I want to talk about. And so as I read through this bill, um, as my good colleague talked through, there's, uh, there's several different uh, components in here that talk about, uh, like page nine, it talks about uh, medical malpractice insurance. Um, then it moves on to contracts between um, carriers and providers. And then it moves on into a lot of the different stuff about how the state of Colorado interacts uh, with other states. And so you have a section on page 11 that talks about legally protected healthcare activity, um, 
which gives a bunch of definitions and then talks about what can and can't be done um, with regards to uh, anyone that's providing these services. At page 14, it gets into subpoenas in conjunction uh, with proceedings from another state. And then you have a little bit of um, information that talks about just how those uh, investigations are and would not be allowed to proceed. Um, talks about search warrants, uh, arrests, summonses, uh, wiretaps, things like that. And that's, that's really the area that I want to focus on. Uh, because like we talk about all the time, uh, like I talk about a lot when I come up here, I want to ensure that when we write legislation, there's not unintended consequences to this legislation. And given that I see things through a public safety lens, I want to ensure that this legislation doesn't um, unfortunately create a situation in which victims of other crimes might not be able to get the services um, that they deserve. So I want to read uh, just a quick couple of sentences here from the Guttmacher Institute, which uh, if you're unfamiliar with the history of the Guttmacher Institute, uh, it's actually named after Alan Guttmacher, who was one of the past presidents of Planned Parenthood. And so what uh, this study from the Guttmacher Institute talks about is that 7% uh, of all abortion patients, so that's what we're talking about here in this bill, uh, reproductive health care, uh, that 7% of all abortion patients had been exposed to intimate partner violence or domestic violence. However, poor patients were at least twice as likely to have been exposed as non-poor women. So again, that's coming from the Guttmacher Institute talking about how a lot of uh, folks who are the victims of either intimate partner violence or domestic violence are these folks that are seeking um, the services that these reproductive health care providers would be providing. Uh, another article, uh, this one is from USA Today, which talks about how women with abusive partners are substantially overrepresented among uh, abortion patients. It also talks about there's a lot of evidence um, that men may resort to intimidation and violence uh, to coerce, excuse me, to coerce women that they've impregnated into aborting. And so as I sit here and I read through all of these, uh, through this bills, again, I'm thinking through this uh, from the public safety law enforcement nexus. Is the legislation that we're crafting actually doing what we want it to do without having any unanticipated consequences? And my concern is that as I read through all of this, it gave a whole lot of protections to um, reproductive health care providers. But I wanted to make sure that in that discussion about the reproductive health care providers and what can and can't be subpoenaed, what can and can't be investigated from other states, that this legislation is not losing sight of the fact that there is a significant amount of interlap from the Guttmacher Institute, from USA Today, from uh, a lot of other sources that talk about folks that are seeking reproductive health care have a higher likelihood of also being the victims of other crimes. We'll talk about a few others, but right now I'm focusing on the intimate partner violence and the domestic violence. And so with that in mind, with that understanding, I move Amendment L031 to Senate Bill 188 and ask that it be displayed. Thank you, Representative Evans. Just give us a moment. Amendment L31 has been moved and properly displayed. Representative to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what this amendment does is it, uh, it, it touches several different parts of the bill, but it does the same thing in all of those different components of the bill. Um, so if you look at page 14, line 21 in your bill, this is the section of the bill uh, where it's talking about issuing subpoenas in connection with proceedings in another state. So this is just adding a, a third subsection here, um, paragraph three, to clearly call out and articulate the fact that folks that may be seeking these um, types of, of care, uh, as we've just discussed, are often at a higher likelihood of being the victims of other broader life circumstances, domestic violence, intimate partner violence. And so with that in mind, what this amendment does is it just creates a call out to attract folks' attention to the fact that when folks are seeking uh, uh, reproductive health care, that those providers and any of the um, 
investigations that may or may not be in, occurring in conjunction with that that are covered by this bill, we need to make sure that we're keeping those other situations uh, in the back of our mind as well. So that says this section, again, talking about subpoenas in conjunction with a proceeding from another state, do not apply to court proceedings involving domestic violence, and then it references the domestic violence statute here in Colorado. Like I said, there's a lot of different parts in this bill, so then it touches page 16 um, after line 9. Um, and then page 16 after line 23. So this is just where it's talking about uh, search warrants. It's talking about the prohibition on the issuing of summonses, uh, the ex parte orders, and yep, that was it. So like I said, I'm bringing this amendment because I want to make sure that it remains in people's minds and in legislation that when we are talking about these cases, when we're talking about interstate investigations, when we're talking about the issuance of subpoenas um, and all of these other legal activities that we're keeping in the back of our minds that the individuals who are seeking this reproductive health care have, per the Guttmacher Institute, USAA Today, and a lot of other different resources, have a higher rate of being victimized by domestic violence, by intimate partner violence, and that we need to ensure that this legislation is reflecting that and providing the appropriate carve-outs so that those individuals are not deprived from justice in any investigations that are involving domestic violence and that those folks can get access to the justice that they deserve through the broader system, uh, the broader criminal justice and court system, and that this law is not creating um, legal barriers or roadblocks that would adversely impact their ability to get justice in these situations where we have an interstate investigation. And so for those reasons, I ask for an I vote on Amendment uh, L031. Any further discussion on Amendment L031, Madam Assistant Minority Leader? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, when I was reading the bill and Gabe and I were discussing this amendment, I think it's just really important that we don't lose sight of um, cases and other things that are happening. I think this is a really good amendment to really make sure domestic violence victims are protected. Um, and so I urge an I vote. Thank you. Any further discussion on Amendment L31, Representative Froelich? Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. There's nothing in these sections of the bill that would prevent lawful investigations of domestic violence. I ask for a no vote. Any further discussion on Amendment L31? Seeing none, members, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L31. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Aye. The noes have it. L31 is lost. Back to the bill, Representative Hamrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to speak to why this bill is so important for Colorado and our country. So according to the Guttmacher Institute, since the US Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in June 2022, the legal landscape on abortion has shifted dramatically. Many states have passed near total bans on abortion with very limited exceptions, or banned the procedure early in pregnancy. Courts have blocked some of these bans from taking effect ushering in a chaotic legal landscape that is disruptive for providers trying to offer care and patients trying to obtain it. The development since Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health Organization was decided uh, to support our initial analysis from October 2021, predicting that 26 states were certain or likely to ban abortions in the absence of Roe, with two exceptions, Michigan and South Carolina. Michigan was included as a state certain to ban abortion, because it had not repealed its pre-Roe abortion ban. However, in the November 2022 election, Michigan voters overwhelmingly approved an amendment to the state constitution protecting abortion rights, making it virtually impossible for the pre-Roe ban to go into effect. South Carolina was considered certain to ban abortion because it had enacted a six-week abortion ban in 2021. However, the South Carolina Supreme Court struck down that ban in January of 2023, holding that the right to privacy in a state's constitution includes the right to an abortion. The majority of lawmakers in the South Carolina legislature remain opposed to abortion rights and may consider another gestational age ban in the future, but the state is unlikely to adopt a ban before six weeks of pregnancy. These victories bring the number of states that have already banned abortion or are likely to do so down from 26 to 24. 
Still a staggering number, that means millions of people are being denied the right to bodily autonomy and access to critical health care. When people do not have access to abortion care in their state, they are forced to make the difficult decision to travel long distances for care, self-managing abortion, or carry an unwanted pregnancy to term. Here's where abortion bans and restrictions stand in these 24 states and what we're expecting in the months to come as states enter the first legislative sessions in 50 years without Roe. States where abortion is banned. As of January 9th, 2023, 12 states are enforcing a near total ban on abortion with, with very limited exceptions. In five of these states, the ban is being challenged in court but remains in effect. A court has blocked enforcement of a pre-Roe ban in West Virginia while it is being challenged in court. Alabama, near total ban. Arkansas, near total ban. Idaho, near total ban. A legal challenge to this Idaho ban, which seeks to expand the exceptions allowed under the ban, is pending in federal court. Kentucky, near total ban. A legal challenge to this ban is pending in state court. Louisiana, near total ban. A legal challenge to this ban is pending in state court. Mississippi, near total ban. Missouri, near total ban. Oklahoma, near total ban. A legal challenge to this ban is pending in state court. South Dakota, near total ban. Tennessee, near total ban. Texas, near total ban. A challenge to this ban, which seeks to expand the exceptions, is pending in federal court. West Virginia, near total ban. A separate pre-row ban has been blocked from enforcement while a legal challenge is pending in state court. States where abortion is unavailable. In two states, abortion care is unavailable even though a ban is not being enforced. Legal challenges are ongoing in both states. North Dakota, Seoul Clinic has moved to Minnesota. A legal challenge to the state's near total ban is pending in state court even though no abortion clinics are operating in the state. Wisconsin. Clinics stop providing abortion because the enforcement status of the state's pre-row ban is unclear. A legal challenge to this ban is pending in state court. States with gestational age bans in effect. In four states, prohibiting abortion after a specific point in pregnancy, which would have been unconstitutional under Roe, are in effect. These bans limit people's ability to obtain abortion care. Arizona, 15-week ban. A legal challenge to this ban is pending in state court. Florida, 15-week ban. A legal challenge to this ban is pending in state court. The legislature may take up earlier gestational age ban to the 2023 session. Georgia, six-week ban. A legal challenge to this ban is pending in state court. Utah, 18-week ban. A near total ban has been blocked from enforcement while legal challenge is pending in state court. States with bans currently blocked by courts. In these three states, near total bans or early gestational age bans have been blocked by state courts and are not in effect, allowing abortion services to continue for now. However, legislators in these states have demonstrated that they intend to ban abortion. Indiana, a near total ban has been blocked from enforcement while a legal challenge is pending in state court. Wyoming, a near total ban has been blocked from enforcement while a legal challenge is pending in state court. Ohio, a six-week ban has been blocked from enforcement while a legal challenge is pending in state court. The legislature may take up a near total ban in its 2023 session. Additional states that may ban or restrict abortion. In three states, anti-abortion policymakers who control the legislature and governorship have indicated that they want to ban abortion soon, but abortion care remains available for now. Iowa, Early in 2022, the Iowa Supreme Court ruled that the state constitution no longer protects abortion rights, opening the door for a new ban. Montana, after the Dobbs decision, the governor asked the Montana Supreme Court to revisit a ruling from 1999 that held the state constitution protects abortion rights. However, state courts have remained committed to protecting abortion rights over the past 23 years, even though a majority of legislators and current governor oppose abortion rights. Nebraska, in 2022, an attempt to pass a near total ban failed in the legislature. Lawmakers may again attempt to ban abortion during the 2023 legislative session. In two other states, Kansas and North Carolina, the legislature is hostile to abortion rights, while the governor supports access to abortion. We consider these states much less likely than the 24 other states to enact a near total early gestational age ban in the coming months. The country is watching. 
I urge you to support Senate Bill 23188 and continue Colorado as being a safe haven for reproductive rights. Thank you. Representative Mabry, then Representative Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. An honor to serve with you. Members, words matter. Words become thoughts and thoughts become actions. The way we talk about this issue in our transgender brothers and sisters matters. Transgender people face extraordinary levels of physical and sexual violence, whether on the streets, at school, at work, or at home, at the hands of government officials. More than one in four trans people has faced a bias-driven assault, and rates are higher for trans women and trans people of color. There's also been a rise in anti-trans disinformation in the media and from extremist lawmakers. This year, as our representative from uh, Jefferson County noted, there are hundreds of bills introduced across this country that target trans people, including their ability, the ability of trans children to use restrooms, to play sports, or to receive medical care. A record-breaking number of anti-LGBTQ laws have, all, have been enacted uh, in this country this year. Again, words matter. Actions matter. Although none of these bills directly encourage violence against LGBTQ people, they enforce a culture of bias that is often exacerbated by racism and sexism, and it can and does lead to an increased risk of fatal violence. We've seen an unprecedented amount unprecedented amounts of negative rhetoric and stigma aimed by anti-equality political leaders and public figures at transgender and non-binary people, as well as their families, loved ones, and even their medical providers. You cannot separate the words we use in this chamber, the words that are used in chambers across the country from the horrific ongoing violence against transgender people. The words we use in this chamber have impact, and we can choose to be kind, loving, and welcoming to our neighbors, to treat people the way we want to be treated, and to embrace people as they are, or we can choose to deny the identities and experiences of our neighbors and fan the flames of hatred. This is on us. Representative, please keep it constructive yes. into the bill. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. So again, again, members, trans, trans Americans are four times more likely to be victims of violent, violent crime. And um, trans youth, in particular, uh, have a severe mental health crisis going on. Um, a 2022 survey by the Trevor Project, a su suicide prevention group focused on LGBTQ youth and found that 86% of trans or non-binary youth reported negative effects on their mental health stemming from the politi political debate around trans issues. And yes, um, uh, Mr. Chair, I am tying this back to the bill because this bill is about uh, gender-affirming care and uh, the impact that gender-affirming care can have um, on uh, our youth. Um, and the scholarly literature makes clear that gender transition is effective in treating gender dysphoria and can significantly improve the well-being of transgender individuals. Members, I'm honored to rise in support of this legislation and stand with uh, my colleagues, especially our colleague from uh, Jefferson County who has come up here uh, uh, to bring this legislation um, in the face of hateful rhetoric 
and I urge a yes vote on this legislation. Thank you, Representative. Representative Evans, then it'll be Representative Martinez, then Representative Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So again, we've talked about the public safety component and some of the concerns that I have with this bill. Uh, we just talked about domestic violence. And so now I'd like to talk about another uh, related crime um, that often occurs in this same space. And that crime is human trafficking. So you see in the state of Colorado, uh, from the uh, state of Colorado's website, it talks about how since 2007, there have been 1,229 human trafficking cases that have been identified. Now, how does that relate to the bill, you ask? Well, in this bill, it talks about, uh, the title of the bill is Con Concerning Protections for Accessing Reproductive Health Care. Now, as I was reading this and I was looking, I came across a document from the White House from December 2021. This is Joe Biden's national action plan to combat human trafficking. And so when Biden is talking about, and the White House is talking about how do we combat human trafficking, on page 11 of this document, one of the things that they say is one of the biggest challenges facing law enforcement and service provider professionals. That service provider professionals is what I want to focus on because as you go through this 66-page document from the White House that talks about how do we combat human trafficking, it becomes very, very obvious that service provider professionals, such as healthcare workers, are an integral part of being able to take a stand, identify, and make referrals in this human trafficking space. Moving on to page, I believe it's 20 here. Uh, in the White House's uh, action plan to combat human trafficking. It talks about uh, the United States Department of Justice provides training on preventing and responding to human trafficking to schools, law enforcement, courts, court systems, community programs, and medical providers. And a little bit later on, it talks about how populations that are working with uh, excuse me, service providers, uh, health and human service professionals working with populations at high risk for human trafficking and who are intersecting with healthcare systems need to have training on being able to identify and appropriately respond to instances of human trafficking. And so given that the healthcare structure, the healthcare system is a critical component in combating that, I think it's important that as we discuss this bill, we understand a couple of things. Number one, as I mentioned before, uh, since 2007, 2,595 victims of human trafficking have been identified in Colorado. Now, with my military and law enforcement background, I've seen some of these cases and I've interacted with folks who have dedicated their careers to stopping these cases. And one of the things that one of my buddies told me just this morning when I called and asked him, he said, when you're looking at human trafficking networks, one of the biggest things that those networks are concerned with is teen pregnancy, because teen pregnancy is one of their highest factors in somebody potentially identifying or getting suspicious that uh, there may be some nefarious activity going on. And he says it's absolutely critical that in these cases, the folks to which these individuals might go, to include healthcare providers and reproductive healthcare folks, that those providers have the training to be able to recognize and take appropriate action when they come across examples of human trafficking. And so, with that in mind, I move Amendment L032 to Senate Bill 188 and ask that it be displayed. All right, thank you, uh, Representative Evans. The L32 has been moved and properly displayed. Please tell us about L32. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. So much like my previous amendment, uh, it touches the exact same sections in the bill on page 14, uh, where it talks about the issuings of subpoenas in conjunctions with proceedings in another state. And so that this amendment just makes it absolutely clear in the bill, given as we've discussed from the White House itself, that human trafficking victims have high rates of intersection with the healthcare system and with um, reproductive health care providers because of the fact that uh, when these individuals become pregnant, that is a high risk to the human trafficking organizations. This amendment identifies that and provides that specific guidance and that specific language in the bill so that as people are reading the law, it is clearly communicated and understood that when courts are looking at subpoenas in conjunction with these investigations uh, with out-of-state um, actors, that all those nexuses to human trafficking would not be inadvertently caught up in this legislation and would create roadblocks that would prevent uh, investigations around human trafficking from um, being able to move forward. So it talks about the, the subpoenas in page 14. Page 16, it talks about the arrests, the search warrants, uh, issuing the summonses, and then on page 17, uh, it talks about the ex parte orders. So, uh, this is why I bring this amendment, because again, I want to ensure that when we create legislation, the legislation that we're creating is not having unanticipated adverse second, third, and fourth order effects. And if you don't believe me, I mean, it's the White House themselves that are saying this, and so I would ask for an I vote on this amendment to ensure that we are having a holistic response to the fact that human traffickers um, have intersection with the healthcare system when individuals that are being trafficked have to get that healthcare, and that it's critical that we not create barriers to being able to investigate those cases. I ask for an I vote. Madam Assistant Minority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I just want to support this amendment as well. When I started working on human trafficking as a county commissioner, I remember the conversations um, in our county, but across the state. And um, there was a lot of like, is this really happening here? I remember um, getting kind of um, very heated with my sheriff at the time saying, this is happening in our communities and we are not talking about it. We need to raise more awareness for human trafficking in this state. And I remember our first proclamation that we had done to recognize that human trafficking is happening, how to recognize the signs, how to um, engage law enforcement and teach them to recognize the signs. Um, I remember after that getting calls from women from all across the state telling me their stories, and it was heartbreaking um, to the point where literally my children are incredibly well-versed on human trafficking and how to be safe um, when they're out in the community because you just don't know when this could happen to them. And so um, in discussions with, with the representative from uh, Weld County, I was um, incredibly concerned about opening the door to human trafficking and how do we put the appropriate guardrails to make sure that we're not contributing to that um, in this bill. And so I think this is a good amendment to put those appropriate guardrails on and would ask for an aye vote. Thank you. Representative Froelich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, folks, this bill does not prevent investigations into instances of human trafficking and I can't help but say how incredibly cynical it is to use a group of people who have lost their bodily autonomy to insert an amendment into a bill all about bodily autonomy. I ask for a no vote. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of amendment L032 to House Bill, uh, Senate Bill 188. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The amendment is lost. To the bill. Representative Martinez. Thank you. It's way too tall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It is an honor to serve with you. Members, I don't know what it's like to be trapped in my own body but I have continued to learn and grow in my understanding of this topic. And why have I done this? 
because I have family members and friends that I care deeply for that are transgender that I want to love and support. Family members who have been shunned and kicked out of their homes because of who they are. So let's talk about Senate Bill 23188 and the gender affirming care um, section in this. No one should be able to tell you what you can or cannot do with your body. This is a decision that must be made by the individual and their licensed medical professional. Do you want the government to tell you what you can and cannot do with your body? I sure don't. Let's take another look on why gender affirming care is so critical. And we're gonna look into the United States military. Grunt, the curious science of humans at war looks at scientific research that went into recent wars of Iraq and Afghanistan, of which I'm a veteran of. Anywhere from why buttons on our utility uniforms are made the way they are as to why footrests are in, in MRAP vehicles. One section on this book is about gender affirming care, but not for the reasons that you think. The purpose of this section pertains to veterans who have sustained lower body injuries while in the service of this country and are left with no other options. The military relied on existing gender affirming care to assist these veterans in returning to a state of normalcy. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have left veterans with injuries that have not been common in war due to the enemy's weapon of choice, the IED or improvised explosive device. These injuries have led veterans to not only dealing with lifelong effects, but also psychological wounds. They want to return to a state of normalcy and have been able to do so because of advancements in gender affirming care. Still not convinced. Let's look at the subject from a different angle. Small government and bodily autonomy. I don't want the government to tell me what tattoos or piercings I can get or wear. I have them. It's all about choice. Choice. A person can choose to do what they want with their body and that is no one's business except for them and their doctor. Because of that, we must ensure that we have access to healthcare and healthcare that is accessible and efficient. Again, I want to see my family and friends have access to gender affirming care and I want to ensure that medical professionals are protected. I stand with my family, I stand with medical professionals providing gender affirming care, and I urge an I vote on Senate Bill 23-188. Representative Wilson, I believe. Further discussion? Representative Wilson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, discuss section 16-3-102, arrest by a peace officer. This piece, I feel, is unnecessary and puts our police officers in a, in a bad situation. Uh, the reason being is often our police officers respond to incidents or are given direction uh, to serve a warrant. They're not, they're not the judge and jury on what is legal, legal and not legal. They're just there to do their job. They do not have, um, they don't go and search these things out. They're, they, they go by orders, they go by instruction and they go by what they're taught to do. This section uh, could possibly put them in liability for something they're unaware of. So I would like to move amendment 034 and ask for it to be displayed. Thank you, Representative. We'll get that displayed. L034 has been moved and properly displayed. Please continue. Representative Wilson. Thank you. This amendment just takes out the section arrest by peace officer. Um, I was informed that this is supposed to apply to outside of Colorado or uh, officers responding in Colorado for something that is legal in Colorado. I don't think that is very clear in this section that it doesn't apply to officers in Colorado or criminal fences outside. So I would ask for a, and I think there's plenty of other safeguards around this action in the other sections of this bill. So I ask for a yes vote on this amendment. Representative Titone. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It is an honor to serve with you. Thank you. Uh, so I, I appreciate uh, the, the conversation here about this part. Uh, you know, if you look at that section nine, it says a peace officer shall not knowingly arrest or knowingly participate in the arrest of a person who engages in this. So, you know, what we're talking about here is, you know, the warrants that are coming in from out of state about these things. And if you know that that's the reason why you're doing that warrant, then you're doing something that's against the law and that warrant should not be uh, used. So this really is just gonna protect, you know, not having this in here is gonna protect a rogue person who doesn't want, uh, who wants to help out of state actors. And that's what this section's for, is to protect the, uh, the people getting legally protected health care. This is health care legal in, the, in Colorado. And uh, we do not want our police officers or peace officers to arrest or participate in an arrest with respect to this health care. So this, this section is important to making sure that we have a seamless uh, shield on the people who are here doing uh, the health care services that they need. So I urge a no vote on this amendment. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'd like to continue to try to appeal to uh, the bill sponsors. Um, I think this, this opens a door to lawsuits and legal liability that's unintended. And I understand what the bill sponsors are saying about knowing and knowingly, but I feel it's very easy to get around those when, when you are uh, unhappy with something law enforcement's doing. We see that all the time. Um, so again, I ask for a, a yes vote on this amendment and hope that uh, we get some support on it. Further discussion on L34. Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of amendment L34 to Senate Bill 188. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Aye. The amendment is lost. To the bill. Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, um, I've, been, I've been concerned with this having to do with the uh, medical profession, doctors, different things like that. And uh, so I would like to move Amendment L022 and have it uh, displayed. Thank you, Representative Bottoms. We'll get the amendment displayed. L-22 is before us. Please proceed. Representative Bottoms. So let me, let me read this. and it, it, It's self-explanatory, but I'll explain a little bit. But we want to make sure that uh, doctors are kept safe here. And these people have spent their lives getting to this point and, uh, and procuring a practice and all kinds of things. So we want to make sure that, uh, that they're, they're, they're safe in continuing this. So it will now say the prohibitions against denying licensure, certification, or registration, and against imposing disciplinary action against an individual's license, certificate, or registration specified in this subsection do not apply if the applicant or individual provided a legally protected health care activity in another state or United States territory in a manner that was inconsistent with generally accepted standards. This is, this is obviously just ongoing standards that have been around forever just about. And uh, we just want to make sure they've been, they, they are practicing medicine. They're actually keeping to the Hippocratic Oath. And, uh, and we want to make sure that they're protected under this when this involves other states or these kind of things. With generally accepted standards of practice under the law of the jurisdiction in which the care was provided or that otherwise violated the law of that jurisdiction. So I would like to uh, urge an I vote on Amendment L022. Further discussion, Representative Titone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, you know, we're we're trying to be sure that uh, the healthcare providers here don't have any issues with their licenses, uh, especially from outside uh, of the state of Colorado, going after the licenses of our providers. So uh, we are uh, urging a no vote on this amendment because uh, we want to make sure that uh, the providers here are not put at risk. Uh, these are our doctors, 
Uh, they do a lot of things other than abortion and trans health care. If their licenses are at risk, that health care is at risk to a lot of people in Colorado, and we don't want that to happen. Representative Bottoms. So again, we, we do want to make sure that doctors are safe with this, and this is what this is, is this is not affecting anybody that doesn't want or wants any kind of care. This is just making sure that when a doctor is doing what they have established as their practice outside uh, the state of Colorado, that they're protected. Um, this, this bill is about Colorado. It's not about the rest of the United States. And so, again, um, I urge and I vote. Further discussion on the amendment. Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L-22 to Senate Bill 188. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. The amendment is lost. To the bill. Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, today I rise as a parent We talk a lot about parental rights in this chamber, and the way that we have approached the conversations around the provisions in this bill, around gender-affirming care, is not in ref a reflection of what every parent wants for their kid. Every parent wants the best for their kid. Every parent wants to support them through the journey of life with the supports that they need, including the health care that they need, the mental health care that they need. And I think it's important that we continue to affirm that in Colorado, parents who want to support their children in their gender, in their authentic gender identities and their transitions are also protected. And that's what this bill does. Too many states right now are criminalizing being a supportive parent of a transgender child. And no one deserves to be called uh, have social, secure, so, social services called upon you or to be referred to some government agency just because you want what is best for your kid. So how is it consistent to be against these kinds of protections for parents who come with their children, supporting them in their authentic selves with the idea of the parental rights that so many people in this chamber talk about. I think it's important to mention that almost all abortion banning states are also attempting to ban gen gender affirming care. Arkansas, Tennessee, Arizona, and Alabama have passed laws. In Alabama, providing gender affirming care levels a possible 10-year felony sentence. And you don't have to look too hard on Google to find article after article in reputable news organizations talking about parents who are fearful for living in Texas because of governor's orders there. This kind of bill protects people who come to Colorado as a health care refuge to support their child in their journey in their life's journey, to support their child in being their authentic self. Gender-affirming care is life-saving. It's life-saving for so many people, so many children and their parents. That's what this bill is about. It's about protecting kids' lives and it's about protecting their parents who want to support their kids. I ask for an I vote. Representative Evans. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. So again, we've talked at length uh, about some of the concerns that I have with this bill. And with respect to some of the uh, conversation that we've heard um, from the other side of the aisle, you know, having spent 10 years in law enforcement, this is an issue that is important to me that it's specifically highlighted. The reason I'm standing in this chamber today and the reason that I stepped away from a very successful career in law enforcement was because of a lot of legislation that unfortunately impacted me and my uh, officers in ways that weren't intended. And so with that in mind, I would like to move Amendment L033 to this bill and ask that it be displayed. Thank you, Representative. We'll get that displayed just a second here. The amendment has been moved and properly displayed. Representative Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So when law enforcement and the folks that are out in the community doing this justice work are reading the law, because we do, we have to sit down and read the law line by line and figure out exactly what it says we can and can't do. Being able to clarify these specific issues of high importance and being able to draw attention to these issues is more than just saying, oh, hey, well, maybe some other obscure section of the law did not prevent law enforcement from doing this. It's giving that clear and blatant attention to a critical issue so that those critical issues are identified and flagged as activity that is expressly called out as something that is permissible. Um, it draws attention to these issues, it raises awareness to these issues, and it raises awareness of the fact that when we are talking about reproductive health care, that reproductive health care space intersects with human trafficking, with domestic violence, and for the, uh, for the purposes of this amendment, it intersects with child abuse. So, Placing amendments like this in the law is not stating that there's no other parts of the law that would address this. What it is stating is that in these areas where you have that high rate of intersection with folks who are being victimized and these types of cases, it's important to clearly state so that everybody who is reading that law to include the cops who are not lawyers but who also have to understand and enforce the law, it's important to make it absolutely clear to them what this law does and does not do and to highlight that for the purposes of this amendment, this section, again, we've gone through the sections in the bill before, but this section does not apply to court proceedings involving child abuse and then it references the definition of child abuse in Colorado law. And then it goes through and it touches those additional sections of the bill um, that we've discussed at length. So um, I present this amendment as uh, an effort to ensure that the non-lawyers who are reading these laws at 2 a.m. in the morning when they are trying to untangle a messy case that involves an out-of-state warrant involving child abuse, by the way, I've been there, I've done that, it's an absolute mess trying to untangle somebody, some other state's warrant that is potentially valid in your state, Creating these clear call-outs in law provides guidance to those individuals who do not have access to a lawyer at 2 a.m. in the morning on Christmas and who also would benefit from guidance that clearly states that given the intersection of reproductive health care and child abuse, the proceedings that are outlined in the bill are not governed if the issue at stake is one involving child abuse. So for these reasons, I ask for an I vote on Amendment L033. Thank you. Representative Tatone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I, I appreciate the, uh, the sentiment here. Uh, you know, nobody's uh, trying to impede anyone from uh, trying to go after anyone abusing a child. That's not, this bill does not have anything to do with that. Uh, this will just, th this amendment doesn't change anything. All the things that are still illegal are still illegal. And when it comes to search warrants or orders or court proceedings, all of that's very well thought out with lots of attorneys ahead of time. So when a police officer does do this, it's going to be uh, made in accordance with the law, all of the law. And this bill, Senate Bill 188, does not impede with any of that. So I ask for a no vote. Further discussion on Amendment L33. Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L33. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Zero. The noes have it. The amendment is lost. To the bill. Representative Froelich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Folks, 
this is an opportunity to sort of transition about uh, to to the to talk a little bit about the states that have these most restrictive abortion laws and the most restrictive gender affirming care laws are also the states in which maternal supports and child supports are the weakest. You have the highest rates of child poverty, you have the highest rates of infant mortality, and you have the highest rates of maternal mortality. You also have the highest rates of maternal care deserts. The chilling effect of banning abortion, banning gender affirming care, ripples throughout the whole community and dampens the ability of all folks to get appropriate and proper health care. And it turns out, places way more people into poverty, places way more children into food insecurity. These states have what is known as a double whammy for people who live in these states, and, and they're mostly in the South. According to the uh, nationwide study from the Kaiser Family Foundation, they are far less likely to have assistance for themselves and their children, and they are far less likely to have health care available to them when they are pregnant and for their children. And that means there's going to be not only more hardship, but greater health problems and maternal deaths and so on, unless there's a fundamental change in political behavior in those states. And of course, we can't do anything about that because we're Colorado legislators. But what an opportunity to establish that in Colorado, we respect reproductive care, we respect gender affirming care, and we have in place as many supports as we can for maternal health, that we care about maternal health, that we wanna see maternal mortality decline, and we've had bills about that, that we want to address child poverty and child hunger, and we've had bills to do that. So be proud, Colorado, of the work that we have done. This bill protects the work that we have done in all of those areas because they all intersect, and we ask for an I vote. Looks like we've got quite a few folks lined up. I'm going to go to the assistant minority leader, then I'm going to go to Representative Bradfield, and then we're going to go to Rep Representative McLaughlin and then we'll go to Representative Soper. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanna talk to you a little bit about the power of local government. And you're probably like, what does the power of local government have to do with concerning protections for accessing pr reproductive health care? And it kind of felt the same way when I was reading this bill. Um, so um, I, I want to start with my amendment and then we can kind of go into why I'm just confused as to why this is in the bill. But um, with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move L030 to Senate Bill 188 and ask that it be displayed. Great. L30 has been moved and is properly before us. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm sure that a, a lot of you um, who, are, who have been part of local government in some respect can kind of appreciate this. So the first part of it says, powers of local government, the power and authority granted does not limit any power or authority presented uh, presently exercised or previously granted. Each local government within its respective jurisdiction has the authority to plan for and regulate the use of land by regulating the use of land on the basis of the impact of use on the community or surrounding areas. I agree with that 100%. But then the rest of this is where I take some issue. So we're now saying that land use is a matter of local, uh, no longer a ma matter of local government control, but a matter of statewide concern. And I'm incredibly, that is incredibly concerning to local government officials in this room, where basically, in this bill, we're usurping local government authority. Land use is a huge part of our local government authority um, for the purposes of zoning and other land use planning. And I don't disagree, you know, there, there needs to be some conversations around medical offices and how those are used. Um, we do define those in our land use regulations. But having it as a matter of statewide concern, having, I am incredibly concerned about 
the state saying, local governments, it doesn't matter you were elected by your people, it doesn't matter that your communities are so different, we are going to tell you how and where you're going to put these medical offices, healthcare clinics, um, for outpatient healthcare services. And I lived on the Western Slope for 14 years. Um, I now live in Colorado Springs, which is incredibly different than the Western Slope. And I practice in Southeast Colorado, which is incredibly different from the Western Slope and Colorado Springs. And so what's good for the Western Slope is not necessarily good for Southeast Colorado, and it's not necessarily good for Colorado Springs because they all have unique characteristics that are incredibly different. And that's why you elect local government officials that you get to communicate with. This is what I want in my community. This is where I want it in my community. We have public outreach and stakeholder meetings and processes. And basically, in this bill, we are now taking all of that control and power away from local governments and empowering the state to tell us how to do local land use. I, I mean, I don't think it belongs in the bill. I had this conversation with a drafter. Um, the, the, title in this case is broad enough, I guess, to encompass usurping local government control. Um, but I don't think it belongs here. And I think the precedent it sets is a very slippery slope. And so I want to tell you, you know, after I was a county commissioner, I am now a county attorney for a small rural county in southeast Colorado. I am a department of one person. I am the only attorney. I don't get to take off during legislative session. I spend my weekends working on their issues. And land use is a huge part of my job. I also am their 1041 attorney. So that's another added complication. And so I just want to put into practice, it took me over four months to develop um, land use regulations around wind and solar and what that looks like and meeting with stakeholders and then having a public process and then it has to go to planning commission and then planning commission has comments and then I bring it back to the planning commission then I bring it to county commissioners and then I go back and forth. My commissioners only meet twice a month um, and so it's, it is a long process. I'm right now um, in the process of drafting battery storage, which we have no regulations in all of Colorado relating to battery storage. And it's so new in the United States that it has taken me months to research. What I'm saying is we put a lot of time and effort on both the county attorney side, the planning commission side, the county commissioner side to come up with land use regulations that we then bring to our people that will then put public process and input into. And you're taking that authority away. Um, and I, I just, I don't think it belongs in this bill. I don't think it's applicable. I don't know why we're talking about usurping land use authority when we're talking about access to health care. Um, another concern I have, which I think other representatives are going to talk about, this basically says that it can go anywhere for, for any, all these medical um, centers can go anywhere. Well, we have an airport authority and an airport overlay district. That is regulated by the feds and by the FAA. We have to be in compliance with federal law. And so saying that now local governments can no longer have that authority and that basically these medical clinics can go anywhere, including in an airport overlay district, which will violate federal laws that we have to abide by, basically opens up local governments to litigation as a county attorney and a department of one. I'm incredibly nervous about opening up counties to litigation. Um, and so saying, and, and I'm kind of confused by this because as a, as a former county commissioner and as a county attorney, I'm thinking, what does implementation look like? So you're gonna pass this law and then it goes on, it becomes law, comes on my desk. What do I have to do to stay in compliance for my county with this law? And so as I'm looking at it, um, you're saying that we need to do it by ordinance. Well, counties don't adopt zoning by ordinance. Um, municipalities do. I don't do municipal law, but municipal law and county law are very different. And so you're saying we need to do it by ordinance. We adopt land use regulations by resolution. Um, and so that's going to be an issue for me because I'm not sure how to, how to do this one section by resolution and not by an ordinance. And then you're saying that um, it can go anywhere for any purpose. Well, does that make it no longer subject to a special use permit like every other medical facility? Or is it a use by right, which I generally only use for agricultural land? Um, these are questions as a county attorney, I'm not sure how to implement your law that you're gonna be putting in place. Um, and I'm telling you, it is actually stressing me out because I am a department of one person. 
And so I'm not sure how to implement this so that my county is not open to litigation and subject to issues coming down. And then I'm gonna end with the safety clause. So I just explained that we have this whole process that takes months, but the safety clause says this will go into effect as soon as the bill is signed into law. I don't know how I am going to comply with this. I do not have the time. I mean, I spend my weekends working on my county attorney stuff, and I haven't had a weekend to work on my county attorney stuff. And my county still needs me because I'm a department of one. So now you're saying we're gonna implement this. Um, we don't care how long your land use process takes. We don't care how long it's gonna take you to draft. It doesn't matter that um, the people need to then have input into this. I, you're stressing me out. And so I just, I just want to, I mean, I'm, I'm not getting to the policy behind this bill. I'm just saying implementation of this bill is going to not just stress me out, but stress out every county attorney, whether you're an urban or a rural um, county attorney. Um, although I will put a plug in for rural county attorneys, we are normally a department of one. Um, and so we also have employment issues and other issues that aren't just land use. And so I just, I think the practical implementation needs to be discussed. I think we need to have more conversation around how this actually works in real life. And I know that there are several local government officials on both the county level and municipal level who can say that the way this is structured um, causes some, a lot of problems in implementation. So I hope that you will hear me. I hope that you will listen um, and vote yes on this amendment. Thank you. Representative Taggart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise in support of this amendment as a former mayor. And I want to read you section C on page 28. Nothing in this subsection restricts or supersedes the authority of a local government to enact uniform zoning ordinances and other land use regulations but here's the kicker, that comply with this subsection. So we just took the control away from local government by putting that clause in that comply with this subsection. That sets a very dangerous precedent that this body can do on other legislation, that we can come up with a reason why we take this authority away. You've already said later on down here on line 14, such facilities fall within the meaning, meaning of medical office. If they do, that's already in our zoning ordinance. And, and now in addition to what the assistant minority leader, we've got business improvement districts. We've got two significant ones in Grand Junction. We have overlays that have restrictions. We have FAA areas, a significant area with restrictions. And now we're stepping in and setting more restrictions. If this is covered under a medical office use, this is just not needed. We don't need to tell local government how to manage their business. This section is not needed in this uh, legislation whatsoever. I ask you for an aye on this amendment. Representative Froelich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I served on my uh, city council and um, we're really lucky in this bill that we were able to stake hold with CML, which of course stands for Colorado Municipal League um, and they proposed an amendment that passed in the Senate. So um, they fixed the bill in the Senate on this issue um, at the request of CML. So it's unnecessary and I ask for a no vote. Madam Assistant Minority Leader. Um, thank you for that clarification. I just want to reiterate, counties and municipalities are incredibly different. We operate under different laws in different jurisdictions, and so I'm glad that CML thinks that's fine. I'm telling you as a county attorney who actually has to implement this law, that this um, implementation is going to be incredibly difficult, especially for small rural counties across the state. Thank you. Further discussion on Amendment L30. Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L30 to Senate Bill 188. All those in favor say aye. 
All those opposed, no. no. The noes have it. The amendment is lost. To the bill, Representative Bradfield. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am so grateful I'm not a county attorney. My goodness. However, however I was a teacher of reading. Um, and Representative Bradfield, yes, could you just yes. move the mic a little I, closer to you? It's just difficult to hear you, and I want to make sure we can all pay attention. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would like to move um, amend, Amendment 023 to Senate Bill 23188 and have it displayed. One second, we'll get that displayed. The amendment has been properly moved and is before us. Please proceed. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this amendment uh, is re, re, um, asking that a task force be um, <clears throat> be assigned to this bill and that uh, this task force would have several uh, responsibilities and that uh, rather than taking it back to committee, um, that the task force would take a look at this and compare it with other states. Now, as we take a look at this amendment, the first um, item on the amendment is starting out on page 11. Uh, and on page 11 is the beginning of section number five. And it, it asks to add the words task force before the word definitions on line 18. Well, Line 16 is really the beginning of the verbiage on uh, Section 5. It starts out with um, probably a reference to Colorado State statute. And there in, is in bold print um, words that uh, are going to be pretty important, so I will read them aloud. Legally protected health care activity. We've heard that a lot this morning, so I think we probably all know what that re is uh, a definition of. Prohibit adverse action against regula regulated professionals and applicants. Task force definitions. Uh, then when you read on down in this, we see that there is a definition for a civil judgment. <clears throat> hmm. Civil judgment, okay. I think we're talking about something that is more important than how I speak to you in a civil tone. But it means a final court decision and order resulting from a civil lawsuit or a settlement in lieu of a final court decision. Okay? B, criminal judgment. Well, there are lots of things that can be a criminal judgment a guilty verdict, a plea of uh, guilty, a plea of no low con contendery. I think I'd have to look that one up. Pre-trial diversion, deferred judgment, sentence re resulting from criminal charges or criminal proceedings or the dismissal of charges or the decision not to pr prosecute charges. That's a lot to take in, and I probably will need to think about that for a while. But I move on. When I turn the page to number uh, page 12, I will just start uh, just highlighting the uh, various sections. Section C is gender affirming health care services. I think we've heard quite a bit about uh, those health care services already this morning. And if there is any question or that uh, anyone would have about those services, uh, probably needs to take one of the sponsors to the side and uh, ask questions. D is legally protected health care activity. I think we've heard a lot about that this morning. So, um, 
again, if you have a question on that, the sponsors certainly could help you out. Reproductive health care is section E. And then we go to another big category as number two, a regulator shall not deny licensure, certification, or registration to an applicant or impose disciplinary action against an individual's license, certificate, or registration based solely on. Okay, so we have some nots. That means you can't do it. So, in A, my goodness, the applicant, licensee, certificates, registrants, provision of, or assistance in the provision of, a legally protected healthcare activity in this state or any other state or the United States territory. So long as the care provided was consistent with generally accepted standards of practice under Colorado law and did not otherwise violate Colorado law. And I have read about 50 words and I am not sure that they make a whole lot of sense to me, but then I'm not a lawyer. So because I'm not a lawyer and because the rest of this Section 5 is pretty much legalese. I am going to take jump right now to line 3 of the amendment. Line 3 of the amendment asks for you to go to page 4 and to insert. And this is what we want to insert, and this is the critical part. Knowing that you do not have this in front of you, um, unless you've got it on your iPad, or you have walked up to the screen to read, read the print. Line three says, page 14, after line four, insert. Roman uh, three, in parentheses, the director, in collaboration with the attorney general, shall form a task force for the purpose of compiling the laws of each state and the United States territory pertaining to legally protected healthcare activity, generally accepted standards of practice, and other laws of each state and the United States territory pertaining to the provision of or assistance in the provision of a legally protected healthcare activity in the particular state or territory. Okay, bottom line, task force, look up the laws that other states have, compile a directory, compile a list, compile the cliff notes for this. Next sentence. On or before December 31st, 2023, the task force shall compile the laws and provide the consultation of laws to the regulators of each task uh, health care profession regulated under this Title 12 for the purpose uh, for the use in considering an application for a license certificate or registration submitted by an applicant who is certificated credentialed you know, credentialed in another state or the United States Territory. Well, guys, this task force has a lot to do. They've got some important things, and everything that they do are things that would make this bill better if we would, uh, it would, um, if we would all approve this amendment. So, for Amendment L023 to Senate Bill 23188, I'd like to ask for an I vote. Thank you, Representative Bradfield. Representative Froelich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Attorney General is another folk person that we um, have had a lot of discussion with and um, a lot of amendments from and buy-in on the bill, so this is not anything that came up during that time. We ask for a no vote. Further discussion on Amendment L23. Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L23. All those in favor say aye. 
All those opposed, no. no. The noes have it. The amendment is lost. To the bill, Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So most of us can honestly say that we love everyone. We would like to say that we love everyone. And if you are in that line of thinking, which I hope you are, then absolutely love everyone. Gender-affirming care is life-saving, and trans children are loved. I have several LGBTQ friends and family, and I truly, truly love them all. And I wish you would do the same. Thank you. Representative Bockenfeld. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve with you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to request that the bill be read at length. There's been a request for the bill to be read at length. First regular session, 74th General Assembly State of Colorado re-engrossed. This version includes all amendments adopted in the House of Introduction LLSNO. 23 to 531.01 Shelby Ross X 4510 Senate Bill 23 to 188. Senate Committees House Committees Judiciary. A bill for an act. 101 concerning protections for accessing reproductive health. 102 care. Bill summary. Note, this summary applies to this bill as introduced and does not reflect any amendments that may be subsequently adopted. If this bill passes third reading in the House of Introduction, a bill summary that applies to the re-engrossed version of this bill will be available at http colon slash slash leg.colorado.gov. The bill requires contracts between insurers or other persons and healthcare providers regarding the delivery of healthcare services to include a provision that prohibits the following actions if the actions are based solely on the healthcare provider's provision of, or assistance in the provision of, reproductive healthcare or gender-affirming healthcare services, legally protected healthcare activity, in this state, so long as the Senate third reading unamended March 22, 2023. Senate amended second reading March 21, 2023. Senate Sponsorship Gonzalez and Jaquez Lewis, Cutter, Marchman, Moreno, Winter F., Bridges, Buckner, Coleman, Danielson, Fenberg, Fields, Ginel, Hansen, Hinrichsen, Coker, Mullica, Rodriguez, Sullivan, Zenzinger. House Sponsorship Froelich and Titten, Epps, McCormick. Shading denotes House Amendment. Double underlining denotes Senate Amendment. Capital letters or bold and italic numbers indicate new material to be added to existing law. Dashes through the words or numbers indicate deletions from existing law. Care provided did not violate Colorado law. A medical malpractice insurer from refusing to issue, canceling or terminating, refusing to renew, or imposing any sanctions, fines, penalties, or rate increases for a medical malpractice policy, Section 2. A health insurer from taking an adverse action against a health care provider, including refusing to pay for a provided health care service, terminating or refusing to renew a contract with the health care provider, or imposing other penalties on the health care provider. Section 3. A health insurer from refusing to credential a physician as a network provider or terminating a physician's status as a network provider. Section 4. Or. A person or entity from terminating a health care contract with a health care provider. Section 25. Section 5 protects an individual applying for licensure, certification, or registration in a healthcare related profession or occupation in Colorado, applicant, as well as a healthcare professional. Currently licensed, certified, or registered in Colorado, licensee, from having the license, certification, or registration denied or discipline imposed against the licensee based solely on the applicant's or licensee's provision of, or assistance in the provision of, a legally protected health care activity in this state or another state or United States territory, so long as the care provided was consistent with generally accepted standards of practice under Colorado law and did not otherwise violate Colorado law. A civil or criminal judgment or a professional disciplinary action arising from the provision of, or assistance in the provision of, a legally protected health care activity in this state or another state or United States territory, so long as the care provided was consistent with generally accepted standards of practice under Colorado law and did not otherwise violate Colorado law. The applicant's or licensee's own personal effort to seek or engage in a legally protected health care activity, or 
A civil or criminal judgment against the applicant or licensee arising from the individual's own personal legally protected health care activity in this state or another state or United States territory. Section 6 prohibits a court, judicial officer, court employee, or attorney from issuing a subpoena in connection with a proceeding in another state concerning an individual who accesses a legally protected health care activity in Colorado or an individual who performs, assists, or aids in the performance of a legally protected health care activity in. Dash 2, 188. Colorado. Section 7 prohibits the state from applying another state's law to a case or controversy heard in Colorado State Court or giving any force or effect to any judgment issued without personal jurisdiction or due process or to any judgment that is penal in nature pursuant to another state's law if the other state's law authorizes a person to bring a civil action against another person or entity for engaging or attempting to engage in a legally protected health care activity. If a medical malpractice action is brought in this state against a health care provider regulated in this state or another state, Section 8 prohibits a court or arbitrator from allowing evidence or witness testimony relating to professional discipline or criminal or civil charges in this state or another state concerning the provision of, or assistance in the provision of, a legally protected health care activity, so long as the care provided did not violate Colorado law. Section 9 prohibits a peace officer from knowingly arresting or participating in the arrest of any person who engages in a legally protected health care activity, unless the acts forming the basis for the arrest constitute a criminal offense in Colorado or violate Colorado law. Section 10 prohibits the issuance of a search warrant to search for and seize any property that relates to an investigation into a legally protected health care activity. Section 11 prohibits a judge from issuing a summons in a case when a prosecution is pending, or when a grand jury investigation has started or is about to start, for a criminal violation of another state's law involving the provision or receipt of or assistance with accessing a legally protected health care activity that is legal in Colorado, unless the acts forming the basis of the prosecution or investigation would also constitute a criminal offense in Colorado. Section 12 prohibits the issuance of an ex part order for wiretapping or eavesdropping to obtain any wire, oral, or electronic communication that relates to an investigation into a legally protected health care activity. Current law allows for the extradition of a person who committed an act in this state that intentionally results in a crime in the state whose executive authority is making the demand, even though the accused was not in the demanding state at the time of the commission of the crime. Section 13 requires the acts for which extradition is sought to be punishable by the laws of this state if the acts occurred in this state and prohibits the governor from surrendering a person charged in another state as a result of the person engaging in a legally protected health care activity, unless the executive authority of the demanding state alleges in writing that the accused was physically present in the demanding state at the time of the commission of the alleged offense. Section 14 requires a correctional facility or private contract. Dash 3, 188. Prison incarcerating a person who is capable of pregnancy to, regardless of the person's ability to pay, ensure access to abortions by providing a pregnant person with information about abortion providers, referrals to community-based providers of abortions, referrals to community-based organizations that help people pay for abortions, and transportation to access an abortion, and ensure access to miscarriage management, including medication. Section 15 adds a reproductive health care services worker to the list of protected persons whose personal information may be withheld from the Internet if the protected person believes dissemination of such information poses an imminent and serious threat to the protected person or the safety of the protected person's immediate family. Section 16 prohibits the prosecution or investigation of a licensed health care provider if the health care provider prescribes an abortifacient to a patient and the patient ingests the abortifacient in another state so long as the abortifacient is prescribed or administered consistent with accepted standards of practice under Colorado law and does not violate Colorado law. Section 17 through Section 20 adds a protected healthcare worker to the list of persons authorized to participate in the Address Confidentiality Program. Section 21 authorizes the Attorney General to independently initiate and bring a civil and criminal action to enforce the Reproductive Health Equity Act. Section 22 prohibits a state agency from providing any information or using any government resources in furtherance of any out-of-state investigation or proceeding seeking to impose civil or criminal liability or professional sanction upon a person or entity for engaging in a legally protected health care activity. Section 23 prohibits a public entity from denying, restricting, or interfering with, through any efforts, including licensing or zoning restrictions, any person's or business entity's ability to provide reproductive health care, or interfering with, discriminating against, or penalizing, through any civil or criminal laws, any person or business entity for assisting, aiding, or treating an individual for reproductive health care, or prohibiting or restricting, through any civil or criminal laws, 
including the establishment or expansion of a private right of action, any person or business entity from assisting, aiding, or treating an individual for reproductive health. Care. Section 24 authorizes an action to enforce the provisions of the Reproductive Health Equity Act to be commenced by a person or. Dash 4, 188. Business entity withstanding in Denver District Court. 1. Be it enacted by the General Assembly of the State of Colorado. 2. Section 1. Legislative Declaration. 1. The General Assembly 3 finds and declares that, for, a, the United States Supreme Court's decision in June 2022 to 5 overturn Roe v. Wade in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization 6 has had immediate, disastrous effects on health care across the country. 7. The resulting patchwork of state laws, executive orders, local ordinances, 8 and court challenges has led to legal chaos and has caused grief, fear, and 9 confusion. 10. B. As of January 2023, 24 states have banned abortion 11 or severely restricted abortion access, and more will likely try to do so in 12 the near future. 13. C. Nationally, abortion clinics across the country are closing, 14 resulting in an eroded reproductive healthcare infrastructure. Almost all 15 abortions are performed in clinics rather than in hospitals or doctors. 16 offices, and in the 10 years before the Dobbs decision, a third of 17 independent clinics closed. That pace of closure has doubled since Dobbs. 18 alarmingly, 100 days after the decision to overturn Roe, at least 1966 clinics in 15 states stopped offering abortion care, and most 20 clinics closed, eliminating preventative health care access as well. 21. D. Colorado's abortion providers are the closest available 22 providers to the 1.2 million people seeking care from neighboring states, 23 in Colorado clinics have seen a 33% rise in the number 24 of patients seeking abortion care post Dobbs. Colorado residents seeking 25 abortion care and other wellness care that many clinics provide, especially. Dash 5, 188. One in rural and other underserved areas, face wait times that have increased two from one or two days up to three weeks in some cases. Colorado residents three seeking gender-affirming care will see a similar increase in wait times as four other states enact further restrictions. It is chillingly clear that since five Dobbs, Colorado's reproductive health care infrastructure is threatened six by exterior pressures. 7. E. A growing number of states, the same states hostile to abortion eight rights, are also banning gender-affirming health care and pursuing nine anti-LGBTQ plus legislation. Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, Utah, and 10 Tennessee have enacted prohibitions on gender-affirming care for youth 11 and young adults. 11 other states are considering restrictions that 12 would make providing gender-affirming health care a felony or ban 13 insurance coverage for such care, with Missouri's proposed Law 14 criminalizing care for patients up to age 25. 15. F. Several states are also eroding their health care infrastructure. 16. By requiring providers to report any patients seeking gender-affirming 17 health care to law enforcement. Providers are being forced to choose 18 compliance with state law over their oath to do no harm, and those laws 19 conflict with the strongest recommendations by the American Academy 20 of Pediatrics that transgender youth be given the fullest range of medical 21 and psychiatric care possible. 22. G. The National Reproductive Health and Gender Affirming 23 healthcare infrastructure is being eroded, and Colorado's healthcare 24 infrastructure is being strained. 25. H. In states where abortion and gender affirming healthcare are 26 still legal. The influx of patients from states with criminal bans or severe 27 restrictions has created lengthy waiting times for appointments, delaying. Dash 6, 188. One access to care for all. States hostile to reproductive rights and two gender-affirming health care are not content with prohibiting care and three access within their borders, such states seek to impose these restrictions for on every other state as well. Colorado OBGYN physicians have said five publicly that the increased need for care is beyond their current capacity six and is physically and mentally unsustainable, leading to burnout in the seven profession and major delays in patient treatment. Likewise, current and eight future politically motivated restrictions on gender-affirming care in other nine states will create an adjacent crisis in Colorado. 10. I. Abortion and gender-affirming care providers are 11 overwhelmed, fear violence and legal consequences, and face a dramatic 12 increase in patient numbers. They also fear attacks on their licensure, 13 denial of liability insurance, and interstate prosecution. Patients, and those 14 who support them, are also scared. Individuals seeking abortion care, and 15 those who help them, face criminal prosecution. The parents of youth 16 seeking gender-affirming health care face charges of child abuse and 17 neglect. 
Additional restrictions on reproductive and gender-affirming 18 health care are anticipated, which could further restrict access, make it 19 difficult to obtain accurate information, make it harder to travel for care, 20 and even prohibit access to safe, FDA-approved abortion medication and 21 gender-affirming hormones. 22. J. As Colorado is further impacted by neighboring states' 23 reproductive and gender-affirming health care restrictions, Colorado will 24 see the same deepening of existing inequities for poor or geographically 25 underserved people, and black and indigenous communities and other 26 communities of color, 27, K, in the face of these attacks, policymakers and advocates in. Dash 7, 188. One many other states are seeking to protect providers, patients, and those who too assist them from the criminal prosecution they face from new laws. 3. Colorado has led the nation with regard to civil rights, including four individuals' rights to the full range of reproductive and gender-affirming five health care, and Coloradans have resoundingly rejected abortion bans at 6 the ballot box four times in the past 15 years. Therefore, it is critical 7 that these safeguards be enacted in statute. As a state, we will continue to aid ensure that every individual has the fundamental right to reproductive and nine gender-affirming health care and that all health care providers have the 10 protection needed to offer essential care without fear for their safety or 11 fear of losing their license or insurance. 12. L. It stands to reason that reproductive and gender-affirming 13 health care providers in states with abortion and gender-affirming. 14 health care bans will want to relocate to states that protect their practice. 15 and values, thereby becoming an important part of Colorado's healthcare 16 infrastructure, and 17, m, other states friendly to reproductive and gender-affirming 18 healthcare rights are taking steps to protect care in their states, including, 19, i, in 2022, 14 governors and 9 local governments took 20 executive action to protect providers and the patients who travel across 21 state lines to receive abortion care, 22, 2, California, Connecticut, Delaware, Illinois. Massachusetts, 23 New York, New Jersey, and Washington, D.C., passed legislation 24 designed to protect people who travel across state lines to receive and 25 abortion and the providers who care for those patients, 26, 3. In May 2022, lawmakers and advocates from 19 states, 27 including Colorado, pledged to introduce legislation to protect. Dash 8, 188. One trend. Transgender youth seeking gender-affirming health care and their families, 2 and 3, 4, Massachusetts and Illinois enacted legislation to protect four gender-affirming health care patients and providers, and California is 5 expected to follow suit during its next legislative session. 6, 2, the General Assembly further finds that despite the passage of 7 House Bill 22 to 1279, concerning the Reproductive Health Equity Act, 8 the national, legally chaotic landscape resulting from other states' current 9 and anticipated restrictions has caused widespread fear and confusion 10 among Colorado providers and patients traveling to Colorado for care. 11, 3, therefore, the General Assembly declares that medical 12 professionals currently practicing in Colorado, as well as those moving 13 to our state, should feel safe doing their jobs, and patients from Colorado 14 and elsewhere should feel safe accessing the health care they need that. 15 Colorado has protected in law. It is critical that Colorado stand up for the 16 providers of legally protected health care, their patients, and those who 17 support them. 18 Section 2. In Colorado revised statutes, add 10-4-109.6 as 19 follows, 2010-4-109.6. Medical malpractice insurers, protections relating 21 to reproductive health care, definition. 1. An insurer that issues 22 medical malpractice insurance shall not take a prohibited 23 action against an applicant for or the named insured under a 24 medical malpractice policy in this state solely because the 25 applicant or insured has provided, or assisted in the provision of, 26 a legally protected health care activity, as defined in section 2712-30-120, 1d, in this state, so long as the care provided by the dash 9, 188. One applicant or insured was consistent with generally accepted two standards of practice under Colorado law and did not three otherwise violate Colorado law. 4. 2. A.S. used in this section, prohibited action, means, 5. A. Refusing to issue a medical malpractice policy, 6. B. Canceling or terminating a medical malpractice 7 policy, 8. C. Refusing to renew a medical malpractice policy, or 9. D. Imposing any sanctions, fines, penalties, or rate 10 increases. 11 Section 3. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 10-16-121, ad, 1, f, 12 as follows, 13-10-16-121. Required contract provisions in contracts between 14 carriers and providers, definitions. 
1. A contract between a carrier 15 and a provider or its representative concerning the delivery, provision, 16 payment, or offering of care or services covered by a managed care plan 17 must make provisions for the following requirements, 18, F, I, a provision that prohibits the carrier from taking. 19. An adverse action against a provider or subjecting the provider. 22. Financial disincentives based solely on the provider's 21 provision of, or assistance in the provision of, a legally 22 protected healthcare activity, as defined in Section 12-30-1-2023-1-D, in this state, so long as the care provided did not violate 24 Colorado law. 25. 2. As used in this subsection, 1. F. Adverse action, 26 means refusing or failing to pay a provider for otherwise 27 covered services as defined in the applicable health benefit plan. Dash 10, 188. 1 Section 4. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 10 16 705.7, add 2, 9.5, as follows 3 10 16 705.7. Timely credentialing of physicians by carriers, for notice of receipt required, notice of incomplete applications required 5, delegated credentialing agreements, discrepancies, denials of 6 claims prohibited, disclosures, recredentialing, enforcement, Rule 7, definitions. 9.5, a carrier shall not refuse TO credential an 8 applicant or terminate a participating physician's participation 9 IN a provider network based solely on the applicant's or 10 participating physician's provision of, or assistance in the 11 provision of, a legally protected healthcare activity, AS 12 defined in section 12-30-120, 1D, in this state, so long AS the 13 care provided did not violate Colorado law. 14 section 5. In Colorado Revised Statutes, add 12-30-120 as 15 follows, 16-12-30-120. Legally Protected Health Care Activity, Prohibit. 17 Adverse Action Against Regulated Professionals and Applicants. 18 Definitions. 1. A.S. used in this section, unless the context 19 otherwise requires, 20. A. Civil judgment means a final court decision in 21 order resulting from a civil lawsuit or a settlement in lieu of a 22 final court decision. 23. B. Criminal judgment means a guilty verdict, a plea of 24 guilty, a plea of nalo contendera, pretrial diversion, or a 25 deferred judgment or sentence resulting from criminal charges 26 or criminal proceedings or the dismissal of charges or the 27 decision not to prosecute charges. Dash 11, 188. 1. C. Gender-affirming healthcare services means all two supplies, care, and services of a medical, behavioral health, three mental health, psychiatric, habilitative, surgical, therapeutic, for diagnostic, preventive, rehabilitative, or supportive nature five relating to the treatment of gender dysphoria. 6. D. Legally protected healthcare activity means seven seeking, providing, receiving, or referring for, assisting IN eight seeking, providing, or receiving, or providing material support 9 for or traveling to obtain gender affirming health care 10 services or reproductive health care that is not unlawful in 11 this state, including on any theory of vicarious, joint, several, 12 or conspiracy liability. As it relates to the provision of or 13 referral for gender affirming health care services or 14 reproductive health by a health care provider licensed in this 15 state and physically present in this state, the services and care. 16 are considered a legally protected health care activity if the 17 service or care is lawful in this state, regardless of the patient's 18 location. 19. E. Reproductive health care has the meaning set forth 20 IN section 25-6-402, 4. 21. 2. A regulator shall not deny licensure, certification, 22 or registration to an applicant or impose disciplinary action 23 against an individual's license, certificate, or registration based 24 solely on, 25. A the applicants, licensees, certificates, or registrants 26 provision of, or assistance in the provision of, a legally 27 protected health care activity in this state or any other state. Dash 12, 188. One or United States territory, so long as the care provided was too consistent with generally accepted standards of practice under three Colorado law and did not otherwise violate Colorado law, four, b, a civil judgment or criminal judgment against the five applicant, licensee, certificant, or registrant arising from the six provision of, or assistance in the provision of, a legally seven protected health care activity in this state or any other state eight or United States territory, so long as the care provided was nine consistent with generally accepted standards of practice under 10 Colorado law and did not otherwise violate Colorado law, 11, c, 
a professional disciplinary action or any other 12 sanction against or suspension, revocation, surrender, or 13 relinquishment of the applicants, licensees, certificates, or 14 registrants professional license, certification, or registration 15 in this state or any other state or United States territory, so 16 long as. 17. I. The professional disciplinary action is based solely on. 18. The applicants, licensees, certificates, or registrants provision 19 of, or assistance in the provision of, a legally protected 20 healthcare activity, and 21. 2. The care provided was consistent with generally 22 accepted standards of practice under Colorado law and did not 23 otherwise violate Colorado law. 24. D. The applicants, licensees, certificates, or registrants 25 own personal effort to seek or engage in a legally protected 26 healthcare activity in this state or any other state or united 27 states territory, or dash 13, 188. 1. E. A civil or criminal judgment against the applicant, 2. Licensee, certificate, or registrant arising from the individual's 3. Own personal legally protected health care activity in this 4. State or any other state or United States territory. 5. Section 6. In Colorado Revised Statutes, add 13-1-140 as 6 follows, 713-1-140. Prohibition on issuing subpoena in connection with eight proceeding in another state. 1. A court, judicial officer, court 9 employee, or attorney shall not issue a subpoena in connection 10 with a proceeding in another state concerning an individual 11 engaging in a legally protected health care activity, AS defined 12 IN section 12-30-120, 1D or an entity that provides insurance 13 coverage for gender-affirming health care services, AS defined 14 IN section 12-30-120, 1C, or reproductive health care, AS 15 defined in section 25-6-402, 4. 16, 2, this section does not prohibit the investigation of 17 criminal activity that may involve a legally protected 18 health care activity, Provided that information relating to a 19 medical procedure performed on an individual is not shared with 20 an agency or individual from another state for the purpose of 21 enforcing another state's abortion law. 22 Section 7. In Colorado Revised Statutes, add 13-21-133 as 23 follows, 2413-21-133. Out of state civil action against a person or entity 25 prohibited, legally protected health care activity, out of state civil 26 judgment. 1. IT is against the public policy of this state for the 27 law of another state to authorize a person to bring a civil. Dash 14, 188. 1. Action against another person or entity for engaging or 2. Attempting or intending to engage in a legally protected 3. Healthcare activity, AS defined in Section 12 30 120, 1. D or 4 for providing insurance coverage for gender affirming 5 healthcare services, AS defined in Section 12 30 120, 1. C or 6 reproductive health care, AS defined in section 25-6-402, 4. 7, 2, a court shall not apply another state's law as 8 described in subsection, 1, of this section to a case or 9 controversy heard in a Colorado court. 10, 3, in any action filed to enforce a foreign judgment 11 issued in connection with any litigation concerning a legally 12 protected health care activity, as defined in section 12-30-12013, 1d. The court shall not give any force or effect to any 14 judgment issued without personal jurisdiction or due process or 15 to any judgment that is penal in nature. 16 Section 8. In Colorado Revised Statutes, add 13-64-402.5 as 17 follows. 1813-64-402.5. Evidence relating to legally protected health care. 19 Activity, Legislative Declaration. 1. IT is the General Assembly's 20 intent to protect persons from liability in Colorado courts for 21 taking actions specified in Section 12-30-120, personally or 22 professionally, that are not subject to discipline by a regulator 23 pursuant to Section 12-30-120. 24. 2. In any medical malpractice action brought in this 25 state against a health care provider licensed, registered, or 26 certified in this state or in another state or United States 27 territory, a court or arbitrator shall not allow evidence or. Dash 15, 188. One witness testimony relating to professional discipline or criminal two or civil charges in this state or in another state or United three states territory, regardless of disposition or outcome, for concerning the provision of, or assistance in the provision of, a five legally protected healthcare activity, as defined in section 612-30-120, 1, d, 
so long as the care provided did not violate 7 Colorado law. 8 Section 9. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 16-3-102, add, 2, as 9 follows, 10-16-3-102. Arrest by Peace Officer. 2. A peace officer shall 11 not knowingly arrest or knowingly participate in the arrest of 12 any person who engages in a legally protected health care 13 activity, as defined in section 12-30-120, 1d, unless the acts 14 forming the basis for the arrest constitute a criminal offense in 15 Colorado. 16 Section 10. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 16-3-301, add, 4, 17 as follows, 1816-3-301. Search Warrants, Issuance, Grounds, Exception. 19 Definitions. 4. Notwithstanding Subsection, 2, of this section, a. 20 Court shall not issue a search warrant to search for and seize 21 any property that relates to an investigation into a legally 22 protected healthcare activity, as defined in Section 12-30-1 2023, 1d. 24 Section 11. In Colorado Revised Statutes, add 16-5-104 as 25 follows, 2616-5-104. Prohibition on issuing summons, reproductive 27 healthcare. A judge shall not issue a summons in a case when a dash 16 188 one prosecution is pending or when a grand jury investigation has two started or is about to start for a criminal violation of law of three another state involving a legally protected health care for activity as defined in section 12-30-121 d or involving in five entity that provides insurance coverage for gender-affirming six healthcare services, AS defined in section 12-30-120-1, C, or seven reproductive healthcare, AS defined in section 25-6-402-4, that eight IS legal in Colorado, unless the acts forming the basis of the nine prosecution or investigation would also constitute a criminal 10 offense in Colorado. 11 section 12. In Colorado revised statutes, 16-15-102, Add 12, 1, D, as follows, 1316-15-102. Ex part order authorizing the interception of wire, 14 oral, or electronic communications. 1, D, a court shall not issue 15 and ex part order for wiretapping or eavesdropping to obtain 16 any wire, oral, or electronic communication that relates to an 17 investigation into a legally protected healthcare activity, as 18 defined in section 12-30-120, 1d. 19 section 13. In Colorado revised statutes, amend 16-19-10720 as follows, 2116-19-107. Extradition of persons not present where crime 22 committed. 1. The governor of this state may also surrender, on demand 23 of the executive authority of any other state, any person in this state 24 charged in such other state in the manner provided in section 16-19-10425 with committing an act in this state, or in a third state, intentionally 26 resulting in a crime in the state whose executive authority is making the 27 demand, and the provisions of this article article 19 that are not. Dash 17, 188. One otherwise inconsistent shall apply to such cases, even though the accused too was not in that state at the time of the commission of the crime and has three not fled therefrom, provided the acts for which extradition is foresought would be punishable by the laws of this state if the acts five occurred in this state. 6. 2. Except as required by federal law, the governor shall 7. Not surrender a person charged in another state as a result of 8. The person engaging in a legally protected health care activity, 9. As defined in section 12-30-120, 1d. Unless the executive 10 authority of the demanding state alleges in writing that the 11 accused was physically present in the demanding state at the 12th time of the commission of the alleged offense and that 13 thereafter the accused fled from the demanding state. 14 Section 14. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 17-1-114.5, amend 15, 1, I, and add, 1, K, and, 1, L, as follows, 1617-1-114.5. Incarceration of a person in custody with the 17 capacity for pregnancy, report. 1. A correctional facility or private. 18. Contract prison incarcerating a person who is capable of pregnancy shall. 19. I. Establish partnerships with local public entities, private 20 community entities, community-based organizations, Indian tribes and 21 tribal organizations as defined in the Federal Indian Self-Determination 22 and Education Assistance Act, 25 U.S.C. Sector 5304, 
as amended, or 23 urban Indian organizations as defined in the federal Indian Healthcare 24 Improvement Act, 25 U.S.C. Sector 1603, as amended. And 25, K, regardless of the person's ability to pay, ensure 26 access to an abortion, AS defined in Section 25-6-402, by providing 27 a pregnant person with information about abortion providers. Dash 18, 188. 1. Referrals to community-based providers of abortions, referrals to 2. Community-based organizations that help people pay for 3. Abortions, and transportation to access an abortion, and 4. L. Ensure access to miscarriage management, including 5. Medication. 6. Section 15. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 18-9-313, Amend 7, 1, D, and, 1, N, and add, 1, 5 Quetzales, as follows, 818-9-313. Personal information on the internet, victims of nine domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking, other protected ten persons, definitions. 1. As used in this section, unless the context 11 otherwise requires, 12. D. Healthcare worker means a licensed healthcare 13 provider, or an employee, contracted healthcare provider, or individual 14 serving in a governance capacity of a healthcare facility licensed 15 pursuant to section 25-1.5-103. 16. N. Protected person means an educator, a code enforcement 17 officer, a human services worker, a public health worker, a child. 18 representative, a healthcare worker, a reproductive health care. 19 services worker, an officer or agent of the State Bureau of Animal 20 Protection, an animal control officer, an office of the respondent parents 21 counsel, staff member or contractor, a judge, a peace officer, a prosecutor, 22 a public defender, or a public safety worker. 23. 5 Quetzales, Reproductive Healthcare Services Worker, means 24 a patient who relocated TO Colorado, provider, or employee of 25 an organization that provides or assists individuals in accessing 26 a legally protected healthcare activity, as defined in Section 2712-30-120, 1, D. 19, 188. 1 Section 16. In Colorado Revised Statutes, add 18-13-133 as two follows, 318-13-133. Prohibition on prosecuting healthcare providers for patient ingests abortifacient in another state. A licensed five healthcare provider shall not be prosecuted, investigated, or six subjected to any penalty if the healthcare provider prescribes seven an abortifacient to a patient and the patient ingests the eight abortifacient in another state so long as the abortifacient was nine prescribed or administered consistent with accepted standards 10 of practice under Colorado law and did not otherwise violate 11 Colorado law. 12 Section 17. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 24-30-2102, amend 13, 1, and add, 1.5, as follows, 1424-30-2102. Legislative Declaration. 1. The General Assembly 15 hereby finds and declares that a person attempting to escape from actual 16 or threatened domestic violence, a sexual offense, or stalking frequently. 17 moves to a new address in order to prevent an assailant or potential. 18 assailant from finding him or her the victim. This new address, however, 19 is only useful if an assailant or potential assailant does not discover it. 20 therefore, in order to help victims of domestic violence, a sexual offense, 21 or stalking, it is the intent of the General Assembly to establish an address 22 confidentiality program, whereby the confidentiality of a victim's address may 23rd be maintained through, among other things, the use of a substitute 24 address for purposes of public records and confidential mail forwarding. 25 Additionally, people involved in the provision of reproductive 26 health care are at a heightened risk of actual or threatened 27 violence, stalking, or other social harms. Dash 20, 188. 1, 1 1.5, therefore, in order to help victims of domestic 2 violence, a sexual offense, or stalking, and to assist and protect three individuals involved in the provision of reproductive health for care, IT is the intent of the General Assembly to establish an five address confidentiality program, whereby the confidentiality six of a victim's or an individual involved in the provision of seven reproductive health care's address may be maintained through, eight among other things, the use of a substitute. Address for purposes nine of public records and confidential mail forwarding. 10 Section 18. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 24-30-2103, Amend 11, 2, and add, 9.5, as follows, 1224-30-2103. Definitions. As used in this Part 21, unless the 13 context otherwise requires, 14, 2, 
Address Confidentiality Program, or Program, means the 15 program created under this Part 21 in the Department to protect the 16 confidentiality of the actual address of a relocated protected. 17 Healthcare Worker, or a relocated victim of domestic violence, a. 18 Sexual Offense, or Stalking. 19, 9.5. Protected healthcare worker means a 20 reproductive healthcare provider, or an employee, volunteer, 21 patient, or immediate family member of a reproductive 22 healthcare provider, engaged in the provision, facilitation, or 23 promotion of a legally protected healthcare activity, AS 24 defined in section 12-30-120, 1, D. 25 section 19. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 24-30-2104, Amend 26, 1, Introductory Portion and, 4, as follows, 2724-30-2104. Address Confidentiality Program, Creation. Dash 21, 188. One substitute address, uses, service by mail, application assistance, two centers. One, there is hereby created the address confidentiality program three in the department to protect the confidentiality of the actual address of a four relocated protected healthcare worker or a relocated victim of five domestic violence, a sexual offense, or stalking and to prevent the six victims assailants or potential assailants from finding the victim through seven public records. Under the program, the executive director or his or her eight the executive director's designee shall, nine, four, the executive director or his or her the executive ten director's designee may designate as an application assistant any person eleven who, twelve, a, provides counseling, referral, or other services to victims of thirteen domestic violence, a sexual offense, or stalking, and if applicable, fourteen, b, completes any training and registration process required by fifteen the executive director or his or her. The executive director's designee, 16 if applicable, and 17, c, provides counseling, referrals, or other services to 18 individuals accessing a legally protected healthcare activity, 19 as defined in section 12-30-120, 1, d, if applicable. 20 section 20. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 24-30-2105, amend 21, 3, introductory portion, 3, b, 3, c, introductory portion, 3, H, and 22, 3, K, and add, 3, L, as follows, 2324-30-2105. Filing and certification of applications, 24 authorization card. 3, the application shall must be on a form 25 prescribed by the executive director or his or her the executive 26 director's designee and shall must contain all of the following, 27, B, a statement by the applicant that the applicant is a victim of. Dash 22, 188. 1. Domestic violence, a sexual offense, or stalking and that the applicant 2. Fears for his or her the applicant's safety, if applicable, 3. C. Evidence that the applicant is a victim of domestic violence, for a sexual offense, or stalking, if applicable. This evidence may include 5. Any of the following, 6. 7. H. The actual address that the applicant requests not to be 8. Disclosed by the executive director or his or her the executive 9. Director's designee that directly relates to the increased risk of domestic 10. Violence, a sexual offense, or stalking or increased risk of actual or 11 threatened violence, stalking, or other social harms due to the 12 provision of a legally protected healthcare activity, AS 13 defined in section. 12-30-120, 1, D, 14, K, a statement by the applicant, under penalty of perjury, that to 15 the best of the applicant's knowledge, the information contained in the 16 application is true, and 17, L, a statement by the applicant, under penalty of perjury. 18 that the applicant is a protected healthcare worker or 19 provides, refers, or assists patients in accessing a legally 20 protected healthcare activity, as defined in section 12-30-12021-1-D, if applicable. 22 section 21. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 24-31-101, Amend 23, 1, 16, and, 1, 17, and add, 1, I, 18 as follows, 2424-31-101. Powers and Duties of Attorney General. 1. The 25 Attorney General, 26, I, may independently initiate and bring civil and criminal actions 27 to enforce state laws, including actions brought pursuant to. Dash 23, 188. 1. 16, Part 7 of Article 12 of Title 38, and 2, 17, Section 38-12-904, 1b, and 3, 18, the Reproductive Health Equity ACT, Part 4 of 4 Article 6 of Title 25. 5 Section 22. 
in Colorado Revised Statutes, add Article 116 to 6 Title 24 as follows, 7 Article 116-8 Prohibition on Government Resources for 9 Out-of-State Investigation into Legally Protected Healthcare 10 Activity 1124-116-101. Prohibition on providing information or 12 expending government resources, legally protected health care 13 activity. A public agency, or employee, appointee, officer, official, 14 or any other person acting on behalf of a public agency, shall 15 not provide any information or expend or use time, money, 16 facilities, property, equipment, personnel, or other resources in 17 furtherance of any out-of state investigation or proceeding 18 seeking to impose civil or criminal liability or professional 19 sanction upon a person or entity for engaging in illegally. 20 protected healthcare activity, as defined in section 12-30-120. 21, 1, d. 2224-116-102. Prohibition on assisting another state, legally 23 protected healthcare activity. 1. A state agency or executive 24 department shall not provide information or data, including 25 patient medical records, patient level data, or related billing 26 information, or expend time, money, facilities, property, 27 equipment, personnel, or other resources for the purpose of. Dash 24, 188. 1. Assisting or furthering an investigation or proceeding initiated to IN or by another state that seeks to impose criminal or civil 3. Liability or professional sanction upon a person or entity for 4. Engaging in a legally protected healthcare activity, AS defined 5 IN section 12-30-120, 1, D. 6, 2, notwithstanding subsection, 1, of this section, and 7 agency or executive department may provide information or aid assistance in connection with an investigation or proceeding in 9 response to a written request from the subject of the 10 investigation or proceeding. 11, 3, this section does not apply to an investigation or 12 proceeding that would be subject to civil or criminal liability or 13 professional sanction under Colorado law if the action was 14 committed in Colorado. 15 section 23. In Colorado Revised Statutes, Amend 25-6-404 as 16 follows, 1725-6-404. Public Entity, Prohibited Actions. 1. A public entity 18 shall not. 19. A. Deny, restrict, interfere with, or discriminate against an. 20. Individuals fundamental right to use or refuse contraception or to 21. Continue a pregnancy and give birth or to have an abortion in the 22. Regulation or provision of benefits, facilities, services, or information, or 23. B. Deprive, through prosecution, punishment, or other means. And 24. Individual of the individual's right to act or refrain from acting during the 25. Individual's own pregnancy based on the potential, actual, or perceived 26. Impact on the pregnancy, the pregnancies, outcomes, or on the pregnant 27. Individual's health. Dash 25, 188. 1. C. Restrict any natural or legal person in performing, or 2. Prohibit any natural or legal person from providing, 3. Reproductive health care through the imposition of licensing, for permitting, certification, or similar legislative or regulatory 5. Requirements that apply solely to providers of reproductive 6. Health care, or 7. D. Prosecute or otherwise criminally sanction any eight natural or legal person for providing, assisting in the provision nine of, arranging for, or otherwise assisting. A person in accessing 10 reproductive health care performed within the scope of 11 applicable professional licensure and certification 12 requirements. 13 Section 24. In Colorado Revised Statutes, add 25-6-407 as 14 follows, 1525-6-407. Enforcement. The venue to enforce an action 16 pursuant to the provisions of this Part 4 is in the Denver District 17 Court. 18 Section 25. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 25-37-103, add 19, 1, e, as follows. 2025-37-103. Healthcare contracts, required provisions. 21 permissible provision. 1, e, i, the summary disclosure form 22 required by subsection, 1, a, of this section must include a 23 disclosure that a person or entity shall not terminate a 24 healthcare contract with a healthcare provider solely for 25 the provision of, or assistance in the provision of, a legally 26 protected healthcare activity, as defined in section 12-30-12027, 1, d. Dash 26, 188. 1, 2, a person or entity that is a religious organization is to not subject to the requirements of this subsection, 1, e if the three provision of, or assistance in the provision of, a legally for protected health care activity, as defined in section 12-30-125, 1, 
1. D. Conflicts with the religious organizations bona fide 6 religious beliefs and practices. 7. Section 26. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 29-20-104, Amend 8, 1, G, as follows, 929-20-104. Powers of Local Governments, Definition. 10, 1, except as expressly provided in Section 29-20-104.5, the power and 11 authority granted by this section does not limit any power or authority 12 presently exercised or previously granted. Each local government within 13 its respective jurisdiction has the authority to plan for and regulate the use 14 of land by, 15, g, i, regulating the use of land on the basis of the impact of the 16 use on the community or surrounding areas. 17, 2, a, the General Assembly finds and declares that. 18 access to outpatient clinical facilities providing reproductive and 19 health care, as defined in section 25-6-402, 4, is a matter of 20 statewide concern and that, for purposes of zoning and other 21 land use planning, such facilities fall within the meaning of a 22 medical office use, a medical clinic use, a healthcare use, and 23 other facilities that provide outpatient healthcare services. 24, b, for the purposes of zoning and other land use 25 planning, Every local government that has adopted or adopts 26A zoning ordinance shall recognize the provision of outpatient 27 reproductive health care, as defined in section 25-6-402, 4, as a dash 27, 188. One permitted use in any zone in which the provision of general 2 outpatient health care is recognized as a permitted use. 3. C. Nothing in this subsection, 1. G. 2. Restricts or 4. Supersedes the authority of a local government to enact 5. Uniform zoning ordinances and other land use regulations that 6. Comply with this subsection, 1. G. 2. 7. Section 27. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 30-28-115, add 8, 1.5, as follows, 930-28-115. Public welfare to be promoted, legislative 10 declaration, construction. 1.5, a. The General Assembly finds in 11 declares that access to outpatient clinical facilities providing 12 reproductive health care, AS defined in Section 25-6-402, for ISA 13 matter of statewide concern and that, for purposes of zoning 14 and other land use planning, such facilities fall within the 15 meaning of a medical office use, a medical clinic use, A16 healthcare use, and other facilities that provide outpatient 17 healthcare services. 18. B. For the purposes of zoning and other land use. 19. Planning. Every local government that has adopted or adopts 20A zoning ordinance shall recognize the provision of outpatient 21 reproductive health care, as defined in Section 25-6-402, 4, as a 22 permitted use in any zone in which the provision of general 23 outpatient health care is recognized as a permitted use. 24. C. Nothing in this subsection, 1.5 restricts or supersedes 25 the authority of a local government to enact uniform zoning 26 ordinances and other land use regulations that comply with 27 this subsection, 1.5-28-188. 1 section 28. Safety clause. The General Assembly hereby finds. 2 determines and declares that this act is necessary for the immediate. 3 preservation of the public peace, health, or safety. Dash 29, 188. Is there any further discussion on Senate Bill? I've got Representative Garcia, and then I'll have you, Representative Wilson. Representative Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, I want to start with a poem I wrote last night. In a world where gender can be fluid and identities often put upon, there are those who need support and care to align their true selves that's only fair. So important it is to have protections in place for gender-affirming care, a right to embrace, to live authentically, to thrive and to be, their true selves free from unnecessary debris. With access to care, people can find peace their gender affirmed, their burdens released, protections ensure that the care they need is available and accessible, a life-changing seed. No one should be, not be denied the chance to be true, to live their lives as they want to do. Gender-affirming care is a right we must defend so that every person can thrive until their very end. 
Let us stand together and show our support to protect and advocate. We must not fall short. Gender affirmation care is a human right and we'll keep fighting until it's in sight. Members, abortion care and gender affirming care are essential medical services that must be protected. These services provide crucial health care for individuals who are seeking to take control of their own bodies to live their authentic lives. However, the access to these services is under threat by political agendas and discrimination. It is imperative that we recognize the importance of these services and protect every individual's right to them. The Dobbs decision may have revoked Roe, but it did not revoke the 14th Amendment and our right to privacy. We respect everyone's right to privacy when it comes to mental health, PTSD treatment, surgeries, the need for Viagra, and we must protect the right to private decision-making when it comes to all reproductive health care, including abortion care services and gender-affirming care. Abortion care is an essential medical service that allows individuals to control their reproductive health. As we heard, this service has been under attack in recent years as various states have passed laws that make it increasingly difficult for women to access the care they need. Restrictions such as mandatory waiting periods, forced ultrasounds, restricting a person's free movement between states, and targeted regulation of abortion providers have made it challenging for people to receive proper medical care. These restrictions not only infringe upon an individual's reproductive rights, but they also put their health at risk. Without safe and legal access to abortion care, people are forced to seek out dangerous and potentially deadly alternatives. Colorado, we can make sure that people have access to safe, legal reproductive care that includes gender affirming care, and we must. Gender affirming care is a crucial aspect of healthcare. It refers to the medical procedure and treatments that transgender and gender nonconforming individuals undergo to align their physical bodies with their gender identities. Transgender individuals deserve to live a life where their internal and external identities match just as we cisgender individuals do. It is basic human dignity. We are here to improve the quality of life for Coloradans. I will say that again. We are here to improve the quality of life for Coloradans, not to make people's lives harder. And gender affirming care improves the quality of life for transgender individuals Gender affirming care does nothing to those who are cisgender and should not be restricted by those who are not even impacted. We have an obligation here as representatives to represent those who need support, those who need protection, those who need access. By voting yes on this bill, we will be living what we are here to do, and I urge a yes vote. Thank you. Representative Winner. I'm sorry, Representative Wilson. And if you'd like to mispronounce my last name, we can call it even. I mean, it was, it was just an offer for Representative Wilson. <laughs> I, I, I've heard so many pronunciations, I don't know that anybody knows how to pronounce that. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to offer uh, amendment, or I, mo I move amendment 021 and ask that it be displayed. Thank you, Representative. We'll get that displayed. Looks like it has been moved and is properly before us. Please proceed. Thank you. This is just another clarification amendment. Uh, the change in the, in the Senate was under section 10.16.121 requiring contract provisions in, contact, in contracts between carriers and providers. Uh, line 26, means refusing or 
Adverse action means refusing or failing to pay a provider or otherwise covered service as defined in the applicable health benefit plan. This amendment would just <clears throat> would just add that they, they can still withhold or refuse to pay the provider under other lawful reasons, just not the reasons uh, amended by the Senate. So it keeps that clarification that we're not lumping one group into every avenue of a contract or a, a provider plan. So I would ask for a yes vote on this amendment. Further discussion on the amendment? Representative Froelich. Thank you, ask for a no vote. Further discussion on Amendment L-21. Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L-21 to Senate Bill 188. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. no. The noes have it. The amendment is lost. To the bill. Representative Winner. And then we're going to go to Representative Kip. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move Amendment L-036 and ask that it properly be displayed. So moved, we'll get it displayed. Looks like it's properly before us. Please proceed. Thank you. This amendment was born out of the heart of rural Colorado and our beliefs. The exemption that has been put in the bill only applies to religious organizations, but does not speak to or cover a private citizen or a business's right to practice their faith or consciousness without conflict or restrictions to their freedom to act in accordance with their faith. There are some people based by their faith, that shouldn't be forced to do any of these things. It's the freedom to practice your religion. So I'd ask you to think about this, and I ask for a yes on this amendment. Thank you. Further discussion, Representative Tatone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, using uh, a religious belief to break a law is really not something we're looking to do here. Uh, so we ask for a no vote. Further discussion on Amendment L-36. Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L-36. All those in favor say aye. A division has been called. The question is the adoption of Amendment L-36. A division has been requested. All those in the chamber not entitled to vote, please be seated. All those in favor of Amendment L-36 to Senate Bill 188, please stand and remain standing or raise your hand and keep it raised until the count has been taken. You may be seated. 
All those opposed, please stand and remain standing in one place until the count has been taken. You may be seated. Amendment L36 is lost. To the bill, Representative Kipp. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It is an honor to serve with you. It is an honor to serve with you, Representative Kipp. Fort Collins, there we go. Hey, um, everybody, you know, I really appreciate everybody's engagement on this debate today, but I really wanted to come down because I have people in my community, and whether or not you are aware of it, you probably have people in your community who are transgender, or perhaps they're suffering from something called dysphoria, where you just don't feel that you are in the right body, right? This is something that is real. It is something that is intense for people who suffer from it. This is why we talk about preserving people's lives by ensuring that they have access to gender affirming care. I, my first year in the legislature, I was on the public health committee and we had a bill which came forward where we heard from so many people who had suffered from dysphoria and were basically driven nearly to suicide because of their not feeling like they were in the right place and in the right body. So I just want to let people know these are strongly held convictions. And by doing this, by passing this bill, we will be helping to save people's lives, not just Coloradans, but people from across our country. Because while people across, states across our country are banning gender affirming care in their own states, then people end up going to states where these things are still legal. And we need to make sure that that is the case here in Colorado. We need to make sure that people have a place to go to receive the medical care they need. And I hear these arguments about, well, local control and um, you know, religious freedom, et cetera. Well, and I, I just want to take you back to like the 1960s, right? Where people felt like maybe women shouldn't have rights to do whatever. And people felt that people who were um, had different colors of skin shouldn't have the right to do various things. And would we think that was okay today? I, I think not. And I really think that you have to think about it in that context because what we're talking about, right, when people said women's rights or human's rights, transgender rights, transgender people are also human and they should have rights and they should have right to appropriate medically appropriate health care. So I, I just wanted to um, let you know that because I know that the people who are in my community, they're having a trans day of visibility up in Fort Collins today. And they are up there because they still, even in the fourth largest city in Colorado, are feeling persecuted. And it's not okay that we have so many people who are afraid to be their authentic selves and so many people who are persecuted for being who they are. So that's one of the reasons I just would ask you for your yes vote today on this truly important legislation because people have the right to be who they are and to receive medically appropriate care. So thank you for hearing me out. Representative Holtorf and then I have Representative Soper. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to my colleague from Larimer County for speaking for her district. 
Um, I will tell you that this particular bill has very troubling components. The components are the components that address youth. If you want to transition as an adult, that's something we understand. But I'm going to talk about something that speaks to youth, 12, 13, 14, 15-year-old children. We'll call them children, but we'll allow them to make adult decisions under this legislation and other legislation that's been brought forth before this chamber. Now at the age of 12, you can do so many things. At the age of 12, 13, and 14, you are so mature. You know what you want. You know who you are. You know what you want to be, perhaps. Or maybe you don't. But you're given the autonomy under the bill sponsors, this autonomy, this bodily autonomy to do what you want, allegedly. And the rights are being written in Colorado Revised Statutes. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a danger to our youth. Now I'm going to explain why. There are many debates all across the United States, floor debates in House and Senate chambers in 2023. One of these debates, which I bring forth, is to protect children from dangerous cross-sex hormones and experimental surgeries. Much of this is going on and will go on. I also have a problem as Big Pharma promotes this industry because they make money. Now, this isn't the bill that uh, addresses the insurance companies having to cover all this. That one we'll discuss later. To empower Big Pharma to profiteer off of this particular industry. But there are whistleblowers and there are reports, alarming reports coming out of many places across this country from hospitals. Specifically, in some cases, university transgender centers. Whistleblowers are saying, wait a minute, things are going wrong. Specifically with the youth and these procedures. So much so that employees of these centers are speaking out because they see what they see. And mind you, these medical employees have volunteered to work in these centers, believing that this is the right thing to do. But then they realize some very bad things are happening to our youth. So I'm going to continue to talk about this. There is a movement, and in some cases, it, it's happening right here in Colorado, that mischaracterizes the surgeries and the dangers of these hormones as if they're all FDA approved and this is all sound science and we do this all the time and nobody is at risk. When in fact, that is why we have this problem in this country. <clears throat> there are many bills, granted as the bill sponsors outlined across this country and other members of this cha chamber of outline that, yes, have listed many states that are saying no. This goes too far. Are all those states in the union wrong? The answer is no.
So what legislation across this state and what I'm advocating that needs to be amended in this bill is that youth should not have the ability at 12, 13, 14, 15 to go down this dangerous path that involves irreversible surgeries. against minors. These procedures against minors that don't even know what they want to do when they grow up or who they want to be. Now we talk about suicide rates and yes in this community there are a lot of suicide rates. There's a mental conundrum that has to be wrestled with every day. And if you do take this journey as a youth that you can never take back, many people decide that they can't live with themselves. And then they make a very irreversible decision, which is taking their life. That's how serious this is. This is very serious. <clears throat> In my humble opinion, there should be a prohibition from these sex transition procedures to minors, particularly the ones that are irreversible operative procedures that are done by surgeons. <clears throat> there is such a complicated time in life, there needs to be safeguards. If there are dis verifiable disorders, if there are complications with sex development that require medical attention, there needs to be a distinction. But the youth should be protected. Now, when they become the age of majority, that's different. We understand that. We earlier debated about whether a person should be able to purchase a firearm at a certain age, and we said, oh, no, you've got to be 21. You certainly can't have that level of responsibility at 18 or 19 or 20. But, boy, are we assigning a lot of responsibility under this legislation for decisions that could be just as devastating and could take a life, and perhaps the life of that youth, their own by their own hand. My recommendation is we slow down. My recommendation is we let kids be kids and grow up as best they can, and when they're adults, they can make their decisions freely and have the things they need to take that journey. Children, barely of school age, are being subjected to questionable diagnoses of gender dysphoria. This happens as early as three to five years old, six, eight years old. And then there's the promotion of surgeries and the application of these cross-sex hormones that are very dangerous, life-altering, and could be permanent. Not to mention the behavioral health components of all of this. This medical treatment on children, some would consider cruel. It can lead to a lifetime of misery, pain, and difficult to treat mental illness throughout a person's lifetime. Particularly if the decision made, which can never be reversed, is the wrong decision. Now, I'm not saying that they would be wrong, but what if the decision is the wrong decision? I'll tell you a little story about my own family. My daughter, when she was in high school, and I've got many, had classmates, and they all said they were LGBTQ, and that's how they identified. It was a fad. Sophomore year of high school, junior year of high school, I'm going to tell my story so you all can hear it, so you understand. 
Five years later, and I knew all these kids, five years later, four of the five had families and children and were married. Hmm. Two men. Hmm. But what if under this legislation, what if under the, what the bill sponsors promote, they would have gone down this road of surgery and taken these sterilizing drugs. They could have never had children. Now I understand that my story doesn't apply to everyone. But this is a true story. And those children needed time to figure out who they were and what they wanted to become. We must face that reality. We must understand youth don't necessarily know what they want to become. Now, I would argue when you reach the age of major majority, you're an adult, it's your decision, absolutely. But being a teenager is a dangerous time, very confusing and difficult. And that journey needs to be protected, including protecting youth from themselves. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. It is wrong to assume everyone advocating for these surges and treatments is doing it for the children. In fact, providing pharmaceuticals and surgery for children suffering from gender confusion or dysphoria has become a very profitable industry for big pharma. And they know it. And in some cases, they're promoting this movement. The surgeries and cross-sex hormone drugs run in the hundreds of thousands of dollars oftentimes, and who's going to bear that cost? Is it the parents that don't even get to know until they see the medical bill that it's happening? Oh, wait, 189 will fix that when the insurance companies have to cover it. But, and I know it's to this bill, Mr. Chair, but who has to underwrite the health insurance? It's a different chair. Oh, Madam Chair. Well, you guys switched up on me. I hate it when that happens. <clears throat> Think about it. Who's got to pay the copay? As you push this legislation, is the state of Colorado going to bear this cost? Or the parent? Oh, the one that you want to box out and not let them know that this is going on in their own household within the, the youth that they have the custody and care of to take care of and provide for and make sure they're healthy and try to keep them happy as confused youth. And many of you have had those challenges, as I have, raising my kids. That can be a wild ride. But it certainly isn't fair to stick the parents with these expenses. Now, some people call this designer science. <clears throat> Scientifically and clinically dangerous. Is it being used to target confused children or vulnerable children? For profit? Well, I don't know. But I know we're going to underwrite it all with this legislation. That is a reality. That is an economic reality for people all across this nation based on the bill sponsor's own words. Will these children suffer from lifelong medical dependencies? Because if you do this, and I'm no scientist, but I believe you have to continue to take these pharmaceutical products for a period of time, not indefinitely, 
but for a period of time. And there are long-term effects of this as well. There's a lot of questions. Let's talk about this so-called sex reassignment surgery for girls and boys. And it's being done on teenagers. There are statistics that this demographic is 20 times more likely to die from suicide than the general population. Up to 98% of children who struggle with their sexual identity as a boy or a girl, according to this article, in their lives come to accept that biological identity as adult, in adulthood. And they can still live their lives however they choose. They can still love who they want to love and live who they want to live with. It's a free country still. The long-term effects of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones has been studied, but the long-term effects have not been extensively studied. It's already clear that they can lead to infertility, which may be an objective, but once you make that a part of your physiology based on your decisions, you can never get it back based on these surgeries. If you ever wanted to have children later in life, you can't do it. Other irreversible harmful effects must be dealt with for the youth and also the youth who have transitioned as they mature. That is real. There are many legislators across the country, both Senate chambers and House chambers, that are focusing on protecting children's health and safety. In this particular whistleblower center, a transgender center, I'm not going to mention which state, in the center of the United States, it's part of a children's hospital in this particular state, <clears throat> has reported revelations of neglect, malfeasance, and coercion that is forced so-called youth, confused youth, into transition services, including amputation and severely altering healthy body parts, which causes irreversible damage to the impacts of those children for the rest of their lives. Now, yesterday we talked about this bill, a different bill, that very much touches on this particular subject. being truthful and honest with people. Society does not allow minors to do many things. You can't purchase cigarettes. You can't go out and buy alcohol. In many places, you can't go out and get tattoos. You can't own firearms. The list goes on, and I won't, Madam Chair, I won't go over the whole list because I know other people want to get up here and have very important things to say. But are minors ready to make life-altering decisions? Question number one. I would say no to the bill sponsors. Absolutely no. Why should children be permitted to allow, be permitted to have these cross-sex hormones and surgeries without parents' knowledge? It's very troubling. Do parents get coerced by their own children in their troubled youth? That's another question. As a parent wants to openly support this child's journey, but is it the right journey? This brings tears to people's eyes. I call it tough love sometimes. Because maybe the things that the young people, the misguided people, 
that lack life experience and knowledge and understanding are not making the right decisions for themselves. Could that be possible? Just shake your heads, no, of course not. Those kids know everything. They know what they want and who they want to be and what they're going to be when they grow up. Well, maybe not when the suicide rate is this high. And we talk about mental health and behavioral health. These are real hard conversations to have, but this is a reality in this space. <clears throat> Our children deserve quality health care and protection. If they suffer from body dysphoria or gender dysphoria, other things like depression or anxiety, awkwardness of puberty, which are all real challenges, they deserve compassion and care, and they deserve for us to say, hold on a second, let's work through these challenges as a youth, and when you become an adult, then let's, if so desired, take that journey. But don't be the four out of five girls in my daughter's class based on these radical the radical legislation that we're promoting to promote these things in our youth that would lead them to a decision that could never be reversed, that they would regret their entire lives and may even take their life for that regrettable, permanent decision. For that reason, and many other reasons, we must stand up and stand out and speak for the lives of our children. The bill sponsors might say that these are fringe positions. They're not the sentiment of the country. They're not the sentiment of this community. But if not, why in over 40 states across the United States in state legislatures all across this country, and for many governors in many states, are they taking a stand to prevent the abuse of minors in so many states? Not only that, the rights of parents. They're standing up nationwide for the rights of parents who have a right and are demanding to protect their children from some of these radical movements and the agenda-driven medical movements. I say this out of great concern. I imagine the bill sponsors cannot understand where I come from. But I tell you, there are many, many Colorado citizens who want parents to be parents, who want to have the opportunity to work with and take care of their children, and want to make sure that with respect to this bill, that they can be a part of their youth's life, and their youth will not fall victim to what this bill promotes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Titone. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. And with you. Thanks. So um, I, heard, I heard a lot of things there, and there was just so many things, so many things. Um, I do want to uh, move a little closer to the mic. All right. This one's a little louder. Um, I, I do want to point out that I do have this, this information packet here if anybody wants to look at it. I did offer it earlier, and if, and if anybody does want to learn something, um, this would be a good opportunity to have something on paper you can look at and refer to to understand what's going on. I also have some other uh, things here that I read earlier. I don't know if anybody was listening to what I said earlier, but I did read all of the different things based on the facts and the science and the medical 
societies that say all of the things that are contrary to my colleague in Washington County. The view that uh, my colleague was really looking at is very narrow and it lacks any empathy whatsoever. I mean, just the phrases that these medical procedures are against kids, they're subjected to things, that's not at all what's going on. And the sad part is right now is that my colleague's not even here to listen to me debate what he just said. He's not even here to hear it. And that's really sad because I would like to take this opportunity to educate some people about some things. I said a lot of it earlier. There is a lot of misinformation out there. A lot. Trying to make trans people out to be the boogeyman here. And if you were listening to the tribute this morning, I don't know if a lot of people heard that because I didn't hear, I see a lot of people in here this morning when, I, when the tribute was read. But you'll, you would have heard in the tribute that trans people have existed since people existed. And in many cultures, it's actually a revered thing. But, you know, you have to be here to listen to, and, and learn some things if you want to get through this and actually understand what we're doing to our kids. We're not promoting what other states are doing. And all of these other states that are doing this, yes, they are in fact absolutely wrong. They're wrong. Since when does a legislature know more than medical organizations? 29 of them. 29 organizations say that gender-affirming care is care that needs to be done for kids that have gender dysphoria to make them better people and live a better life. Gender-affirming care is life-saving. And trans kids are loved and valued in their families who have parents who accept them for who they are. But with all this misinformation around... Parents have a kid who, who says that they're trans, and all of a sudden, oh my goodness, like, what, what are we going to do? We can't have you be that way. And, you know, I always wonder, I always wonder, this is something I've, I've contemplated for a very, very long time. If a kid comes out as LGBT or trans, there's, you know, a couple different outcomes that come out. Right? The parents are like, well, let, let's see what we can do to help you get the care that you need and understand this, because I don't understand it, and I want to understand it, and I want to be the best parent for you. And then there's some parents who are afraid, and they don't know anything, and they kind of freak out a little bit, and they're like, oh, I, I just don't know what to do, and, and, and it's, it's kind of that middle approach. And then there's some other families that say, absolutely not and you could get out of my house if you're gonna be that way. And there's a lot of kids that are like that. They end up being kicked out of their house because they won't be accepted. Now, I, back to my point about why I think this is, why is this happening? You know, I'm not a parent. I, I was a, uh, a parent of an exchange student for a while and we, we treated him like he was our own kid. And, you know, I can put myself into a situation through a lot of other people who I know who, who are parents who've had their kids grow up from, you know, infants to, to adulthood. That's part of them, right? This is, this is a child that you made. This was, this was a conception that, that created this child, and you want that child to be the best image that you have in your, in your mind of what that child can be. And I think to myself, what is, is, is there a point in time when someone says, oh, you identify as LGBT, 
and that's not how I expect you to be, so I have to reject you because I can't make a child who's not perfect the way I think they should be. It's just a thought that I have that I've been trying to contemplate to figure it out. But the fact is, is that gender-affirming care for youth, and you know, this bill doesn't just talk about youth. This bill talks about anybody, because you know what? There's a couple states out there that are trying to ban gender-affirming care for adults, too. So, okay, how do you justify that? You want to cut off at 18? No, states are not doing that. They're going beyond 18. They're going up to 26. Why is that a magic age that we should stop people from being trans? Why? That's not, there's no logic to that. There's no logic to that at all. Banning adults from doing what they want? Come on. I just heard my, my colleague from Washington County said it was all about youth. Okay, then why is it that some states are going farther than that? Because there's a, this, I don't know what it is. There's something going on about people and trans people. Why can't we exist? Why can't we just exist? But if we stop these kids from existing, then they can't grow up to be trans adults and they can't be uh, you know, part of society. That, is, that what we, is that what the goal is here? I don't know what it is. But the, when it comes to youth, as I explained and as I read about the science about puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones and all the things that were mentioned, I already explained that those are reversible. But nobody wants to listen to that, right? No, I just have an agenda to listen to the people that are telling me in my ear that this is bad, that we can't have this happen. What about the science? What about the studies? What about the 29 medical organizations that say this is acceptable? We don't like to listen to medical organizations because we're the government and we can do anything we want. Is that what it is? I'm just trying to figure this out. But I want you to think about why would somebody want to be trans, especially in this day and age? I mean, seriously. You know, I exist on Twitter, and, and I, I don't even have to post anything, and people are posting all sorts of garbage against me all the time. What did I do? I didn't do anything. I'm just existing here. Why, why, am, why am I have to be bullied by a bunch of people who I don't know who are anonymous screen names because they can? Think about it. Why would a kid want to be in school where they're going to be said, oh, well, you got to go to that bathroom down the hall way on the other side of school and you're going to miss your, 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 your schoolwork because you got to go all the way down there. You're going to get out of here. Why would you want to be that? Why would you want to be a trans person when governments are telling you you can't play sports, that you can't be yourself? Why would anybody want that? Nobody would want that. Ask yourself, do you want that? Put yourself into a trans kid's shoes for a minute. Just for one minute. Put yourself in those shoes and think about how you would feel. Nobody wants that. Gender-affirming care helps those kids be themselves. It does not do the opposite of what you're saying it does. It reduces suicide. And you know what? Think about being in that kid who, who's bullied all the time for, trying, for being different. And think about if you would want to live your life like that. You wouldn't. You wouldn't want to live a life that you're bullied all the time. Nobody wants a life like that. We're caring for trans kids here. And we're giving them a chance at life. The science explains itself. The medical organizations say this is right. Don't tell me it's not. 
Argue with the millions of doctors who say it is. But, you know, I, people want to use talking points because, you know, people consumed all that garbage information and, and they went along with it because it was said so many times over and over and over again, so it must be true, right? Well, gender-affirming care is life-saving. I'm going to say it over and over and over again. Trans kids are loved. It's life-saving care. I'm going to say it over and over again because I want you to get the idea out of your head that being trans is bad. I don't even want to repeat some of the other words that I've heard uh, in this well and in the committee room about trans people because I don't want to indulge that. But you know what? You all know what it is. You all know what people say. These are kids. And you know what? There's, there's been a lot of kids who have come in here before we had, the Democrats had control over the Senate trying to get that uh, Jude's Law bill passed. And there was a, a, a young trans woman who came in here. Her name is Jude. The law's named after her. And she came in here year after year after year after year. And, and they kept killing that bill and saying, no, you can't change your birth certificate. No, 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 no. And even one of the senators said, oh, you've grown up so much since you came in here for the first time. Get out of here. Don't say that to somebody. Come in here to defend your humanity and then try to give pleasantries? I don't think so. She is a smart young woman who goes to school she goes to high school, she plays on a sports team, and she's living her life to the fullest. Isn't that what we want for our kids? Or, or do we want to treat them, uh, you know, and, and bully them and tell them that they're not worth anything and you can't be yourself? Is that what we, is that what we want? Because taking away gender-affirming care, like all those other states are doing, that's what they're doing. I sent a letter to the governor of Utah when he vetoed that sports ban bill. And in his, in his letter, in his veto letter, he said there wasn't a problem. That there were four kids in the state of Utah that played sports. Four kids. And he said, I don't think it's right for the government to crack down on four kids. So he vetoed the bill. And then you know what happened? The legislature overrode the veto to tell those four kids you can't play sports. Four kids. This is what, this is what, we're, this is what we're doing in, in other states. We're passing laws to, to, to pick on four kids. The government, the big bully government. Big government. I hear a lot of stay out of my life government. I hear a lot of that. I hear a lot about freedom. I hear a lot about that. And I see you, Representative Sober. I'm going to give you some time to talk to you. I'm not going to take it all up. Why do we want bigger government? If you keep talking about shrinking government, then why would you want to take away people with the government? Take away the rights. That's what all these other states are doing. Taking away rights from LGBT people, taking away rights for drag performers, taking away rights from trans people to get their, their health care. That's not the government that I want to be in. I'm, in. I'm part of the government that says, I want you to be able to be your best self and have the freedom to be your best self. That's what I want. And that's what this bill is about. This bill is about people getting the care that they need. It's not the care that they want. It's not the care that they are coerced into. It's the care that they need. It's life-saving health care. And that's why you should vote yes 
on Senate Bill 188. And if you would like any more information, I'm going to leave it right here for you so you can have it. And I've got plenty more where that came from, and it's full of facts and data and organizations who do this stuff for a living for decades who know this stuff because that's what's important not our opinions about how we think we should be taking care of other people's kids it's about taking care of your own kids the way you want and that's exactly what this does it's all in consultation with parents and providers representative soper Thank you, Madam Chair, and it's an honor to serve with you. And with you. I, uh, I rise uh, really to look at technical aspects of the bill and move Amendment L026 and ask that it be displayed. L026 has been properly moved and displayed. Representative Soper, would you like to tell us about it? Thank you, Madam Chair. I actually move Amendment L027 as a substitute and ask that it be displayed. L027 has been moved as a substitute to L026 and has been properly displayed. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair. So in the bill, uh, it states a court shall not issue an ex parte order for wiretapping or eavesdropping to obtain any wire, oral, or electronic communication that relates to an investigation into a legally protected health care activity. What this amendment does is it creates an exemption that a court may issue an ex parte order for wiretapping or eavesdropping if the court finds there's a good faith basis for the order. And this is really important for our courts uh, when, uh, for example, there's an investigation into the business, but uh, it may not be directly uh, related to um, certainly what the business does on a legal basis, because obviously a court and um, prosecutors and law enforcement would not be looking into that. They would be looking into the criminal side. Uh, the reason for running this amendment uh, really dates to um, a major case that occurred uh, just outside of my district down in Montrose, uh, that was the Sunset Mesa atrocity. And that's where uh, something similar happened uh, in funeral homes where they were running a legitimate funeral home, but the problem was they were uh, selling bodies and giving the families pieces of concrete and uh, cat litter saying that uh, this was the cremated remains. So they were actually engaged in fraud and deception uh, most of those families called that the second death, or they sometimes described it as though their family member had died and then been murdered after death. And the ability to um, give law enforcement the tools to be able to fully investigate a business that's engaged in truly a criminal activity is important. We don't want to have wording there that uh, says that the banner on the front of the door uh, protects everything. And that's why I'm running this amendment, uh, to make sure that uh, you know, what, uh, the lessons we learned from the Sunset Mesa atrocity don't persist into other areas. And I'd ask for a yes vote. Representative Froelich. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to my colleague from Delta for this amendment. Um, you know, we have been very careful in crafting this to make sure that if there's any illegal activity, we are, this bill in no way protects illegal activity. In this particular case, these sections were all thoroughly vetted by our Attorney General, General and by legal experts. A, an example we heard in committee that's, uh, that is also relevant is if you wanna go after a provider for wage theft, excellent bill by the way, uh, excellent concept. Um, this bill does not protect you from from um, does not pr protect a provider that is engaging in any illegal activity. The whole point is legally protected health care, and um, so this really is both unnecessary but also muddies the water. I ask for a no vote. Is there any further discussion on L027? 
Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L027. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. The noes have it. The amendment is lost. Representative Soper, we are back to L026. Thank you, Madam Chair. So members, um, this bill states that, uh, or sorry, yeah, this bill, uh, the bill we're uh, talking about states that a police officer shall not knowingly arrest any person who engages in a legally protected uh, healthcare activity, and then um, legally protected healthcare activity is defined uh, within the bill, and it's one that keeps uh, being referred back to. Uh, this amendment protects police officers by specifying that the police officer must actually know the individual they are arresting engages in a legally protected health care activity. Uh, this will prevent police officers from violating the law if they arrest someone, an individual, for an offense that is unrelated to the person who is engaged in a legally protected health care activity. And I would ask for a yes vote. Representative Froelich. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, again, asking for a no vote. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Madam Chair. As you see, this uh, amendment is similar to my early one, earlier one, and it surprises me that we're saying that these are not bad amendments. We just don't want to clarify what <clears throat> certain situations. Um, the bill sponsors have mentioned that this is covered but we're not willing to put anything in there to just show that it's covered. So I ask for a yes vote on this. Is there any further discussion on L026? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L026. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. no. The noes have it, the amendment is lost. <laughs> Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think it was a little close there. I, uh, <laughs> I move amendment L024 and ask that it be properly displayed. L024 has been properly moved and displayed. Please tell us about it, Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move amendment L028 as a substitute amendment to L024 and ask that it be properly displayed. I may not get to speak again. L028 has been properly moved and displayed as a substitute to L024. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so Amendment 28 is one that's really a practical amendment about reimbursement costs. Uh, so there's a, a section in the bill that talks about, um, you know, if a pregnant uh, person uh, is incarcerated uh, currently, the way the bill is drafted, it would require uh, the facility, meaning the jail, uh, to uh, transport that person to have an abortion if they elect to do so. This amendment uh, requires that the community-based provider or organization reimburse um, the state for the transportation costs, or, or it could be the county if they're running the county jail. And this is just one to uh, be able to keep budgets whole and to predict uh, how much uh, the county jail is going to be spending. We'd ask for a yes vote. Representative Froelich. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you for the amendment, our colleague from Delta. Um, we, we aren't upsetting the apple cart in this bill. We are preserving what we have. And this is clarifying what, we, what already exists and the reimbursements that already exist. And um, so this is a, I'm asking for a no vote. Is there any further discussion on L028? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L028. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. The noes have it, the amendment is lost. <laughs> Representative Soper, back to L024. Thank you, Madam Chair. So once again on the topic of insurance and reimbursement rates, uh, what amendment L024 does is it uh, is clarifying a, uh, an, an area that's in the bill. It talks about um, a prohibited action does not include a rate increase for any reason other than the reason described in subsection one. 
And then it goes on to state that an insurer uh, that issues a medical malpractice insurance shall not take a prohibited action against an applicant for uh, the named insured under a medical malpractice policy in this state uh, solely uh, because the applicant or insured has provided a legally protected health care activity, so long as the health care provided was uh, constant with generally accepted standards and practices under Colorado law. The um, challenge uh, with what's actually in the bill, because it talks about uh, the reimbursement side, and if there's going to be a change in that, could that somehow be construed as taking a prohibited action? So what we want to make sure is that when rates change, uh, that that is not somehow construed as a prohibited action. Not asked for a yes vote. Thank you. Representative Titone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, th this isn't really necessary. It doesn't help uh, clarify anything in the bill. It's very clear in the bill what's um, going to be used as a uh, prohibited action. Um, and, and it's stated right there in, in a provision that prohib prohibits the carrier for taking an adverse action. So uh, we really don't think this is necessary. We ask for a no vote. Is there any further discussion? Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I appreciate my good colleague uh, describing that. I, I would just push back just a tiny bit here because as, as costs go up and you've already negotiated a certain rate, all of a sudden you could see a provider saying, hey, that now looks like I'm not getting the same reimbursement that I was, so that looks like the definition that we have here on the prohibited action that I just read you when I was last here speaking, so I won't read it again. But that's the type of um, scenario that we're wanting to protect against. And a yes vote, please. Is there any further discussion on L024? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L024. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. The noes have it. The amendment is lost. Representative Froelich. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Folks, I just want to bring, it, bring back uh, the discussion to, uh, to really what's at, both what's at stake here and what's happening in this bill. We have legally protected health care in Colorado. We already have gender affirming care and we've already established our rights to have an abortion and the full range of reproductive care. Other states, echoing the views that we've heard, unfortunately, today at the well that seek to ban access to what we have in Colorado are, are and have and have attempted to reach into other states and exercise their states draconian laws related to these two areas of health care. What we do in this bill is, as I said in my opening remarks, shield up. Our providers and our patients and their helpers deserve to be protected by us because we have already affirmed the right to this health care. All this bill does is unfortunately enumerate the many ways other states have tried to attack our fundamental rights in Colorado and the many ways in which we will not let it happen because we trust folks to make their own private medical decisions and we have established that in law. I understand if people, I'm trying to understand if people think that LGBTQ folks don't deserve access to gender affirming care or that women and pregnant people don't deserve to make their own private medical decisions. But that's not how we do it in Colorado. We've rejected those ideas over and over again at the ballot box and we've affirmed them in this chamber. So by opposing those very 
reproductive health care procedures and telling us that you think, because this one time at band camp, this person said that, you are saying that what they're doing in other states, that what you're doing in Alabama, congrats on your six-week ban, congrats on your gender-affirming care ban, we think that's okay in Colorado. And the fact of the matter is, we don't. Shields up, Colorado. Representative Bradley. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. I asked to move Amendment L037 and asked that it be displayed. L037 has been moved and displayed. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that to amend and re-engross bill page 12, line five, strike dysphoria and substitute dysphoria, except that gender affirming health care services does not include the use of a drug that has not been approved by the FDA for the treatment of gender dysphoria. 10 hours yesterday, 10 hours yesterday, I listened to the other side of the aisle talk about progesterone not being FDA approved to save a baby. But today, we'll use non-FDA approved drugs for gender affirming care. So which one is it, guys? What do I go back and tell my constituents that some of you will vote to use off-label puberty blockers, but you won't use off-label medicine to save a baby? We listen to the bill sponsors talking about driving across state lines to get the health care that they need, but now our Colorado women are going to have to drive across state lines to get progesterone treatment to save their baby in a period of 72 hours. So I want you guys to tell the voters which way it is, because this is hypocritical. Hypocritical to use off-label for certain things and hypocritical to not use off-label for other things. Things that also save lives. We talk about saving lives of kids. Let's talk about saving the lives of babies. That's important to me. So which way are we gonna vote? Dr. Susan Bradley pioneered gender affirming care in Canada. And before we talk about, oh, we can't talk about other countries, let's just be honest. Other countries are 20 years better than we are at medical treatment. My, my brother-in-law is a grade four glioblastoma and he's getting treatment in Germany because in the last 20 years, we've done nothing for brain tumors in this United States. In 1975, she founded the Child and Adolescent Gender Identity Clinic in Toronto, began administering puberty blockers to children in the early 2000s. An interview with the Daily Caller on March 11, 2023, the woman that pioneered gender affirming care in Canada said we were wrong. They're not as reversible as we always saw and they have longer term effects on kids growth and development, including the making them sterile and quite a number of things affecting their bone growth. We thought that it was relatively stay safe and endocrinologists said they're reversible and that we didn't have to worry about it. I had this skepticism in the back of my mind all the time that maybe we're actually colluding and not helping them. And I think that's proven correct in that once these kids get started at any age on puberty blockers, nearly all of them continue to want to go to cross sex hormones. These kids are not faring well with the current affirmative approach. I don't know that any kids actually could given the capacity of a 10 or 12 or even a 14 or 15 year old to understand the complexity of the decision that they're making on their long term sexual and life function. It just doesn't make sense. Blocking the sexual development of children is a highly authoritarian intervention. Children are asexual and so they can't understand the impact of impaired sexual function. We are roughly 10 years into this large scale experiment and already we have reports on issues with cognitive development, bone mineral density and fertility. All the up-to-date evidence shows that puberty blockers are neither safe nor reversible. This is someone that pioneered puberty blockers to children in 2000. Dr. K, because I cannot pronounce her last name, top expert on pediatric gender medicine in Finland, gave an interview. Systematic reviews represent the highest level of evidence analysis in evidence-based medicine. The three European countries that did these reviews independently came to the same conclusion. Due to their severe methodical limitations, studies cited in support of hormonal interventions for adolescents 
are of very low certainty. For health authorities in, those, in these countries, this meant that these studies were too unreliable to justify the risks and uncertainties of gender-affirming care. Sweden, Finland, and England have since placed severe restrictions on access to hormones. Although these countries now allow hormones in a very carefully selected cohort of patients who fulfill the criteria of the Dutch protocol, they do so against the findings of their own systematic reviews. This is because the systematic reviews found the Dutch study on which the Dutch protocol is based also provides very low certainty evidence. Dr. K was a major force behind the decision to reverse course in Finland. More recently, she testified before the Florida Medical Boards and supported their decision to restrict access to puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and surgeries for minors. No one comes to the subject with a hateful attitude. Questioners are, <clears throat> or skeptics of gender ideology are automatically labeled as bigoted and transphobic. I have been labeled all of those things by members in this community, and we talk about not saying hate crime. It works both ways. Upon what evidence, upon what rationale are states restricting or banning irreversible treatments for children and adolescents? It is not hate. It is up out of passionate concern for the long-term physical and mental health and welfare of young people who generally do not have the mental capacity or understanding to give informed consent to disfiguring and irreversible hormone and surgical procedures. To talk about my caucus like we are hateful and bigoted is very disrespectful. Representative Bradley, I'm not hearing anyone talk about a caucus. The... <laughs> Recess. The House will be in a brief recess. The House will come back to order. Thank Representative you, Bradley. As a mom of four children, I would never not love my children for whatever they want to be. I don't think it's right to label people that question this any different. This is not out of hate. This is from a medical background, wondering if everyone's okay to look themselves in the mirror, if long-term health effects happen and children continue to die because what we have passed is legislation. That is my concern as a parent. My concern as a parent that many countries have banned these hormones because of lack of studies of long-term effects on children under the age of 18. We in this building have said certain times kids are available to make mental health decisions and decisions about their bodies, and then we turn right around and say in other situations they're not. Going back to the amendment, 10 hours yesterday, again, of testimony about off-label medicines not being safe, and this bill you expect us to vote on something that is used as off-label and what a lot of, I have data too, because y'all know that I don't like to come up here without data and statistics that say these are not safe, they have not been studied long-term, and we don't know the long-term health consequences. So you either, you either stay on the same bullet points or you divert, and I think the people of Colorado will understand that. I will tell you, that the people in Nashville will beg to disagree. Thank you. Is there 
Representative Froelich. Representative Tatone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this amendment would force thousands of Coloradans to detransition. That's what this would do. This, this amendment, and I understand that, you know, the conversation we had yesterday, but um, I'm not going to get into FDA approval stuff, but that's what, this, that's what this amendment would do. This would force people to not be able to be trans because they wouldn't get the drugs they need. Do you want to think about what that would do to people? Because that would have devastating effects. I asked for a no vote. Is there any further discussion on L, Representative DeGraff? Thank you, Madam Chair. This is uh, it's an interesting day. I think that's the uh, I think that's the height of irony right there. We spent a day talking about how horrible off-label drugs are that have been used for over 50 years in humans, in humans, over 50 years in humans, to sustain pregnancy, to prevent abortion, 50 years. And now we've got a relatively new procedure with admittedly un-FDA approved medication that we know has some serious, pretty, can have some pretty serious long-term effects, can have some pretty serious short-term effects. I mean, one thing this gender-affirming care doesn't do is help kids affirm the gender that they were born with. That's, that's, that's verboten right there. Can't talk about that. But after the surgeries, after it's irreversible, then they can go to counseling and help them to be comfortable in the new bodies that they have. But that's not to the amendment. The amendment is speaking directly to, it is speaking directly in agreement, in agreement with something that you put on statute almost, I mean, you're working towards it, putting it on statute that women do not have the choice of their bodies in conjunction with their health care provider to take progesterone to halt the process of abortion, which is what it's been used for for decades. And now we have this brand new one, and it's okay. The, the irony of this is... It's just really beyond words. It's, it's the result of, it's, it's really the result of rushing through an ideological screed to try to put it all in, in, in law quickly without consultation. These drugs remain off-label they remain unapproved. They remain non fully studied, which means that everybody that's on them is an experiment. I think we have some sort of I think we have some sort of rules against experimenting on people. Pretty sure. Pretty sure there's rules about experimenting on people. Are they getting the full, are they getting the full benefit to say that these, these drugs are not FDA approved for what they're, what they're told? Are they, are they told that? Are they told of the serious reper repercussions? Are the 12-year-olds told? Anybody? Are they told? Does a 12-year-old get a full briefing on what's going to happen, what's not going to happen, what the lifelong impacts are going to be? Suddenly, nobody cares. Suddenly, nobody cares that they're not FDA approved for what they're being used for in one of Colorado's 
only growth industries for which we're encouraging all kinds of people to come. And we're putting all kinds of restrictions. We're putting all sorts of things in place to protect this growth industry. This is a profit center, no joke. And the more, the more states restrict it, you bet. This, this is going to be profitable for Colorado. And the campaign donations that will come out of this business, oh, but these drugs, these chemicals, synthetic or natural, I guess they're, whether they're synthetic or natural, doesn't, not really sure, but these are not FDA approved for the purpose, which means we're promoting an experiment, but it's for good intentions. It's all for good intentions. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. This is the road to hell for a lot of people, and we don't care. Collective we. Not me, I care. The collective we doesn't care. And I've been told all day long that I don't Representative care. Representative DeGraff, please don't tell members what they do or do not care about. You are welcome to share what you care about here. Uh, well, thank you, Madam Chair. I thought we were working on a different set of rules because I was told I, I, po I oppose rights that I don't care for trans kids, uh, that, that I'm not compassionate. I've been told those things all morning. I've been just kind of taking notes on them, so I thought maybe we were working under a set, different set of rules. But you're right. You're right. The, uh, the rules that should be applied should be applied equally. So I just wanted to state that the irony is just so rich. Experimenting on children, that's the majority party. I would recommend a yes on this vote, on this bill, and maybe amendment, excuse me, an I, yes, whatever, on this amendment, and stop experimenting on children. If we need to put a, if we need to put a clause in there that you can grandfather people that have already started down this path, fine. If you want to put it in, if you want to put a, if you want to put something in there for adults, fine. But take it out from yesterday. Otherwise, progesterone is going to be only in this in this state for something that it's not even authorized for. There, there are there are much better words than hypocrisy and irony, but I, I think maybe we ought to stick with those. Representative Holtorf. Representative Bradley. Thank you, Ms. Chair. Madam Chair, sorry. <laughs> Going back to the amendment, talking about drug treatment for the, the treatment, drug for the treatment of gender dysphoria, if the drug has not been approved by the FDA. I just want to go back because we know that countries like Europe and other countries around the world are 20 years in front of us as far as technology and treatments for different things. So Europe summary, during 2019-2020, lack of research and doubts about existing protocols led health authorities in Finland, Sweden, and the UK to conduct systematic reviews of evidence for the benefits and risks of hormonal interventions. Systematic reviews represent the highest level of evidence analysis in evidence-based medicine. The three European countries that did these reviews independently came to the same conclusion. Due to their severe Methodical, methodical limitations, studies cite in support of hormonal interventions for adolescents are of very low certainty. For health authorities in these countries, this meant that the studies were too unreliable to justify the risks and uncertainties of gender-affirming care. Sweden, Finland, and England have since placed severe restrictions on access to hormones. Finland's Council for Choices in Healthcare recognizes medical transition for minors as an experimental practice. In Sweden, LGBTQ plus rights in Sweden are regarded as some as the, of the most progressive in Europe and in the world. For decades, Sweden has been one of the most progressive nations on transgender health care. In 1972, Sweden became the first country in the world to allow transgender people to change their legal gender following sex reassignment surgery. In 2013, legislation passed allowing legal gender changes without hormone replacement therapy and sex reassignment surgery. 
In 2015, the Swedish health authority stated that puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones were safe. In 2021 and 2022, Sweden started restricting, restricting gender-affirming hormone therapy for minors, now allowing it in only very rare cases. Swedish hospitals halted the use of puberty blockers in five of its six clinics for minors with gender dysphoria. The sixth clinic only uses puberty blockers in, six, in clinical trials. Sweden's National Board of Health and Welfare explained that the reason behind the rollback is that little is known about the effects of these treatments over the long term, and the risks outweigh the benefits currently. A Swedish pediatric um, endocrinologist recently told the country's public broadcaster that the procedure teenagers with gender dysphoria go through was chemical castration. Part of what sparked the change in Sweden's approach are the increasing number of regretters that are returning to the gender clinics in great crisis. The plight of the regretters deeply affected the staff who made the original diagnosis and treatment decisions. A common realization of the medical pre professionals has become there's an awful lot we just don't know. One of the female Swedish regretters who had a few years previously gone through the cycle of puberty blockers, testosterone mastectomy, said, there's so little support for all of this. At the heart of it, the healthcare system is the one responsible. The healthcare system. They're supposed to provide a correct diagnosis. They're supposed to be able to say, you're getting this treatment because we know it will make you feel better. My generation of mainly girls, many young girls, who are just a bit different, who stand out from the typical female role, were one giant experiment. We were guinea pigs, something that there's no science to back up. Where in the medical field do you do that? Where do we gamble with people's lives like this? And we're talking about children. In December 2022, Sweden also limited mastectomies for teenage girls wanting to transition to a research setting citing the need for caution. The country now emphasizes psychotherapy for minors with gender dysphoria. Now medical professionals question a young person's self-assessment of gender dysphoria. The assessment model has shifted from an unquestioning affirmation of a minor self-diagnosis to an in-depth comprehensive critical examination of a patient's mental and physical health. Sweden, like many other Western countries, has in recent years seen a dramatically sharp rise in diagnoses of gender dysphoria, particularly among teen girls. The trend is particularly visible among 13 to 17 year old girls with an increase of 1,500%. Where else do we see things like that? 1,500%. Finland, the first Western country to conduct a systematic review of the evidence for youth gender transition. Summary report published May 15, 2019. I just wanna be clear, systematic reviews. We talked about random control trials yesterday. We can't do random control trials in this group of people either. We have to look at evidence-based medicine. In June 2020, Finland began de-emphasizing medical treatment for children with gender dysphoria and recommend prioritized psychotherapy instead. Finland did not ban puberty blockers outright, but they said they should be prescribed on a case-by-case -case basis after careful consideration. Surgical treatments are not part of the treatment methods for dysphoria caused by gender-related conflicts in minors, said Finland's Council for Choices in Healthcare, which issues recommendations on public health care. The council also said more information is needed about the effects of different treatment methods on the mental well-being, social capacity, and quality of life of children and youth, as well as on the disadvantages of procedures and on people who regret them. We're leaving a whole class of people out. The Finnish guidelines warn of the uncertainty of providing any irreversible gender-affirming interventions for those 25 and under due to the lack of neurological maturity. And we ask about the age of 26. Most researchers and scientists see that at the age of 26, the brain is fully developed. So that's where the magic number comes from. The guidelines raise the concern that puberty blockers may negatively impact brain maturity, impairing a young person's ability to provide informed consent. But I don't know that we care about that. The Finnish guidelines also reflect the growing international concern about the unexplained sharp rise in adolescence presenting with gender dysphoria, which is occurring in increasingly complex developmental and mental health contexts, and often without a childhood history of gender-related distress. United Kingdom. In December 2020, the UK High Court in London effectively suspended prescribing puberty blockers for children 15 and under and recommended that teens ages 16 to 18 get court approval before going on hormones. 
The case was brought by Kira Bell, who argued the UK's only youth gender identity clinic should have pushed back more when she expressed her desire to male, to transition to male as a teen and had surgery to remove her breasts. In April 2021, before the, UK's court, the UK court's initial decision in favor of Bell was overturned, the UK's Health Advisory Board, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence found that the evidence for prescribing puberty blockers to minors with gender dysphoria was very low and studies of the treatment were small and subject to bias and confounding. The evidence of clinical effectiveness and safety of gender-affirming hormones was also of very low quality. Any potential benefits of gender-affirming hormones must be weighed against the largely unknown long-term safety profile of these treatments in children and adolescents with gender dysphoria. In September 2021, the UK High Court's decision was overturned. Nonetheless, the National Health Service is curtailing the use of hormone drugs for those under 18 years of age. In the spring of 2023, the UK's National Health Services will shut down its controversial child transgender clinic. This after a damning report found it was not safe for children. The Gender Identity Service at Tavistock and Portman NHS Foundation Trust will be replaced by regional centers at existing children's hospitals, which will provide more holistic care with strong links to mental health services. The closing of Tavistock comes in response to an ongoing review led by senior pediatrician Dr. Hillary Cass, who warned the gender clinic was not safe or a viable long-term option. She found other mental health issues were overshadowed in favor of gender identity issues when children were referred to gender identity development service. The report led to the clinic's closure, also worried that there is a lack of knowledge about the impact that puberty blocking has on maturing bodies, and we're asking that it to be used off-label. In other words, whereas the Biden administration claims these interventions are uncontroversial, the report makes clear that they are entirely experimental. Are you, you guys ready to pass laws on experiments on children? A further concern is that adolescent sex hormone surges may trigger the opening of a critical period for an experience-dependent rewiring of neural circuits underlying executive function which is a maturing part of the brain. It might short circuit that. We're, we're okay with that? <laughs> if this is the case, brain maturation may be temporarily or permanently disrupted by puberty blockers, which could have significant impact on the ability to make complex risk-laden decisions as well as possible long-term neuropsychological consequences. To date, there has been very limited research, very limited, on the short, medium, or long-term impact of puberty blockers on neurocognitive development. Got another one for you, France. In France, the country's National Academy of Medicine warned medical professionals in a March 25th, 2022 press release that the spike in young people saying they want to medically transition genders may be due to social contagion and urge medical personnel to approach this issue with extreme caution. Some experts excerpts from this press release. Whatever the mechanism involved in adolescence, excessive engagement with social media, greater social acceptability, or influenced by those in one social circle, the epidemic-like phenomenon manifests itself in the emergence of cases or even clusters of cases in the adolescent's immediate surroundings. Greater medical caution must be taken in children and adolescents given the vulnerability particularly psychological, of this population and the many undesirable effects and even serious complications that be, can be caused by some of the ther therapies available. If France allows the use of puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones with parental authorization and no age limitations, the greatest caution is needed in their use, taking into account the side effects such as the impact on growth, bone weakening, risk of sterility, emotional and intellectual consequences, and for girls, menopause-like symptoms. When medical care is provided for this reason, it is essential to ensure medical and psychological support, first for the affected children and adolescents, but also for their parents, especially since there is no test to distinguish between persisting gender dysphoria and transient adolescent dysphoria. Moreover, the risk of overdiagnosis is real and evidenced by the growing number of young adults wishing to detransition. It is therefore appropriate to extend the phase of psychological care as much as possible. I just read five different countries that have banned puberty blockers for under the age of 18. They have been doing this longer than us. Why is the U.S. determined 
to pave our own course without knowing the long-term effects on these children. I encourage and I vote on this amendment. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on L0, Representative Bottoms? Thank you, Chair. There's a few major problems. Well, I'm not going to have time to speak to the bill, but I'll speak to the amendment with the rest. So there's a few problems with uh, this, uh, this concept of FDA. The, uh, again, we've already heard this, but we, we argued for so long yesterday about why um, the FDA has not approved something and uh, then it do they, they did or they, it doesn't matter or it's not, it's not cogent to the conversation. Um, progesterone has been used forever, but that was not okay yesterday. And now we're asking, okay, then let's make sure that uh, these drugs that are going to be used here are FDA approved. This is... Uh, why would this be bad for this? This is going to include uh, young people in this process. This is going to include a lot of people. It's going to include teenagers in this process. So why would we not want FDA approved? That was the argument yesterday, right? So why would we not want that? Why is that, why is that all of a sudden this is a bad idea? We think we can go with just anything. Um, it, it, it doesn't matter. So. I wanted to uh, look at a few different things here. Now, the, the concept behind, I think everybody knows this, but the concept behind FDA approval, although th I think it's uh, shifty sometimes, but the concept, the, the concept is shifty, is that we're going to make sure that these drugs are not harmful, that they are going to be, they've been tested multiple times, they're not going to be harmful to the individuals. Now, I, I do have... Uh, different, I have a different view between adults on these things and children on these things. I think children need to be protected at all cost. This bill already attacks that on so many levels. These, these children are going to be put in so much danger with this. And uh, the medical side of this, specifically with the FDA, you realize that, uh, that a lot of this gender-affirming Care, we've seen it over and over and over. And I, I don't like to use the word care because care, care would uh, denote that this is going to be helping somebody physically or, or um, emotionally or whatever the case is. And, and this, this is not the category where this is health. This whole thing is not the category of health. This, uh, the idea of the FDA, that a lot of the, a lot of the studies that have been done, and you can Google these, you can find them online in a lot of places, even shows that some of the the, uh, the surgeries these these uh, mut they they become mutilations in many times. There's even the story of Chloe that uh, this became a mutilation. So what we're trying to do is say, look, let's if knowing that this is an extremely dangerous process, the procedure, the surgery, mental, every bit of it is dangerous, and we're going to be even pushing this into teenagers and into kids. And uh, we've heard earlier that, well, but it will be with consenting, that they have to be of the age of a consent. Well, we see all the time where these are done at, at uh, 11, 12, 13, as soon as they're entering into puberty. That was the whole story of Chloe, is that she changed her mind, and uh, they said, no, you do this at 13, and pushed her into this. So with the FDA approval thing, we want to make sure that this is at least some modicum. We're, we're not going to bring... We're not going to bring safety to this bill. This bill is designed around uh, unsafe. Everything about this is unsafe, emotionally, mentally, and I believe spiritually. It's, it's unsafe. It's harmful. So we're trying to do something that uh, would just, just scratch away a little bit and say, okay, let's go back to your arguments yesterday, and let's say, why don't we, um, why don't we go with your argument, just take everything everything that was said yesterday and just replace it right into this conversation right now for this amendment. Just take the transcript. Just set it over into 
uh, my argument right here, and uh, we don't have time for that because we had our time cut off uh, today, but you could take that entire conversation, quite a few hours, and just set it right into this uh, amendment right here. Why don't we want these drugs to be FDA approved? This is, again, this is a very dangerous thing. Let's try to at least do something that says, well, we've tested something. We've done something with this. The, 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 this, this whole medical practice mentality around these, um, these uh, transition surgeries, it's, it, it, there's tons of evidence that shows that this is a money-making thing, that they make money on these transition surgeries, and that's why they push it so much. So why don't we take this... Uh, this common sense argument and say, well, let's, let's, let's go with the FDA approved drugs. Kind of makes sense. Let me, um, let me piggyback some on the uh, arguments of the, the sponsor of the amendment and look at some things that have been going on around the world. We see where America has been trying to, to um, the citizens of America have been trying to hold this back for a long time because of, because of all these dangers, and we understand these to be dangers. These are, um, these are, very, these are very difficult concepts. They're also very difficult once you move from concept to surgery. Uh, we've seen where, where the puberty blockers that are given to kids at very young ages, extremely young ages, um, one of these that I just read uh, by a girl named Jazz, they started giving her puberty blockers at six and seven years old. And then what happens is, is they come, and, and I'm, saying this, I'm saying this for the, the transgender community should, to listen to this. When you start giving puberty blockers, now we're not saying um, FDA approved or not, we're saying generally just puberty blockers. So why would we not want this? Because they're so dangerous, why would we not want them to be FDA approved? When you take these puberty blockers and you give them to a young child to, to, to groom and transition them over years, by the time they hit puberty, if they desire to actually have a transition surgery, the chances of that going successful are very slim at that particular point. And at the risk of getting a little um, more uh, in-depth than I really want to, what happens is the, the walls, there's not enough skin down there to do skin graft. That's what happens. In fact, if you want to look this up to see if I'm uh, Right about that, I think the uh, article is, uh, I believe it's from Jordan Peterson, called, uh, called Twitchy Stump. So these, Representative these Bottom, drugs are we still from talking the FDA. about the FDA? Yes, ma'am. So these drugs that are given to these kids that cause these things are hindering, later on, are hindering these surgeries. But we're saying, well, just make them any drugs. They don't have to be FDA approved. They can, they can be what somebody has come up with and said, this probably works. Have you tested it? No. Has it, improved, has it been approved? No, but it, it'll probably be okay. And these things affect these people for years. So the people that have gone before us into this discussion, debate, and argument is obviously countries around Europe that have used, to, and these, these drugs are not FDA approved drugs because... Uh, they can do what they want there. But they, they're using these different medicines, and now we're pulling some of these medicines. Well, we have been, not now. We've been doing this for a couple decades now. We're pulling these medicines into um, America, and we're using them here. And this is what the amendment is about, is we're trying to say, well, let's, let's make sure that these medicines have been FDA approved. So 20 and 30 years ago, Europe was where we are now in a lot of this stuff. So they have a couple decades plus of, of a tests that have been done on these particular medicines. And, um, and, and again, in fact, a lot of these uh, non-approved medicines came from Europe. That's, that's where we got them from. So um, this particular study shows 
And, uh, and this, this is, I can't pronounce the person's name, but this doctor knows gender medicine. She is the top expert on pediatric gender medicine in Finland. And, the chief, and you guys understand that Finland has been doing this a lot longer than we have on, on so many different levels, on much, much deeper levels than we have. She is the top expert on pediatric gender medicine in Finland, which, which I have a problem with the whole pediatric side of this conversation. And the chief psychiatrist, so she's, she's top expert on the gender medicine, but she's also the chief psychiatrist at one of its two government approved pediatric gender clinics at Tempier University, where she has presided over youth gender transition treatments since 2011. So, so she's been doing this. She's been doing this for since 2011, and uh, and obviously Finland's been doing this much longer than that. So she came into the head of this after doing this for years. Her research has even been cited, though uh, not accurately, by American supporters of affirming care for gender dysphoric youth. It's exactly what this amendment is about. <clears throat> she is one of the last people in the world who could be accused of being reactionary or uninformed on the subject of trans health care. She's been one of the leading experts for longer than this has been. Some of the terms, I guess, have been used as, as like mainstream or, or trending or whatever the different terms have been used. Earlier this month, however, just a few days before Finland passed a law granting its adult citizens the right to have their self-defined gender recognized in government doctor, uh, documents, this doctor gave an interview. Um, and her comer, comments were a sobering reminder of just how out of step the American medical establishment is with its European counterparts when it comes to treating minors who reject their sex. The background to this interview is important. Now this is, this is crucial for this understanding of this uh, amendment, is why this doctor is saying some of the things that she says. Finland was among the first countries to adopt what's called the Dutch Protocol for pediatric gender medicine, which prescribes in certain restricted cases, the use of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones to treat adolescent gender dysphoria. Well, that's what this amendment is about. By 2015, however, Finnish gender specialists, including this doctor, were noticing that most of their patients did not match the profile of those treated in the Netherlands and did not meet the Dutch protocol's relatively strict eligibility requirements for drug treatments. Due to the extremely high rate at which children with gender issues have come to terms with their own bodies or desist by adulthood, the, du the Dutch protocol requires patients to have gender dysphoria that begins before puberty and intensifies in adolescence. That's, that becomes the requirement. Is they, this, has to be, this has to be proven from the child's perspective, not somebody else's perspective. That, there, that this is, the child is saying, you know, I have gender dysphoria, and, they've, and they put it through the test and all the things that are involved with that. It also requires them to have no serious co-occurring mental health problems, to undergo at least six months of psychotherapy, and to have the support of their family for hormonal, hormonal treatments. This is, all of this stuff is designed in the Dutch protocol, which we don't even do some of that stuff because we don't uh, need the parents involved. We've made sure that they can be restricted from this kind of stuff, from a lot of different um, bills that we've been processing. <clears throat> Within a few years of their country 
Adopting the, the Dutch protocol in 2011, however, Finnish researchers noticed a sharp rise in the number of patients referred for services. Th these are some of the things that just kind of get overlooked. We, we know this is going on in America. We know this with these drugs, with the lack of uh, FDA-approved drugs, all this stuff. We know this is what's happening, but, but we just kind of ignore it. That when, when we start having these um, uh, hormone treatments in, in younger children, we're starting to see abnormally high rates of a lot of other things that are happening. So why would we say, well, let's just let any drug do this then? Uh, FDA approved? Well, it doesn't have to be. But this is causing serious uh, repercussions and damage among our children and, and even uh, specifically young teenagers as they've come through the uh, uh, puberty process, which is when they step into understanding the rest of this. Most of these patients were teenage girls with no history of dysphoria in childhood. But, but now all of a sudden they have dysphoria. And some 75% had a history of severe psychopathology prior to the emergence of their gender-related distress. During the same time period, the UK's largest pediatric gender clinic at the Tavistock Center witnessed a, and now look at this, witnessed a 3,360% surge in patient referrals between 2009 and 2018. What, why would this surge, if, if, this, if all of this stuff is safe and these uh, drugs are good and everything is fine with this, how could you have 3,360% surge in patient referrals having to do with dysphoria all of a sudden? That, that, some of these statistics are so telling and, and, our, our, and our answer here on this bill is, well, it doesn't have to be FDA-approved drugs. It probably won't matter. 3,360% surge in patient referrals just between 2009 and 2018. Most of these new patients are females whose representation in the clinic rose 4,400% during this time frame with a history of serious psychological problems and no gender dysphoria prior to adolescence. <clears throat> Similar trends were being observed in other countries with pediatric gender clinics, including the United States. In 2018, the American physician researcher, Lisa Littman, plushed, published a study suggesting that teenage girls with high rates of mental health groups were suddenly declaring a, a transgender identity, often in friend groups and after prolonged exo exposure to social media. Now, when they go to get some type, depending on which direction they're wanting to go with their, with their plan, when they go to get drugs for this, we're saying, well, it doesn't matter where the drugs came from. FDA approved, it doesn't matter. It can be anything. I, I, don't, understand the, I don't understand the rationale with this. Th these, are, these are kids. A year later, this doctor and her Finnish colleagues observed in a peer-reviewed article that research on adolescent onset gender dysphoria is scarce. The research is scarce, so let's not worry about FDA drugs because the research on that is also scarce. We can do the scarce research drugs or we can do the FDA approved drugs. And again, as we talked about yesterday, all we have to do is take all of the arguments that were given yesterday and set those over onto this amendment right here today. That will accomplish the task. We will get it done if we'll just take not my arguments, but the other side's arguments. Research on adolescent onset, onset gender dysphoria is scarce, and optimal treatment options have not been established. 
The reasons for the sudden increase in treatment seeking due to adolescent onset gender dysphoria transgender identification are not known. Now again, they're, they're 20 years ahead of us on all this research. They understand the importance of not just which drugs, but how those have been vetted. How those, who, who's saying this is a good drug, bad drug, or anything like that? Are we making sure that we understand this? Well, we're trying to say this. Look at, look at our amendment and understand that we can say, look, we, we, okay, so we still totally agree with the concept, right? No, nobody on our side is saying, hey, we're all in. If you, if you pass this amendment, we're all in with the bill. That's, that's not what's going on. We strongly disagree with the bill, but now we're not even, even allowing legitimately approved drugs to be used in this. We're, making, we're taking a whole nother layer of protection away in this. It says, this lack of research and lingering doubt about the Dutch protocol itself, the only attempt to replicate in the, in the UK failed, right? So let me, let me read that again, because that's, that's pretty important. This lack of research and lingering doubt about the Dutch protocol itself, the, the only attempt in the UK to institute this Dutch uh, protocol, failed. But this lack of research and lingering doubts about the Dutch protocol itself led health authorities in Finland, Sweden, and the UK to conduct systematic reviews of evidence for the benefits and risk of hormonal interventions. Why? Because they began to recognize something's not good. When, when you're going up, when you have a surge in just a handful of years, when you have a surge of 3,360% of patient referrals, and uh, the female representation in the clinics rose 4,400% during the same time frame, then there is obvious cause to step back and reassess what's going on. Just because somebody said this is the Dutch protocol, it's probably a good plan, go with this plan, doesn't make sense. So then we pull these drugs to the United States and we say, well, probably it'll work better here. Maybe the, maybe the Finnish or the Dutch or the Swiss or the uh, English don't know how to administer the drugs. Maybe we can do it better here. So we pull it here and then we're saying this, this is what we're going to be giving our, our pubescent, entering pu uh, puberty and even young teenager groups, it doesn't have to be FDA approved. Why would we need that? It seems like, that seems like overkill. It's just our kids. Systematic reviews represent the highest level of evidence, analysis, and evidence-based medicine. The three European countries that did these reviews independently, and, and, and when, when they say independently, it's because they were doing these studies near and around the same times, but they weren't doing them in coordination. In fact, a couple of the countries didn't even know this was being done. They were all doing their studies independently. And why did they come up with the idea that they need to do these studies? Because these are statistics are off the charts. They're crazy level statistics saying, why, why are these referrals going? I mean, this isn't like up 100% or 200%. 3,300 plus percent of these referrals go up. That is astronomical in any study under any circumstances at any time. And our response here in Colorado is, well, we don't have to use FDA-approved drugs. That, that seems a bridge too far. They're just our kids. The three European countries that did these reviews independently came to the same conclusion. The, the, the three independent countries, the three European countries that did these at complete separate times all came to the same conclusion. That's, that's pretty astronomical. From countries, by the way, these are not countries that were trying to resist this stuff. These were countries that set the pace 20, 25 years ago, set the pace for the whole world and said, watch us. We're, we're progressive thinkers. We're going to get out in front of everybody and do the right thing for people. The result, 3,360% surge in patient referrals. Female representation in the clinics rose 4,400%. 4, 
These are the three European countries that are doing these studies. So they're not, they're not Oklahoma trying to figure this out. They are on the, the front side of this, and now they're starting to look back and realize in you know, 2020 hindsight, we have, we have done something horribly wrong. Now, America's coming into it, and many people across the United States and across Colorado are saying, we're going into something that has already been proven horribly wrong. But our answer is, we don't even need to have FDA approval. Just, just go forward. Why? We know. We know that we're going to do it better than anybody else. We've got the plan. We can lead the way in this. They said, due to these three European studies, came to the same conclusion, and this, this was the conclusion. Due to their severe methodological limitations, studies cited in support of hormonal interventions for adolescents are of, of very low certainty. So you medical people, I know you guys are going to be running up here to explain how very low is a real thing uh, and back this amendment, but the, the, the idea of very low certainty within the medical community means uh, stay away from it at all cost. For health authorities in these countries, this meant that the studies were too unreliable to justify the risks. This, this is a good sentence. For health authorities in these countries, these are the health people, the practitioners, and, and the health community that for the 20, 25 years before this had been pushing all of these things. And then all of a sudden they start doing the tests and they're like, wait a second, we have made a horrible mistake. We're destroying us as a people. For health authorities in this country, this meant that the studies were too unreliable to justify the risks. Now our answer here in the state of Colorado is, yes, we understand that the entire concept, the entire bill, the big package that we are being presented right here is too unreliable to justify the risks. Or actually what we're saying, now I agree with that statement, but what we're saying by producing a bill like this is no, we know better. They've only been doing it for 25 years. There's only hundreds of thousands of people that have been involved in this, but we know better. That they're saying these studies were too unreliable to justify the risks and uncertainties of gender-affirming care. Three separate countries doing three separate studies that did not know that they were each doing the studies. They were completely independent studies. They came to the conclusion that the studies were too unreliable to justify the risks and uncertainties of gender-affirming care. Sweden, Finland, and England have since placed severe restrictions on access to hormones. But our answer here is, let's not worry about whether this been, has been approved by the FDA. Let's just charge forward. We know better. We know what we're doing. They're saying we're going to start limiting. See, they're going the other direction. What's going to happen is we're going to pass them in the mix. They've gone way out there and realized this is destroying and killing people, destroying families, lives, everything. We're coming back, and we're going to start controlling this stuff at a higher level, which in many different laws that we have been passing in this house, I've been saying the same thing. Ten years from now, 20 years from now, we're going to, we're going to realize we've made a major mistake. Well, here's a cool one. They've already figured it out. They've already done the studies, and all we have to do is look at their studies. They said that that they are now placing restrict, uh, severe restrictions on access to hormones. So we're going we're gonna to pass them with this. They're coming back. We're going to be heading out, passing them, saying, nope, America knows better. Colorado is leading the way in this, and we're going we're gonna to prove to the world that all of these other countries, everybody else involved for the last 25 years, have all been wrong, but we're going to get it right. And so we say, well, here's just one tiny little slice of reality to this big falseness is why don't you just make the drugs FDA approved? 
How about that? Is that too hard? Is, it, is that too difficult? Is it too dangerous? Is the FDA-approved drugs too dangerous? What, what would be best for our kids? Well, the answer is, well, let's just, the FDA approval means nothing. Let's just, whatever drugs, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether it's the best. It only matters that, that the agenda gets done. <clears throat> would you like to take a break, Representative Bottoms? No, I feel fine. Thank okay. you. Thank you for your concern, Madam Chair. Still? No, same person. Okay. <clears throat> so, Sweden, Finland, and England have since placed severe restrictions on access to hormones. Although these countries now allow hormones in very carefully selected cohort of patients. See, these, these three countries haven't taken this off the table. They are just recognizing that this has been a huge danger. For a couple decades plus, it's been a huge danger. They recognize a selected cohort of patients who fulfill the criteria of the Dutch protocol. They do so against the findings of their own systematic reviews. And I thought that was a very interesting statement. They know these things are dangerous to the point of 33 plus 100 percent uh, females being representative, 4,400 plus percent. They recognize these are so dangerous that they began to restrict hormones, but they still allow this. And the statement here is they do so against the findings of their own systematic reviews. This is the doctor saying this. Why, why, why would the doctor come to that conclusion and then say it out loud. We know this is hurting and harming people, but we're going to keep doing it. We know our study shows the opposite, but we're going to keep doing it. That is because the systematic reviews found the Dutch study, on which the Dutch protocol is based, also provides very low certainty evidence. Finland's Council for Choices in Healthcare, not a conservative group, Finland's Council for Choices in Healthcare recognizes medical transition for minors as an experimental practice. Now, our response here in Colorado to experimental practice is let's just let them use whatever drugs. The drugs are not important. It's, it's what we're doing. It's the direction. It's the agenda. The agenda is what we're trying to accomplish. And all we're trying to do is, is um, put an amendment up here that says we should at least consider... FDA approved drugs. Why would, that be, why would that be harmful to the bill at all? Why would, why would that statement be, be it, doesn't, it doesn't change the bill. If the bill still goes through, the bill is still going to accomplish what it wants. Why does making sure it's FDA approved, why is that a bad thing? The doctor was a major force behind the decision to, revert, to reverse course in Finland. More recently, she testified on this side of the pond before the Florida Medical Boards in support of their decision to restrict access to puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and surgeries for minors. This is one of the doctors that was, this is the doctor that was leading the way in all these things. I gave you her, her um, portfolio, her, uh, her things that make her know this stuff uh, earlier. But she's the one who has led the way for 20, 25 years, her credentials. She's the one who led the way in this for, for 25 years. And she was the one doing the surgery. She was the one, she was also a psychiatrist. Remember, she's doing all of this stuff, working with these people, working with these. She comes to Florida and says to Florida that she supports their decision to restrict access to puberty blockers cross-sex hormones, and surgery for minors. Now, we've already heard that, that this is horrible and dangerous for America if we start spreading out from state to state to say um, th that we need to stop this kind of stuff. But again, we're headed toward the direction. Finland is coming back 
all the way to our shores and saying, after 20, 25 years, please understand our experience, our knowledge, and what's going on here. We know, because we have seen it, this is dangerous. This is harmful. But we're heading uh, loudly into that dark night, to change a quote. We're heading loudly to say, we know better. We know better. And so we are going to do this. And the people that have done this are saying, please don't. You don't understand how it's going to affect, not just right now, but five years, 10 years, 15, 20, 25 years later. Because we know they've been there. They know what the 25-year mark on this, uh, this type of legislation looks like. And she's, she's coming here and saying, we need to restrict this stuff. And our answer here in the Colorado House is to say, well, we don't want to make it FDA approved, though. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it, wouldn't it, um, wouldn't it be just okay if we use just whatever drugs? They don't have to be FDA approved. They're just, they're just our teenagers. Asked by a newspaper what she thought of gender self-identification for minors, a proposed element of the new Finnish law that did not pass. Uh, emphasize that it's important to accept children as they are. And I actually strongly believe that. I don't believe in making them into something else. But this means neither pressuring a child to conform to behavior traditionally associated, associated with this child's sex. And, and again, our answer here in America is, well, yes, these are our children, but the, it don't have to be FDA approved nor negating the body by confirming that the child's gender self-identification is real. In either case, said the psychiatrist, the child gets a message that there is something wrong with him or her. And that's the struggle. So we're just trying to say, look, we don't, we don't agree with the bill. But at least try to make sure maybe the drugs that we're using could be approved. No, nope, it's not good enough. Evidence from a combined 12 studies to date demonstrates that when children with cross-gender or gender-variant behavior dysphoria are left to develop naturally, the, the vast majority, four out of five, come to terms with their bodies and learn to accept their sex. Now, some people see that as a negative. I see this extremely positive. But instead, we, we want to make sure that they have these drugs. In fact, I believe, may not be anybody else's opinion, but I believe that these are being forced and groomed to do this. And so our answer here is, we're not going to make sure that the drugs that are, are being given to these kids are FDA approved. We're, gonna, we're just going to say that it doesn't matter. When they are socially transitioned, almost none do. Four out of five change their minds. When they're socially transitioned, virtually none do. And our answer here in Colorado is let's just give them whatever, whatever drugs. Doesn't matter. They don't have to be FDA approved, nothing like that. Doesn't matter. That most children desist, <clears throat> and that's a statistical fact, by the way, that most children desist from cross-sex identification does not necessarily mean that they will no longer experience any distress associated with their bodies. Rather, it means that even if such distress lingers, it will not prevent them from becoming reasonably well-adjusted and living a good life. The notion that no human should ever have to experience any discomfort associated with male or female embodiment, including during the turbulent period of puberty, is the utopian promise fueled much of the gender transition industry, she writes. Now again, our, our idea here in Colorado is, well, we're not going to make sure that the drugs, this is one tiny little part of this, one tiny little slice, we're not going to make sure that the drugs are FDA approved. We'll just keep moving the direction that we're moving. There has been a growing movement among gender activists to frame puberty as something that is autonomous, disembodied, self 
should have a right to choose. Now, these drugs that are be giving, been giving, being given to very young children, puberty blockers, things like that, and, and obviously you understand that the, the concept, maybe not always the application, but the concept behind a puberty blocker is before puberty, right? So that tells you uh, the age group. Neither puberty suppression nor allowing puberty to occur is a neutral act, writes the World Profession, Professional Association for Transgender Health in the seventh version of its standards of care. Unlike progressive elites in the United States who seem to regard social affirmation of transgender children as little more than an act of kindness, this doctor sees it as a powerful intervention in young person's uh, psychosocial development with potential for harm, um, iatrogenic harm, which means harm, harm to yourself. Now, our answer to this is, the drug doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. What matters is that, uh, that, that we make sure we push past, past this. The Swiss come in our direction, coming back on this timeline. Finland coming back on this timeline. England coming back on this timeline. Germany coming back on this timeline. Canada, I'll show you some more information about Canada here in a little bit. Canada coming back on this timeline. But we know better. We're going to make sure they have these drugs, and it doesn't matter if they're approved or not. We're going to, we know better in, in Colorado. <clears throat> Gender self-identification in youth is not a mere clerical formality. In the doctor's own words, it's a message saying that this is the right path for you. And um, I think sometimes, and I'm, I'm going to pick on my caucus here a little bit. I think sometimes we don't take that as strongly as we should because we have a different mindset. We have a different starting point with this stuff. And I think we say, well, how bad could it be? Are they, are they really trying to do something? I'm not saying the other side. I'm saying the medical mentality out there. But the message is if we've got all these blockers and medicines and, and things that are going on, these, these crossing the uh, sex cross hormones, if, we're, if we've got all these available, then apparently this is something I should do. And then that gives opportunity for them to be groomed in the process. And again, all we're trying to say is these, take, the, take these drugs and just make sure if, if it's the same drug, if it's, if it's drug A that's not FDA approved and drug B, which does the same thing, but it's gender, I mean, uh, FDA approved, then why would we not say f for the kids, if we could just save one child's life, wouldn't it be worth it? Let's go with FDA approved. Wouldn't that make sense? Because at some level, this might, this might even be kind of a, uh, a deceptive trade practice in the process. Why would we not use the FDA drug? Are, are we purposely trying to see that? I don't, I don't know that that would actually be accomplished. But at least we could say, well, no, we did all of our due diligence. We worked through this as much as we could. And so, yeah, we think the FDA-approved drug is, is um, the right idea. This doctor thus concurs with the NHS England, which recently noted that social transition, <clears throat> using a child's preferred name and pronouns, is not a neutral act. This is, this is England that came up with this. They've been way ahead of us on this argument. And they said it's not a neutral act, but rather one that can solidify what is otherwise likely to be a passing phase into a more permanent state of mind or identity and put the minor on a path to drugs and surgeries. These are, these are studies by whole countries. This isn't some uh, reporter doing a little report on the side. 
Finland did a study, Sweden did a study, England did a study, Germany did a study, Canada did a study, and they basically have come up with all these same conclusions. But we, not, not the country of America, but we as the state of Colorado know better just beginning the race, how to run the race, although everybody that's finished the race is coming back to us and saying, this is not the right way to do this. This is dangerous. The NHS, England, now warns of the risks of social transition in children and recommends it only for adolescents who have been diagnosed with gender dysphoria and have provided informed consent. Do, do you see the other direction these countries are going? The NHS, England, now warns of the risks of social transition in children. But we've heard lots of testimony today, there's no risks. What an entire country says, actually five different countries have said, yeah, there's, there's actually a lot of risk. And these are very high risk and they're very dangerous. And they recommend, because of these risks, these recognized risks, they recommend it only for adolescents who have specifically, that means not even just adolescents, but a very small group within adolescents who have been diagnosed with gender dysphoria and have provided informed consent. <clears throat> As for adolescents, you need someone to tap in. Um, you know, I don't. But thank you again. It's amazing how many people care for my health right now. As for adolescents, this doctor distinguishes between the minority whose dysphoria began in childhood and intensified during puberty. This, this is a very important concept that we just, we just pretend like doesn't exist here in the United States and specifically Colorado. That this dysphoria began in childhood and intensified during puberty in those whose dysphoria first appeared after the onset of puberty. The, the, anybody that does any mental health care, physical care, anything, understands that these are two major different groups and specifically within this concept and our answer here in Colorado is that, well, it doesn't have to be FDA approved. It can't be that big of a deal. It doesn't really matter. For members of the first group who qualify under the Dutch study, this doctor suggested that gender identity discordance may be more stable, although it should be emphasized that there are no controlled longitudinal studies confirming this observation. This is just her observation after the studies of 25 years. And some experts believe that medicalizing teenagers, even in this cohort, creates, creates a self-fulfilling prophecy, which she addressed earlier, which is, if this is what, you told, if this is what you're being told you are, and they, they had a thought one time, and uh, this is what you're told you're on, it's reinforced, and then everything out there is saying, well, there's drugs and, sur and uh, surgeries and everything that will take you down this path, then it, it becomes a, a, a direction that they go, and, then, and she's saying that this uh, creates a self-fulfilling prophecy. As for teenagers whose dysphoria began in puberty, these are, to repeat, primarily females. Again, the, 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 uh, the female representation after they started doing these, this uh, Dutch protocol, the female representation of dysphoria in these clinics went up 4,400%. That is so astronomically high. And our answer here in Colorado is, it doesn't have to be FDA approved. It doesn't matter. They're just our teenagers. Since the phenomenon is new and there is no scientific knowledge about the consistency it would be irresponsible to cement their gender self-identification in state documents. Do you realize these are the kind of amendments and bills we need to be running right now? Actually, the, the, this bill needs to be completely done away with. But we're just trying to get one little slice that says, um, maybe make these FDA-approved drugs. It's, it's a thing we could do. And she's saying we should be 
It would be irresponsible to cement their gender self-identification in state documents. This would be a great amendment to run. Make sure that we push the other direction on this. Advocates of the American affirmative approach, she writes, tend to ignore the broader trends of mental health collapse among teenagers over the past few decades. Now she knows the evidence here because she's been walking these few decades as one of the leading experts of this in Finland, and she's saying the, the Americans are not paying attention to what is happening in these other countries. She's, she's scolding the hubris of America that says we know better. She said that um, we're, we're ignoring the broader trends of mental health collapse among teenagers over the past few decades. And obviously it's directly tied to this. Now our response in America, in Colorado is, well, we know better. We don't need these drugs to be FDA approved. She says it's a deeply concerning trend that seems to affect girls in particular and is linked to social media use. Now we've talked about that, but that's not to this amendment. Utilizing a minority stress framework developed in research on homosexuality and borrowed for this purpose, activists insist that co-occurring mental health problems include anxiety, depression. Now these are all going to be uh, treated with medications. Anxiety, depression, ADHD, and eating disorders are caused by unaffirmed gender and can be solved or mitigated through social and medical transition. This is, this is one that stood out to me, and this is one that is particular about medicine, okay? Because one of the things that we, that we do when we, when we play around with medicine, and I'm saying society at large, not even just America, but in, at large, is we don't always realize the side effects of this. And we're seeing so many drugs now that we're introducing into children, but also adults, but, but specifically children, that are causing a bunch of other problems later. We even, we even had testimony from this well of those different effects that can happen, side effects that can happen. Now, as, a, as an adult, you're saying, okay, well, I'll, I think the side effect, I've done that with medicines, I think the side effect's okay. But the problem is, is if we're saying these drugs don't have to be FDA approved, that puts the risk of some of these side effects at a much higher level. Autism, in particular, seems to be especially common in youth who identify as transgender and seek medical attention. Now, I don't, I don't think that's a direct causality. I think she's saying something, if you're not careful. I think she's saying the drugs are affecting this. Okay? Look at this. A 2019 study on patients at the UK's largest pediatric gender clinic found that 48% were in the autism range. That's, that's a pretty high percentage of, of one specific select group. In her book, The Gender Creative Child, Gender Affirming Care Advocate, she's the advocate, Dr. Diane Aronsaf suggests that gender transition can even be a cure for autism. That seems to go against all of these other statistics. <clears throat> the developmental mission of youth has not been helped by the fact that young people's self-expression is supported and directed from the outside. The doctor said, the environment should also not commit to identity experiments in a way that might make a later change for direction anxiety inducing. And that's a powerful sentence. The, let me read it again. The environment should also not commit to identity experiments in a way that might make a later change of direction anxiety-inducing. In other words, we make it difficult for children that realize, wait, this is not who I am. I, I was going through a phase. We make it almost impossible for them to change their mind at that particular level. We have, we have forced them into a box. They no longer really have choice at this point. Now, as she's saying, the, this has to do with the drugs that they're taking. Now, these drugs, 
a lot of these drugs are the drugs that we're using in America. Now, some, some let's, let's give um, credence to this. Some of these drugs are, um, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, that made that quicker. Thanks. They, these drugs, some of these have actually been FDA approved, but most have not. And so we get them here on the, in, in our um, in our context, our medical context here, and they're not FDA approved, and they're saying they're really causing a lot of problems. These comments are consistent with the findings from the Netherlands. Hadn't even discussed the Netherlands yet. We can if we have time. I'm going to try to. These comments are consistent with findings from the Netherlands, where social transition was linked with persistence of gender dysphoria and difficulty coming to term with one's body and sex. On the question of why so many minors are rejecting their sex, and that's up 9.1%, um, and this was a US study actually, suggested that many young people grab the idea available in the media and social media that their problems are caused by gender identity and will be solved if others start to see them as members of the other sex. So then what do they do? They start looking around for the um, medical opportunities that can be availed to them. And now we're not even limiting this to whether they have parental consent in the process. Did you realize at the beginning of this uh, article, I mentioned the fact that these studies that were done in Finland and in um, the three major studies for sure in Europe, Finland and um, Sweden and, and England, that all of those studies were done with parental consent. But we're saying these, these young people that are heading towards some type of uh, gender transitioning, that we're not even going to let parents be a part of this. So now, uh, not only are these not FDA-approved drugs, but now these kids are making decisions on drugs by themselves without their parents, without a parent to say, don't, don't you think that maybe, uh, maybe you should rethink this? Maybe we should get some gender, um, uh, FDA-approved gender-affirming medication. So uh, the Netherlands agreed strongly with this. And then, um, that, but, if, but that does not work according to the doctor. A balance of mind does not come from making others do and see what you want. Although that, that, seems to be the direction that we take on many different stances in this, in this uh, assembly. And I think both sides would argue both sides do that, by the way. The Genevan philosopher, Rousseau, called this amour propre, self-love conditional upon how one is viewed by others. Now, when they become across this concept of, well, how do I see myself how do I see others? How do I think others see myself? These are all the, the questions of life, in fact. In fact, uh, some of us recently were having a discussion about this, completely separate from this bill, but that's one of the things is how do you think you look? How do you think other people think you look? The, 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 when we get to that point and these kids are saying, well, how do I think I'm being viewed? The pressure is, is being put upon them. Well, you, oh, everybody is transitioning, why shouldn't you? So then what do they do? They turn to these drugs. And, and these drugs, again, all we're trying to say is just slice off a tiny little slice here and say, um, let's make sure that these drugs are FDA approved. <clears throat> That's all we have to do. We're not, we're not trying to say don't use the drugs. We're just saying if you're going to use these drugs for this, make sure that these are FDA approved. Don't, don't use drugs that we don't really know for sure. And I'm not saying the FDA is the all in all when it comes to all of this, but don't just assume that, that, that this is, um, that these drugs are gonna be good. Don't just assume, I'm not saying they're bad, they may not be, but let's just let, uh, just a common sense, let's let the FDA approve these things. <clears throat> Turning to the question of suicide, which is usually, thank you. Smooth and satisfying. 
Turning to the question of suicide, which oftentimes we deal with uh, on, a, on a medication point of view, which, is, which I don't think is, is wrong. Um, I don't think it should be for every case, but we do, and this will be part of this gender dysphoria, because we're going to have to deal with these subjects. I don't think using medications are wrong within this concept, but why don't we just say, hey, if, if we're going to do this, let's make them FDA approved. This amendment is a good amendment. Um, it, it should, to me, it seems common sense. <clears throat> Turning to the question of suicide, which has become virtually the only argument that gender-affirming activists make in support of the preferred practice, the doctor did not pull her punches. She said, the popular transition or suicide narrative used by activists to push back against state reform effort is and, and this, this is not a full, this amendment is not like a full state reform. This is just a tiny slice. It's trying to take this bill and just take a tiny slice and say, let's make, in this concept of suicide, let's make sure that these drugs that are going to be given directly related to gender dysphoria and potential suicide, let's make those FDA approved drugs. She said the popular a transition or suicide narrative used by activists to push back against state reform effort is, in the doctor's words, purposeful disinformation and spreading it is irresponsible. Much of the public confusion about the suicide issue stems from a simple correlation causality fallacy. Again, this is going to be dealt with on a great degree. It's going to be dealt with uh, medically. And, and also, there'll be you know, psychologists, psychiatrists are going to be involved with this and should be. But this is going to be dealt with uh, medically. So this is why we have to have this as FDA-approved drugs. While there is evidence that teenagers who identify as transgender have ele elevated rates of suicide and, and uh, suicidality, a behavior that researchers emphasize often involve thoughts of suicide or non-fatal self-harming <clears throat> gestures and should not be confused with actual suicide or suicide attempts to one life. We want to keep those separate, and that's in, important in a mental health aspect. And, and, and what she just said was that the, the rates of suicide go up within the category, not down within the category. I know that's been testified about that suicide goes down and this is good for mental health and these medicines um, will, will fix all the problems, but s statistics across the board show that these that uh, suicide goes up within these um, communities. She says there is no evidence that their elevated risk <clears throat> is because of this or that social and medical transition will reduce the risk for self-harm. And she's showing that this is just not true. Studies purporting to find that hormones reduce suicidality are typically designed in such a way that valid inferences about cause and effect cannot be drawn. We, we see this regularly here. That you can say, well, this happened, so therefore this happened. And those are not direct causalities. You, you wouldn't make freshman year in, in high school in, with those kind of reference, uh, references. So our answer to this is, well, knowing that the potential for harm for this is, let's not make sure that these drugs are FDA approved. Although we're jumping huge bridges to say, well, this drug will most definitely help here, and, and this will help here, and they will feel better, and all this. But we know suicide rates go up. We know that, that suicidality, the mentality behind this, which, is, which I really believe is a major, major problem in our society, it doesn't get enough discussion because su suicide gets all of the, the uh, conversation. They need to be both. They need to be included together. Considering that roughly three-quarters of teenagers who present to gender clinics these days have pre-existing mental health conditions like depression and autism, so therefore if they have these conditions, and this has been proved over and over, they should not be set upon a path of uh, gender transition. The drugs are too uh, harmful for them in these process, which are themselves risk factors for su suicidality it is probably more accurate to say that teenagers with suicide inclinations are more likely to gravitate toward a trans identity. Thankfully, moreover, suicide is extremely rare even among transgender identified youth. 
There was no epidemic of suicides among gender distressed teenagers before gender affirming. I'm going to read that sentence again because that's, that's been testified against pretty much, uh, quite a bit. There was no epidemic of suicides. This is after 25 years of study. There was no epidemic of suicides among gender distressed teenagers before gender affirming hormones became uh, available roughly 15 years ago. A study from the UK found that the suicide rate among minors seeking medical transition between 2010 and 2020, look at this number, this is significant, was 0.03%. Nothing close to the 41% risk commonly cited by American activists and has been cited in this well. This is after 25 years of study, not a, not a hot minute. Suicide was a very rare occurrence in about 10 years among young people seeking gender identity diagnosis. On the other hand, in a large Swedish study, suicide mortality had clearly increased among adults who had received gender reassignment treatments. For the doctor, she said it is not justified to tell the parents of young people identifying as transgender, that a young person is at risk of suicide without medical treatments and that the danger can be alle alleviated with gender reassignment. Indeed, the suicide discourse that has come to dominate gender transition activism may itself contribute more to youth self-harm than bans on the hormones, and these, th these are the drugs we're talking about in this, in this um, amendment, self-harm than the bans on hormones and surgeries currently being passed in the United States. And we're just saying, just make them FDA approved. It's not, it's not a big thing. It's not a major transition. It won't transition this bill any. The bill will be exactly the same. <clears throat> As Allison Clayton has argued in a peer-reviewed paper, an excessive focus... An excessive focus on an exaggerated suicide risk narrative by clinicians and the media may create a damaging non-SIBO effect, or what we would call a self-fulfilling prophecy. We've been hearing about placebos, but this is different. Whereby suicidality in these vulnerable youths may be full, further exacerbated. Tell kids that being suicidal is inherent to being transgender and that only hormones will solve their problem and many may indeed become suicidal. And, and when we're trying to tell them, look, these hormones, first, my encouragement would to be never to take these hormones. These, these, are, these are dangerous. This is, this, is gonna, this is gonna hurt you. And so I believe completely strongly against this bill at all, but all we're trying to do is say, let's just take a tiny little slice of this uh, bill and say, let's make these drugs, these hormones, and these, all of the different drugs that are going to be involved in this, let's just make them uh, FDA approved. Just make sure that we know what, what our kids are getting. They're not just getting anything. Uh, we know what they're getting. And again, the argument from yesterday was, was, let's just take that argument from yesterday and let's just move it over to here and let's just place it verbatim, we don't have to change anything, just place it verbatim within this argument for this amendment right here. <clears throat> the affirm or suicide discourse also runs counter to the recommendations of the Center for, Centers for Disease Control. They also disagreed, disagree with a lot of the, um, the uh, conversation that we've been having in here. They, which emphasizes that suicide is never the result of a single, single factor or event and warns against presenting simplistic explanations for suicide. And, and, and part of this then is guides them toward the drugs. 
It's hard to think of a better example of simplistic explanations than uh, the, the author writes, it's hard to think of a better example of simplistic explanations than trans kids will, will uh, kill themselves when not given hormones. This is the CDC that is saying this. And what we're saying is, if we're going to give them these drugs, if we're going to do this, which we strongly disagree with, we disagree with this bill completely, but if we're going to give them these drugs, can't, wouldn't it be a good idea to have them FDA approved? Wouldn't it, have, wouldn't it be a good idea not just to assume that these drugs are going to be okay? These, these are our teenagers. These are our kids. Let's, let's not do these, this to our kids. <clears throat> um, the writer continues, why the obsessive emphasis on the suicidal issue? The obvious reason is that if suicide is the expected outcome any risk from hormones and surgeries is probably worth it. Well, if, if we're not even going to say these hormones have to be FDA approved, if, we, if we're not even going to say that, what, wh where is our argument when it comes down from, okay, FDA approved, non-FDA approved drugs, because that doesn't matter. Where do we stop when we cascade further into the mental health and the uh, physical health of all these people that are involved with this? This is, this, is a, this is a huge mountain, and we're just, we're just asking for, for the, uh, of this huge mountain, we're just asking for a tiny little piece, just a little rock pulled out that says, let's just make sure these drugs are FDA approved. Let's just do that. Should be a fairly simple amendment. It strikes fear into the hearts of parents who worry about the risks and uncertainties about blocking their children's natural puberty with these drugs that should be FDA approved, pumping them full of synthetic hormones and amputating their healthy breast as early as age 13. We actually have proof that it happens uh, earlier than in, in some children that have uh, gone through puberty earlier. It is also a powerful tool for silencing critics. Thank you. <clears throat> I realize I'm not going to be able to finish. Well, I'll give it everything I got. It strikes fear into the hearts of parents who worry about the risks and uncertainties of blocking their children's natural puberty pumping them full of synthetic hormones that we're just saying, make these, make these things FDA approved. That's all. Just make these FDA approved. I, I, don't, I don't want these kids to be pumped with any of these drugs. I think these, these hormones, these synthetic hormones are horrible. They're, they're going to destroy. We already have proof that they're destroying kids and they're killing kids. So my argument is not at all. But if we're going to, let's, let's look at this amendment and say, Let's make sure that it's FDA approved. Seems like a small little thing. And amputating their healthy breasts as early as age 13. It is also a powerful tool for silencing critics and crucially deterring those who have questions about hormonal interventions from raising them in the first place. And that's part of the reason for this study is this doctor is saying this is not just about the drugs. Our, our amendment is just saying, just make these drugs FDA approved. That's all we're asking. This doctor is saying, it's not just about the drugs. It's the whole picture. It's all of this. These kids are, are being forced into these, these uh, categories, into these boxes. <clears throat> the doctor thinks that the suicide discourse is being pushed by, quote, adults who have themselves benefited from gender reassignment, have a desire to go out and save children and young children, which, according to this doctor, this is a positive statement about this from the doctor. Let me, let me read again. Thinks that the suicide discourse is being pushed by, quote, adults who have themselves benefited from gender reassignment, which is a total different thing when an adult takes these drugs. Although I, I think the amendment it does, and it should, cover adults and children. But specifically for kids, it is different when you do this stuff with kids. It's destructive in adults, too. But it is, it is it's horrendous what it's doing to these kids. 
but they have a desire to go out and save children and young children. But here's the key sentence. But they lack understanding that a child is not a small adult. They're not just little adults. Their bodies are different. Everything about them is different. Activist. Activists are driven by a combination of motives, including misguided empathy, the savior complex, and projection. And, I, and I, I believe the first two are true, but I also believe that the projection is the strongest. This is just my opinion on those three things. Unlike American doctors who dare question gender affirmative orthodoxies, the doctor has the backing of professional medical groups in her country. The Finnish Pediatric Society <clears throat> The Finnish P Pediatric Society, the counterpart to the American Academy of Pediatrics, has come out against governmental support for gender self-identification in minors. America has got to do this, and we should be doing this in Colorado, except we're doing the opposite. And all we're asking in this amendment is just take a tiny little slice and just say, can't these be FDA-approved drugs? It's not, a, it's not a big slice, it's a small slice. Can we make sure these are FDA approved drugs? So the Finnish Pediatric Society, the counterpart to the American Academy of Pediatrics has come out against governmental support for gender self-identification in minors in a statement to the Finnish parliament. That's, again guys, this, this doctor and, and the Finnish are, are 25 years ahead of us on this argument. 25 years ahead. They know all the stuff that we're anecdotally shooting out into the dark. They already know this stuff. They've seen it. They've been through it for an entire full generation. They know what's going on here. And again, we're, we're still heading that direction, and the, and the Finnish are coming back the other way saying, don't do this. Don't do this. It's dangerous. The Finnish parliament came out uh, against governmental support for gender self-identification in minors in a statement to the Finnish parliament. Likewise, the Finnish Medical Association wrote, <clears throat> this, is, this is their writing, now, this isn't the Finnish parliament. This is the Medical Association of Finland. Now, again, the Finnish Medical Association was the ones that were 25 years ago pushing all of this stuff, like we're doing now, but probably even stronger. They were pushing it and saying, we're going to be the leaders in this. I've heard this a few times in this assembly that we, as Colorado, we want to lead the way in, in some of these things, and we're leading the way in some of the most horrendous stuff. And the people that led the way... 20, 25 years ago is Finland. And now the Finnish parliament is saying we stand against this. The Finnish Medical Association that was so strongly for this 25 years ago wrote, the decision to limit legal gender recognition to adults is a good one. What? This is not healthy for the children. Now, here in Colorado, our stance is, let's not, um, let's not make sure these drugs are FDA approved. Let's just, whatever. This seems like a fairly small, simple thing. Let's just, let's just make it FDA approved. This, this is simple. I, I would stop talking right now if we would vote this amendment in. I would stop talking right now and give all of the time back. These statements run directly counter. Now look at this. The Finnish Parliament and the Finnish Medical Association are saying we need to limit this to adults. These statements from the Finnish Parliament and the Finnish Medical Association that have been doing this for 25 years, these statements run directly counter to the American Academy of Pediatrics policy. Why? Because we know better. And that has, that has been quoted here. But we know better. 
And uh, these policies have existed since 2018, which drawing on a highly distorted interpretation, this is, this is the Finnish Medical Association that is saying that, these, that the American Academy of Pediatrics policy since 2018 draw, are drawing on a highly distorted interpretation of the available research and recommends immediate and uncritical affirmation <clears throat> Uncritical at <clears throat> These statements run directly counter to the American Academy of Pediatrics policy since 2018, which drawing on a highly distorted interpretation of the available research recommends immediate and uncritical affirmation of minors regardless of age. It also conflicts with the de facto practice in American schools of socially transitioning children upon request. This is, again, this one goes beyond my understanding. I really don't get this. It also conflicts with the de facto practice in American schools of socially transitioning children upon request. Often, as we've argued many times here, often without knowledge or consent from parents. This is the Finnish Medical Association saying this, that they are looking at us as Americans who are going into the conversation, and they are 25 years later coming backwards out of the conversation saying this is dangerous, and they're telling American Academy of Pediatrics, you are going the wrong direction. You are going to hinder. And our answer is, let's not even take one small, simple little thing and say this should be FDA approved. Why can't, why can't that happen? Just make this FDA approved. We're not, the bill doesn't change. Read the bill, slide in FDA approved, it doesn't change. It just makes sure that all the things that are being touted as being safe, which, which all five of these countries, including the Netherlands, I never really did get to the Netherlands, and I'm not even going to be able to get to Germany. But all of these countries are saying, this stuff is dangerous, it's harmful. We know, because why? We're in the middle of it, and we're trying to shut it back down. <clears throat> it also conflicts with the de facto practice in American schools of socially transitioning children upon request, often without knowledge or consent from parents. When it comes to pediatric gender medicine and related social policy, these things are far from perfect in Finland, and the doctor recognizes that. She, she, she uh, acquiesces that. But she's saying, having done this for decades now, please don't do this. Having seen what it does to our children, please don't do this. And our answer here in Colorado is we, we won't even restrict this to FDA-approved drugs. Just make it whatever. And she's saying this is not healthy. But you know what? She's also affirming here in this sentence, Finland has still got problems. Why? Because I read this just a little bit earlier, that while they know that there is so much danger with all of this, and these drugs, these drugs that we're talking about in this Amendment. While they know there's problems with every single bit of this, they're still continuing their policy of of um, of, uh, of this within the adults. Well, it, it, Finland's con con continuing it with all ages, but the doctor and the medical association are saying we need to back up on this, and the Finnish parliament is saying we need to back up on this on minors. And so they're trying to change those, change those as laws and everything else, and we're pushing the other direction. Why, why would we not listen to, to five, six major countries that are saying, we've already been here, we've already done this, and we know? And our answer in the state of Colorado is, we don't even necessarily need this to be uh, FDA approved. When it comes to Thank you, sir. When it comes to a pediatric gender medicine and related social policies, things are far from perfect in Finland. Compared to the United States, however, 
It is an oasis of sanity and accountability. Do you realize the magnitude of that statement from one of the leading doctors that was pushing all of the uh, gender-affirming stuff into minors 25 years ago? This doctor that has done countless years, not hours, not a research of a few hundred people, but tens of tens of thousands of people over decades. And she is saying that Finland, who has finally realized this, Germany, the Netherlands, the UK, um, that they have realized that this is not good. And they're saying, United States, pay attention, because we have finally come to our senses. We have finally understood the, uh, the, the sanity involved in this. We've arrived at this sanity. We're headed back the other direction. We're going to make this less about minors. We're going to pull back on that, and only adults can do this. And again, our answer, <clears throat> our answer here in the United in the state of Colorado is... Let's, uh, let's make sure that this is not FDA approved. Why would we not want this FDA approved? How does that hurt one person? How does it hurt one person if this is not FDA approved? Nobody, nobody doesn't get the gender affirming care that is touted in this bill. Nobody, nobody is held back from getting any kind of um, help or resource or anything. All we're asking is make sure it's FDA approved. You still got all of the stuff in the bill. Just make sure that it's FDA approved. That seems, to me, that seems kind of common sense. Let me, let me read this sentence again. Compared to the United States, this is Finland. This is, uh, this is the doctor in Finland. She said, compared to the United States, however, it is an oasis of sanity and accountability. <clears throat> Uh, Brian Lupo says we were wrong. Evidence shows that puberty blockers, and these are the puberty blockers that we're talking about in this amendment, evidence shows that puberty blockers are neither safe nor reversible. And this is a Canadian doctor who helped, actually this is, this is important to this whole FDA issue, is he says that puberty blockers, now I don't think he's limited to FDA or not FDA because he's from Canada, he's a Canadian doctor, but he says these puberty blockers are neither safe nor reversible, and he is one of the guys who pioneered puberty blocker drugs. Now we're saying here in the state of Colorado, this guy's saying they're totally bad all the way across the board. Well, we're saying here in Colorado, uh, we presented an amendment here that says we would just like this to be FDA approved, that's all. Um, we, just want, we just want these drugs that this guy is saying, this Canadian doctor who helped develop these puberty blockers, he's saying that these are, um, these are neither safe nor reversible. And we're saying take these, this whole category that we believe is not safe or reversible. Okay, that's, who, that's, what our, that's what our caucus is saying, that none of these are beneficial. But the amendment is just trying to take a tiny little slice and say, look, if... Um, if you're going to do this anyway, why can't we just make these drugs FDA approved? It seems like a seems like a common sense kind of thing. Seems like a good idea. And this guy is saying, this guy is saying that uh, all of them are bad. <clears throat> so, um, Dr. Susan Bradley, who helped pioneer gender affirming care in Canada has now spoken against the popular model of gender-affirming care by placing children on puberty blockers. Guys, all we're asking is make these puberty blockers FDA approved. Representative Bottom, the time for debate has lapsed. The question before us is the passage of Amendment L37. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The amendment fails. The motion before us is the adoption of, S of Senate Bill 188 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. 
Opposed, no. No! The ayes have it. Senate Bill 188, as amended, passes. Majority Leader Duran. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to lay over Senate Bill 189 until later today. Seeing no objection, Senate Bill 189 will be laid over until later today. Majority Leader Duran. Madam Chair, I move the committee rise and report. Seeing no objection, the committee will rise and report.
The House will come to order. Mr. Schiebel, please read the report of the Committee of the Whole. Madam Speaker, your Committee of the Whole begs leave to report it as under consideration the following attached bills being the second reading thereof and making the following recommendations thereon. Senate Bill 188 is amended, passed on second reading in order to revise and place on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Senate Bill 189 laid over until March 31st, 2023. Representative Doherty. Members, you have heard the motion. There are amendments at the desk. Mr. Schiebel, please read the Bottoms Amendment to the Committee of the Whole report. Representative Bottoms moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the committee in not adopting the following Puglisi Amendment, L22 to Senate Bill 188, to show that said amendment passed and that Senate Bill 188 is amended passed. Representative Bottoms. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I feel like I'm back home. I would like to move amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole and have it properly displayed. The Bottoms Amendment is properly displayed. Please proceed. Now, this is going back to uh, trying to protect our doctors. This, uh, so doctors that have set this up for years and years, they've set up a practice, they've set up uh, a healthy, um, potentially cross-state medical practice. If they are, we want to make sure that they're protected through this. And, you know, we, we hear three or four different times through our amendments. And so I want to take just a few minutes to address this. We, we hear in our amendments that, well, this is already taken care of in the bill, so you don't need it. Well, if it's already taken care of in the bill, then what does it hurt? If it's not going to change the bill and nothing is bad, then why wouldn't we do it? So we want to make sure, and I'll, I'll read this. It says, the prohibitions against denying licensure, certification, or registration, and against imposing disciplinary action against an individual's license. This, this is their livelihood. This is their existence. This is their life, not just their livelihood. And we want to try to protect that. So against imposing disciplinary action against an individual's license, certificate, or registration specified in this subsection, 2C, do not apply if the applicant or individual provided a legally protected health care activity in another state. If we, we want to do something in Colorado, that's one thing. But to try to do this... Uh, and, and have repercussions to a person's medical license or certificate or something because of, of, a, of a different state line, different state law, different state practice. We need to make sure that we're protecting our doctors here. Do not apply if the applicant or individual provided a legally protected health care activity in another state or United States territory in a manner that was inconsistent with generally accepted standards or practice under the law of the jurisdiction in which the care was provided or that otherwise violated the law of that jurisdiction. We want to make sure that our, our doctors are being protected, our licensed health care people are being protected from uh, overreach. Now again, we, we believe this bill is overreach, but this amendment is going to just try to take a tiny little slice out of the big picture and make sure that these, that these doctors are taken care of. Why, why would we allow their license to be uh, in jeopardy because it's across a state line or something else? We need to realize that different states do different things and we need to acknowledge that and we need to accept that. Uh, it, it would be the same coming from another state into Colorado that, that uh, the argument could be well, uh, you know, one state says that, uh, say, abortion is illegal in that state. Then they come to Colorado, and we heard, I don't know how much testimony about people coming to Colorado for this. Well, what happens if a, if a doctor is involved in this over-the-state lines mentality? Are we going to penalize a doctor? What about a doctor going from Colorado the other direction? Are we going to penalize that doctor? Those could be two different things. 
and we're saying we need to protect the uh, license, the certificate of these doctors, the same way we would try to fight in Colorado um, if a doctor in Colorado had their license removed because of a, a uh, law in a different state. Okay, we would say, well, that's not okay. You, you're your state. We're Colorado. So what we're trying to do is say, in the state of Colorado and outside the state of Colorado, we want to acknowledge the fact that these states have different rules, different guidelines, different things, and that these doctors are going to be protected through this process. <clears throat> As a doctor, I think this would be kind of common sense. Um, actually, I think a doctor would see this as potential of their practice. This isn't just common sense. It's the practice that's on the line. And, we, and we've got to be careful that we're not, again, doing overreach. Again, I think the entire bill is overreach. But we don't want this, the doctors, to be just uh, attacked across our state or for somewhere else because they're not fitting into the idea or the criteria that Colorado has set up. Colorado, as we have said in this house many times, that we want to lead the way in Colorado in some of, this, uh, some of these mentalities, but that doesn't mean hindering or harming people from uh, other states, doctors, medical practitioners from other states. There has to be some point where you say that's just not okay. Those, the, those doctors need to be protected. So that's why this amendment existed in the first place, and, um, and this is why I would like to ask for an I vote on this, because these doctors have worked their whole lives for this. This is, their, this is their livelihood. Why would we put that in jeopardy? And I mean, just casually, just yeah, from this day forward, it's all, everybody's in jeopardy now. That, that, seems very, that seems very harmful and brash that we would say, well, we're just going to put everybody in harm's way now. You're going to lose your practice, your livelihood, ability to feed your children, all those kind of things. So I say, well, really, is it that strong? Well, if they're a doctor and that's their license, that's how they feed their children. So this amendment is just trying to feed the children. We're just trying to say doctors should not have their license taken away. That's, that seems kind of simple to me. So um, I urge and I vote on uh, this amendment. Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Denying licensure, this was kind of brought up earlier about complaints of overreach of other states. So then here's our bill that's reaching into other states to, to reach out and touch doctors that I guess might come here and strip them of their license. So in a time that we're trying to, in a time that we're trying to encourage as much medical participation, because if you want to make costs go down, here's something with a free market. I know this is foreign, but what you would want is you want a higher supply of doctors. And if you have a higher supply of doctors to meet the need, and then you have the same demand, then the cost of the medical care will go down. Now, if you eliminate a doctor because he doesn't apply, does not, he or she does not, does not conform to your ideological litmus test, you lose a doctor. You could just say, you know what? You, doctor, you can treat those cases that you're comfortable with, that you feel are within your uh, moral purview, and the doctors that feel a different way can handle all the other cases. Now, the free market also would dictate that the demand for that would create doctors that go in that direction. So the market always has a really, really good way of solving this. Supply, demand, again, I, I recognize that in this body, the, the, the free market is, is, an, is anathema. And the forced market is because, because the 46 members in here who adhere to the forced market know that their way is better. That's, we're not pushing the forced market. We're pushing the free market. We're talking the forced market. So the members 
disregard the math. I probably did it wrong anyways. I probably did the wrong, I probably did the, there's probably some other members that are in favor of the free market that just won't admit it. Representative DeGraff. Yes, ma'am. Please don't speak to the beliefs, intentions of others. Back to the amendment, please. Yes, ma'am, thank you. All right, so denying licensure has only one purpose. That is to eliminate a medical professional from the ability to care for Coloradans because they don't meet an ideological litmus test. So it's, the idea is to pummel them into submission. So let's see, where does that stand in the Constitution? My colleague brought that up earlier, the Declaration of Independence, that would really be good to be able to look at this from the Declaration of Independence or Constitution. Of course, the Constitution is founded on the Declaration of Independence, that our role in this government is to secure those rights. Secure those rights of what? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just power from where? From where? From the consent of the governed. So, ma'am, this is to the amendment because it is to the bill, which is to the, which is to everything that we're doing here. So we have we have denying of licensure, which is to say you are taking somebody's option based on your ideological litmus test, which is in direct contravention of the con which is in direct contravention of the consent of the governed. So we have, this, we have this framework that we use, that we all agreed to use. We all came in here, whether you understood it or not, and you probably should have, that we will solve problems within the framework of the Constitution, which was founded on the Declaration of Independence, where we solve these problems and we look for this, we, we secure the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Representative DeGraff. Yes, ma'am. Last warning. Okay. Speaking to members and their should have understood their oath to the Constitution is making an assumption that they didn't. I will ask you to focus on the content of the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So again, we have this issue where we have complaints of overreach of other states to reach into Colorado, and what we're doing with this bill is we're looking to reach into other states. So I'm not sure what to call that. Not sure if I can call it anything, so I won't. No state, and the 14th Amendment was brought up earlier, so I think that's relevant because that was, that was specifically mentioned. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction equal protection of the laws. So now... Let's see, is this equal protection of the law? No. This is a specific singling out. This is a specific singling out. Why? Because it doesn't conform with the, it, uh, it doesn't conform with the, uh, the litmus test. What would be the litmus test maybe for a medical provider? Well, there would be the Hippocratic Oath, but then if we went to the Hippocratic Oath, that would be uh, provide no abortifacient. So that's out. Shall, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abuse the privilege. So what, what does a license do? What does a license do? Well, a license really extends privileges. doesn't really apply immunities. I guess it applies some immunities in terms of competition because only certain people are going to be licensed, so they go through this whole process. So not only would you be, you'd be immu um, removing those immunities from that specific doctor that failed to adhere to the litmus test, you would be removing it and putting a chilling effect on anybody that was coming up through the medical system to go, huh, I would be a target of that. I might be a great doctor, but I would be a target of that litmus test. So let me think, let me think, should I put in a couple hundred thousand dollars, eight years of my life, only to graduate and then, have, and then be dictated that I must adhere to the totality of an ideology. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to say to our medical students. And not only say the totality of this, the totality of this ideology, 
But we want to say, you know what? It might change. We might add to it. And if we do add to it, we will add a new litmus test. Is that an equal application of the law? No state shall enforce or any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property. And we already talked about that. My colleague mentioned that. Would be depriving a citizen of their life's work. How many years does a doctor go to school? Long time, get the certifications, very long time. And then all of a sudden you go, no, we're not going to license you because you do not conform to the totality of our ideology. No state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property. Probably lose your property, lose your, light, lose your, lose your practice if you lose your license. A license is a pretty significant property. Without due process of the law. Does this recommend due process of the law? Does the bill recommend due process of the law? No. There's no conviction, just a... Just a kangaroo court saying, you don't conform to the totality of our ideology, therefore you will not be licensed, you cannot practice medicine in the state of Colorado, and we lose a doctor. And any other doctor that's not going to come for that reason. And then what are we going to do? Start, start recruiting doctors or start drafting doctors and tell them that it's their duty? That we have... We have many people with needs, and you have the ability, so therefore you will perform the role of doctor within the totality of our ideology. Let's see, what else was in there that was specifically mentioned? It was mentioned six. Representative yes, DeGraff, you have 45 seconds remaining. Thank you, ma'am. Well, I just want to mainly talk, touch on the 14th Amendment because that was specifically asked by my colleague, and I did not want the good representative to think that the uh, question went ignored. I recommend a yes on this vote, this amendment, in order to have some protection for our medical professionals. Representative Titone. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the bill protects providers. That's what the point of the bill is. We don't need this in the bill. Uh, please vote no. Seeing no further discussion. The question before us is the adoption of the Bottoms Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? No. Representative Morrow votes no. Representative Holtorf is excused. Please close the machine. With 17 aye, 40 no, and 8 excused, the amendment is lost. Mr. Schiebel, please read the Bradfield Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Representative Bradfield moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the committee not adopting the following Puglisi Amendment L23 to Senate Bill 188 to show that said amendment passed and that Senate Bill 188 as amended passed. Representative Bradfield. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I move that to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the committee in not adopting the following Puglisi Amendment to show that it said the amendment passed and that SB 23-188 as amended passed. Thank you, Representative Bradfield. If you will move the Bradfield Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report, we will be there. I am sorry. No Thank problem. You. I move the Bradfield Amendment to, the, uh, to amend the, committee, the report of the Committee of the Whole. Thank you. The amendment is properly displayed. Oh. Pre please proceed. Thank you. Um, this amendment simply said, let's not rush, let's step back, let's assign a task force, let's take a look at what other states are doing, let's take a look at the laws they've enacted, 
what their policies have been before we uh, go barreling into the future. And um, I uh, ask for an I vote. Thank you. Representative Titone. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, we've been stakeholding this bill for a very long time with the Attorney General. There's no reason to have a stakeholder meeting, a task force, or whatever it is. Uh, the bill was looked at by the Attorney General. I urge you to vote no. Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This amendment raises an interesting question that was brought forth during committee, actually, by um, a doctor who used to make different policies for different medical boards and, and hospital institutions. Uh, it, it's uh, interesting that with respect to standards of practice, most often those standards of practice are developed as a result of practice. And when you have a small group of individuals who are practicing in a particular area, it's harder to make standards of practice. And so if uh, Colorado were to take this time and to examine standards of practice across the country, I think that that would be a beneficial exercise to ensure that our standards of of practice are, um, uh, are solid since it would allow for a greater pool of practitioners to discern best practices. So thank you. Assistant Minority Leader Puglisi. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I do think that we should reconsider a task force just because of the problems that were raised about implementation of this bill. Um, there's a lot of um, problematic provisions and I think a task force and giving some more time to explore how what implementation would look like makes a lot of sense. So I support the amendment. Thank you. Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Speaker, my apologies. There's a lot of problems with this bill. When I talked to the tax people a couple weeks ago, their lament was that the Department of Revenue, now I haven't confirmed this with the Department of Revenue personally, I'll admit that, but the Department of Revenue can't even keep up with the tsunami of legislation that's com that comes out of this body. They don't know how to apply it. They don't know where to apply it. They don't know it's contradictory. Representative DeGraff, happy to give you some latitude, but do speak to the amendment. Thank, thank you, you. ma'am. So to, to this issue, we, we should probably know what's going on with this bill prior to putting it in motion. It seems like we're trying to fix a car while it's driving. We don't, we don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going to happen when we implement these things. Will there be consequences? Likely. Will they be unintended? Maybe. But there will be consequences. There's no way to avoid consequences. Not when you're forcing the market like this bill does. We are flying blind. That is not a good place to be. This task force would allow us some time to find out what's going on with the system. Because to pretend that the Colorado state system does not interact with all other 50 states is delusional. But we're going to go and we're going to, right in the middle of the country, we are going to put this in motion. So this would just allow us to form a task force for the purpose of compiling the laws of each state and the United States territories pertaining to legally protected health care activity I mean, we're talking about, in the previous amendment, we're talking about stripping medical professionals of their license. This is related. 
based on permitted healthcare activity, generally accepted standards of practice, and other laws of each state and the United States territories pertaining to the provision or assistance in the provision of a legally protected health care activity in the particular state or territory. Man, the legalese of that paragraph alone is tough. Let alone what's going to happen when this, event, this bill hits the road. Do we know what's going to happen when this bill hits the road? We know 100% what's going to happen. 100%. Wow. That is some high-level confidence, 100%. That is good to know. That means that I can be assured that every consequence that this bill has will be 100% intentional, is what my colleague is telling me from the, uh, from the floor. Form a task force for the purpose of compiling each law. I mean, if you have the compilation of each law already, if you have a compilation, if you've done, if this has been done, this task force will be done in five minutes. So you put this in, you say, the compilation of all of the state laws is complete. We have done our due diligence. We've asked your questions. We know it is. Here's the binder. Here's the three ring binder. It's got a clear plastic folder, so it's legit. And we put it into motion. We put it on the desk, because it's already been done, I'm told. So this should be an easy amendment, an easy give, because I'm told that it's already done. So I'll be surprised if anybody votes against this amendment, because I'm being told it's already been complied with. And if it hasn't been complied with, that, and just by the way, in the flying community, flying blind, never a good idea. It works, works great, right up until it doesn't. Then it fails catastrophically. That's this bill. So let's not fly blind. Let's get the task force. Let, let's just call for the task force and then the sponsors can lay the binder, probably about a six inch binder, I would assume, with all the laws that are compiled. They can put that right on the desk, put a stamp on it, we're good to go, right? I'm assured that's done. So you will vote, I'm sure everybody will wanna vote yes for this amendment, just to prove me wrong. Otherwise, I guess you're calling one of your colleagues out. So I, vote, I would recommend yes on this amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of the Bradfield Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? No. Representative Morrow votes no. Please close the machine. With 18 I, 40 no, and seven excuse, the amendment is lost. Mr. Schiebel, please read the Bradley Amendment to the Committee of the Whole report. Representative Bradley moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the committee not adopting the following Bradley Amendment, L37 to Senate Bill 188, to show that said amendment passed and that Senate Bill 188 as amended passed. Representative Bradley. I move the Bradley Amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole and ask that it be displayed. It is properly displayed. Yes. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I got it one, right for once. Um, this amendment is really important to me, especially after all of our debate yesterday, talking about off-label use and the many amounts of people that came up here to talk about the off-label use of progesterone when it comes to saving babies and the fact that we only get 72-hour time frame to do that. So... <laughs> It just seems very hypocritical to use off-label drugs when it comes to gender-affirming care, but not to use off-label drugs when it comes to saving the life of a baby. How do you explain that to your constituents? How do you explain, and most people polled don't even believe in gender-affirming care. How do we explain that to our constituents that will let off-label drug use be used for gender affirming care, but we will not let it be used to save the life of a baby. 
think that's something we should think about when we talk to the community and the people of Colorado. Dr. Andre Van Mol, Director of Family Medicine, what are the ethics of permanently medicalizing a condition in a child that overwhelmingly desists, overwhelmingly goes away by adulthood, and doing it on the basis of self-diagnosis? That's not how medicine works. Puberty blockers. In gender-affirming care, the child or the adolescent makes a self-diagnosis, which is largely unquestioned by medical professionals. Medical professionals affirm the gender subjectively chosen by the minor patient. Lupron is the most common puberty blocker, and I'll tell you, for in vitro, I was on that, that is a hardcore drug right there. So much that my husband was scared for me to get pregnant because I was so psychologically unstable. And I mean that. Unstable, taking that drug. Is FDA approved for the treatment of prostate cancer in men? It works by reducing testosterone levels. Its use as a puberty blocker is off-label. Its benefits for women and children are a matter of debate. Lupron has hormone suppressing effects. It reduces testosterone in men and reduces estrogen in women. Lupron suppresses, blocks the physical changes of puberty in prepubescent females and prepubescent males. Lupron has been used to treat the rare condition of precocious puberty, which is puberty that begins too early, generally considered under age eight for girls and under age nine for boys. Puberty is temporarily put on hold until an appropriate age is reached. Children with precocious puberty have abnormally high hormone levels, and Lupron is used temporarily to treat this medical condition. Once an appropriate age for pubescent development is reached, Lupron is stopped, and the child can experience age-appropriate puberty. Lupron's generalized use with tens of thousands of healthy, normally developing adolescents is a novel application. There is debate within the medical community of the wisdom of generalizing from the outcomes observed in a tiny population of individuals. And we talked about that yesterday, how important systematic reviews and studies are. Not in four women, like we heard being talked about, 754 women. Affected by abnormal hormone levels to thousands of individuals with normal hormone levels, Lupron has been used in the past to chemically castrate pedophiles. I'll say that again. Lupron has been used to chemically castrate pedophiles. According to the FDA, 6,379 people died between 2013 and 2019 after taking the hormone blocker Lupron. There were also 41,213 adverse events and 25,645 serious reactions reported. Researchers and endocrinologists have found that puberty blockers, including Lupron, arrest bone growth, decrease bone accretion, prevent the sex steroid dependent organization and maturation of the adolescent brain, thereby hampering cognitive development, inhibit fertility and produce a myriad of deliterate emotional effects. Lupron's manufacturer, Abby V, has been fighting lawsuits over the drug for years. A growing body of researchers and practitioners no longer believe that the effects of Lupron use are irreversible. Dr. Quentin Van Meter, pediatric endocrinologist. Puberty blockers are drugs that specifically short circuit pituitary signaling to the ovaries and testicles, essentially stopping the physiology of puberty, which is a very necessary part of human development. The hormones of puberty are very necessary for brain development, bone development, and obviously the physical development of the child. Puberty blockers are an open experiment without any controls and without any assessment of what this will do to the child 10, 20, and 30 years from now. They are just going ahead because they believe it's their belief, not the science, and this is the right thing to do for a transgender child. There is no other medical condition that I know of where a child gets to dictate their medical treatment based on their personal opinion. There just is not. Dr. Paul Haruz, endocrinologist, we really have no real long-term data in using this intervention in children. What we do have are short-term studies that have very serious weaknesses and limitations. It is expected that the outcome is to result in lifelong sterility. So you are taking away a child's fertility at an age where they really don't have an understanding of what they are giving up. Puberty is a very important time for accruing bone density, and if that's interrupted, the children are going to be at risk of osteoporosis and fractures later in life. And the question that needs to be asked 
is if this turns out not to be a good approach, how many children are going to be harmed? Dr. Patrick Lappert, plastic and reconstructive surgeon. A child, a pre-adolescent child, is making the diagnosis, and there is nothing I can do to prove or disprove it. And within a year or so, they are falling behind their peers. They are not growing skeletally. They are not maturing intellectually. And now they can look at themselves and go, wow, I really don't look like everyone else. There is something wrong with my body. Dr. Michelle Cretella, pediatrician, executive director, American College of Pediatricians. It is incredible, unethical to expect that a teenager or younger has the cognitive ability to consent to drugs and procedures that could wipe out their fertility and put them at risk for deadly diseases in the long term. This is a massive social and medical experiment that is completely unregulated, and it's also not fully consented. It is a massive breach of medical ethics. Dr. Andre Van Mol, Dr. Family Medicine. The Lupron package insert, the primary puberty blocker, which says right on under adverse reactions, worsened depression, rare cases of increased of suicidal and suicide attempts. Dr. Michael Laidlaw, Doctor of Internal Medicine and Endocrinologist. How young are these being given? As young as eight or nine years old, adverse effects include emotional lability, mood changes, headaches, nervousness, anxiety, agitation, confusion, delusions, insomnia, and depression. Instructions recommend to monitor for development or worsening of psychiatric symptoms and to use with caution in patients with a history of psychiatric illness. Patients who have a history of depression should be carefully observed during treatment. Does that sound safe to anyone in here? These are children. Dr. Stephen Levine, psychiatrist and professor, Case Western. Individuals in whom puberty is delayed multiple years are likely to suffer negative psychosocial and self-confidence effects as they stand on the sidelines while their peers undergo puberty changes. If you block a kid's puberty for three, four years, he remains looking like a child and feeling like a child while his peers are into a, different, a whole different phase. Anyone claiming that they are completely reversible, which we had plenty of testimony, one from Planned Parenthood, say that they are, doesn't seem to have the data. In fact, controlled studies have not been done and how completely this is true and when they are used to prevent puberty from occurring at its natural time because hormones associated with puberty are well known to affect the development of the brain as well as the body. Cross-sex hormones. Following puberty blockers or in cases where adolescents have already undergone natural puberty, the next step is to begin cross-sex hormones. So for a girl who wants to transition to male, that would be lifelong testosterone. And for a male who wants to be female, it involves lifelong estrogen. Again, use of such hormones in transgender individuals is off-label and is not approved by the FDA. Cross-sex hormones, off-label use. The effects of cross-sex hormones are accepted as being irreversible. Adverse effects. Representative Bradley, you have one minute Thank remaining. you, Madam Chair. For biologic females and testosterone, severe liver dysfunction, high blood pressure, increased risk of different cancers like breast, uterine, and ovarian. For biological males on estrogen, five times the risk of thromboembolism, strokes, heart problems, infertility, gallstones, high triglycerides, and breast cancer. I could go on and on. There's a lot of documentation. I just, I asked this member, these members, is this safe for our children? I know you're looking for a solution to help these kids, but we're not seeing the long-term effects of these off-label drugs that we are going to let our children use. And they're trusting us to make laws. And if we're making laws that harm them, you'll have to look at your own self in the mirror. Thank you. Representative Bottoms. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So I, I'm glad I get to finish at least another little part of what I was talking about earlier on this amendment. Um, I didn't get time to finish what I was saying last time, so thank you for this opportunity. Uh, the the um, article by Brian Lupo starts out by saying we were wrong. Evidence shows puberty blockers are neither safe nor reversible. Says a Canadian doctor who helped pioneer puberty blocker drugs. And again, I, I've said this, I would say at least two or three times. All we're trying to do is take a tiny little slice here and say, let's make this 
let's make these drugs FDA approved. We're, we're not saying don't take drugs. Uh, we're not saying shut the whole bill down, at least in this amendment. I'm saying I want to do that, but that's not what this amendment says. This amendment says that we are, that we're just wanting to make these drugs FDA approved. And so Dr. Susan Bradley, who helped pioneer gender affirming care in Canada, has now spoken, she started this in Canada, she helped the pioneer of this, and she helped pioneer puberty blockers, which um, representative just pre previously up here talked a lot about some of these uh, by name. And uh, Dr. Susan Bradley is actually the person who helped pioneer these drugs. So Dr. Susan Bradley, who helped pioneer gender-affirming care in Canada, has now spoken against the popular model of gender-affirming care by placing children on puberty blockers, according to an interview with the Daily Caller. Dr. Bradley founded the, chair, the Child and Adolescent Gender Identity Clinic. This is not somebody that spent her whole life against um, puberty blockers. This is not somebody that spent her whole life against these type of uh, drugs. She's, she's the one who helped make them. She's the one who helped create them. And she founded in the, in the, the strongest institute in Canada on this, a child and adolescent gender identity clinic in Toronto, Canada in 1975. Again, this is, this is a long time ago. This is not brand new information. and began to issue puberty blockers to children around the early 2000s. Prior to the medication, she used more traditional forms of therapy, such as talking with her patients. In her interview with the Daily Caller, Dr. Bradley stated in regards to the puberty blocker medication, her first words, we were wrong. As, from, from my perspective, I see that too. We're wrong in this whole thing, and we're wrong right now. We're wrong doing this right now. Again, I think the whole bill is wrong. That's what she's also saying. Um, this whole concept is wrong. But all we're saying is just vote for this amendment. The, the amendment just makes drugs that we're going to use, just makes us say they have to be FDA approved. She said, we were wrong. They're not as reversible, reversible as we always thought. And they have long-term effects on kids' growth and development. And, and we understand, that, again, a previous representative just, just said, this is not just physical. This is, um, this is physiological. Uh, this is uh, mental health. And again, I believe it's also spiritual. They're not as reversible as we always thought, and they have long, longer-term effects on kids' growth and development, including making them sterile, and quite a number of things affecting their bone growth. And I, and I, think, I think the previous representative went over this quite a bit on the bone growth, so I won't necessarily spend a lot of time on that. We thought it was relatively safe, and endocrinologists said they're reversible. We didn't have to worry about it. Everybody's good. No problem. I had this skepticism in the back of my mind all the time that maybe we were actually colluding and not helping them. And I think that's proven correct in that once these kids get started at any, at, at any age on puberty blockers, nearly all of them continue to want to go to cross-sex hormones. This is, this is pushing them, this is funneling them into a direction. Despite the recent push to affirm children's gender identity by use of puberty blockers, the safety of sex drugs is, is relatively unknown. Now this is the this is the doctor that helped design them and has been has been doing this since 1975, but specifically started giving um, children puberty blockers in the early 2000s. And uh, she is saying that the, that the safety of such drugs is relatively unknown. Well, if the if the the creator of the drug doesn't know the the safety of this, it, it's kind of hubris to assume that somebody else does way better than her. And, uh, and, and our answer to this in Colorado is, well, let's just give them the drugs. Don't test them or anything. Just give them the drugs. It doesn't matter. They don't have to, 
They don't have to be that safe. I mean, they could be safe. They could not be safe. We don't know because they're not approved. Now, again, you could take the same argument from yesterday and just apply it verbatim into this, and it would still work. You would, you would, you would argue our case out for this. Despite the recent push to affirm uh, children's gender identity by use of puberty blockers, the safety of drugs, such drugs is relatively unknown. According to the Dornbecker Children's Hospital, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved puberty blockers in 1993. So if the FDA has approved puberty blockers in 1993, let's just use those. They've been around a long time. Let's just use those. That's... That's what this children's hospital is saying. Let's use these. But there's more to it. They were originally approved to temporarily stop puberty in children who were going through it too early. Not to stop it all the way around. That's too dangerous. It's been proven it is too dangerous. Researchers have not finished studying how safe puberty blockers are in the long term. So there might be some risk that doctors do not yet know about. Dr. Bradley participated in the largest sample to date of boys' clinic referred for gender dysphoria with regard to gender identity and sexual orientation. The largest sample to date, with the most recent follow-up in March 2021. A study found that 87% of male participants assessed at mean age of 20.58 years were deemed desisters. A parallel study of girls showed similar results. Only three out of the 25 participants were judged to have gender dysphoria at the mean age of 23.24 years. Now, our answer to this in Colorado is, well, it doesn't matter what drugs we use. Now, and we, just, we just showed that the FDA has had puberty blockers since 1993. Why wouldn't we just slide that into the bill and say, yeah, we recognize that? We recognize that. It doesn't change the bill. FDA approves it. Slide it in there. We're good to go. <clears throat> in an interview, Dr. Bradley conceded, these kids are not fairly well with the current affirmative approach. They're not faring well with the current affirmative approach. I don't know that any kids actually could, given the capacity of a 10 or 12 or even 14 or 15-year-old to understand the complexity of the decision that they're making on their long-term sexual and life function. It just doesn't make sense. Blocking the sexual development of children is a highly authoritarian intervention. Children are asexual, and so they can't understand the impact of impaired sexual function. We are roughly 10 years... Representative Bottoms, you have one minute remaining. Thank you. We're roughly 10 years into this large-scale experiment, and already we have reports on issues with cognitive development, bone mineral density, and fertility. All the up-to-date evidence shows that puberty blockers are neither safe nor reversible. Despite Dr. Bradley's long-term study suggesting that children eventually grow out of their gender dysphoria, there's still a widespread push to start children on puberty blockers at a young age. In the case of social media influence, Chloe Cole, 18, she was told that gender dysphoria would never remove itself by doctors. The Gateway Pundit reported on a lawsuit filed by Harmlet Dillon's law group, the Center for American Liberty, on Cole's behalf. Thank you very much. Representative Titone. I urge a no vote on this amendment. It will take away all the gender-affirming drugs for everybody. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the Bradley Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? No. Representative Morrow votes no. Representative Judah is excused. Uh, please close the machine. With 18 aye, 42 no, and five excused, the amendment is lost. Mr. Schiebel, please read the first Evans Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. 
Representative Evans moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the committee in not adopting the following Evans Amendment, L31 to Senate Bill 188, to show that said amendment passed and that Senate Bill 188 is amended passed. Representative Evans. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the first Evans Amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole and ask for it to be displayed. One moment, Representative Evans. It is properly displayed. Please proceed. Oop. No. My apologies. Now it is displayed. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So as we discussed earlier, this amendment addresses the fact that when you've got law enforcement officers and non-lawyers who are reading these laws, um, as I have, at 2 in the morning without ready access to a lawyer, it's helpful to be able to highlight key components of that law. So as we've heard from the sponsors, uh, this law is not designed to interfere with any of these criminal investigations. All this amendment does is specifically call out some of those key criminal investigations that sometimes overlap and occur in this same space. I would ask for an I vote on this amendment because that provides the clarity to folks who are working um, to interpret and understand these laws that might not have ready access to an attorney and it protects those folks uh, in our community who are most vulnerable in their pursuit of getting justice for their situation. I ask for an I vote. Representative Titone. I ask for a no vote. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of the first Evans Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? No. Representative Morrow votes no. Representatives DeGraff, Frizzell, McCormick, Soper, Taggart, Vihill. Representative Taggart is excused. Please close the machine. With 17 aye, 42 no, and six excused, the first Evans Amendment is lost. Mr. Schiebel, please read the second Evans Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Representative Evans moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole Service section taken by the Committee not adopting the following Evans Amendment, L32 to Senate Bill 188, to show that said amendment passed and that Senate Bill 188 as amended passed. Representative Evans. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the second Evans Amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole and ask for it to be displayed. The amendment is properly displayed. Please proceed. Thank you. Again, as discussed, there's a lot of overlap in the area of health care providers, especially health care providers that are treating folks that are crossing state lines and those uh, folks that are uh, engaging in human trafficking. And so, again, ensuring that we are providing clarity in the law and ensuring that uh, victims of human trafficking have a specific call out in this law to ensure that in those areas of subpoenas, summonses, uh, things of those nature, if these situations arise, uh, individuals who will be investigating these situations um, have that specific clarity in the law that yes, the law is not intending uh, to erect any sort of barriers to the pursuit of those investigations. This just provides that specific awareness and call out um, in accordance with, as we talked about, uh, up to and including the White House um, plan on combating uh, human trafficking. So for these reasons, I ask for an I vote on this amendment. Representative Holtorf. Madam Speaker, members of this esteemed chamber, this amendment is really important. And I'm going to explain why. <clears throat> right now, human trafficking is going on all the way down from Juarez, 
all the way up here to Denver and on north down the I-25 corridor. <clears throat> Young people are being exploited, sexually exploited in human trafficking in many cases. Now this particular amendment, which I'm going to ask the uh, bill sponsor and amendment sponsor to bring to me, if you could bring me a copy of that. I want to point out why this is so important. Particularly, let's say in Texas, you work in a, uh, let's say, let's say you work for the Sinaloa cartel, un narcotraficante que está moviendo la gente al norte para ganar dinero. Para llevar la droga y también ganar dinero. Y también usando las prostitutas jóvenes en su empresa. Now I'm going to translate that for you because it's important. The narco trafficking cartels will not only move their drugs, they'll move people. They'll also exploit young people, including women, up north for their business enterprises. But now, we, because we're creating this safe space, let's say a young person who is a slave to the sex trafficking industry gets pregnant. Or let's say they see, need some of this reproductive health equity. Where are they going to come? Where will their handler bring them? Because everybody knows if you're sex trafficking and you have a person, it can be a young man, young woman, older man, older woman. We've seen this for those of us that have been around the world in, very, in our military assignments, the exploitation of, of prostitutes. In fact, there's General Order 1 that says you will not engage in those activities under punishment of UCMJ. We have a JAG right here. Representative Holtorf, back to the amendment, please. Thank you. This particular bill, with this language, without this amendment, ladies and gentlemen, opens that door so those people can be exploited and that young person that's being prostituted can come up here, get an abortion, and put right back into service wherever they're going back to in a timely manner. <clears throat> Many of those young people, and it can be boys and girls, because this goes both ways. This gate swings both ways. They are kept enslaved by the drugs that keep them addicted. And this is common knowledge. So let's have an adult conversation. When you're talking about human trafficking, the one person here that's smart enough to bring this amendment and understand it is to my right. And he knows why. He's been in law enforcement. He's probably seen these things closer than any of us. And here we are. He's asking for a few amendments because of his law enforcement experience that will protect young people that are being exploited sexually, boys and girls. But we're going to say no. We're going to let that happen. So even the criminal element of society will now be able to exploit Colorado Revised Statute as is being promoted today to continue their nefarious enterprise and potentially human traffic young people who are stuck in a cycle of sexual slavery and violence and abuse and misuse. But this amendment would make sure that they couldn't get away with it, as I understand it. Maybe I don't understand the amendment, Madam Speaker. Maybe I don't understand the amendment. But I think I understand it. I'm going to read it again just to make sure. This section does not apply to court proceedings involving a human trafficking related offense as described in the section 18-3-503.
Then on page 16, after line 23, this subsection does not apply to search and warrants issued in connection with a human trafficking-related offense. Because if they get a tip that somebody's doing this, and if you don't think the cartels aren't here, huh, they're here. We got them in my district. Phillips County. They had to do a takedown of a cartel ring in, my own in one of my counties in my district. Out in the middle of nowhere. Just farm communities. And they're out there. What are they doing out there? Oh, let's see. They're peddling fentanyl, which we've allowed to be decriminalized and have those charges step down. Representative we've allowed Poltorf, back to the amendment, please. Thank you. Thank you. We've allowed them to traffic people, undocumented workers, and or many young people who are victims of sexual abuse. Now it's mainly ladies, which is the father of five daughters makes my heart cry. But it's not just ladies either. You see, it's boys too. I saw that firsthand when I served in the Republic of Korea. We had an increase in sexual assaults in the military, a huge statistical increase, which was man on man. We had a significant problem over there, and it's here too. Representative Holtorf, back yes, to the amendment. With respect to human trafficking that's happening right here in this state right now. Between Ciudad Juarez, New Mexico, Arizona, and Colorado, human trafficking is alive and well. And sexual exploitation has been alive and well for many years. This particular amendment addresses the human trafficking element. And at least within law enforcement and the judicial system, some action can be taken. If you think I'm up just here to waste time, you're wrong, ladies and gentlemen. I've seen this. You can smile all you want. I've seen people drugged up, young women so drugged up and sexually exploited as prostitutes, it's not even funny. And it's sad. And it's happening. And this particular bill with its language, without an amendment like this, indirectly will promote what I speak of across state lines into Colorado. Now, as soon as they use this reproductive care, this health care, this life-saving care that people in this chamber are promoting, guess where those people get to go back to? I'm not going to say the word, Madam Speaker, because it's so offensive. Representative Holtorf, you I have said I wasn't one, say it, one minute remaining. Oh, thank you. Because I wasn't going to say it. But it's so offensive where these people have to go to be forced to do what they do. But with this, a particular amendment right here, Representative Evans, one of very few people who has true law enforcement experience, who brings amendments like this from the heart, these aren't light. He is so thoughtful. He is so careful. I have so much respect for him for what he does and how he thinks about the law enforcement element, which continues to get eroded in this state by other legislation. With this amendment, you can help law enforcement and you can help the judicial system help slow down and maybe address the human trafficking element that is in Polkart, this amendment. your time has expired. Representative DeGraff. This section does not apply to court proceedings involving human trafficking related offenses as described in section 18-3-503. Yep, 
in the military were warned about this. Stay away from it. It's good. It's all over the place. It's all over the world. It's here. I don't know why anybody would assume that this bill had all of the stop gaps. But when you have somebody from law enforcement come in and provide their expert opinion, something that does not change the bill at all, but does provide a better means of protecting exploited. We get this kind of train. We get we get these notifications even for the airlines. You, if you don't think it's if you don't think it's bold and brash, they traffic people on the airlines. They'll put they'll walk them through security. They'll put them on the plane. They'll fly them across the country. Yet here's something that law enforcement is saying from the law enforcement side. Please repair this little hole. There's a consequence. It's a potential consequence. There is a consequence in the, in the bill as written. And you can patch it, maybe only partially, You can at least put a little patch on it by slapping this amendment right on it. At least it's a step. Step in the right direction. Doesn't change a thing. Just dealing with human offense, human, human traffic, trafficking related offense does not apply to the order in connection with human trafficking. It just allows better means for those people that are trapped in the exploitation per law enforcement to close that gap. I just don't understand why it would be resisted. Thank you. Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to ask for a no vote on this amendment. I don't think there's a single member of this chamber that does not condemn human trafficking and that does not want to make sure we have every tool that is possibly available to crack down on human trafficking. But there is nothing in this bill that would prohibit law enforcement from going after this. And just quoting from the bill in the section that we're looking at here, this section does not prohibit the investigation of criminal activity Human trafficking is criminal activity. This is already covered by the bill. Please vote no. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of the second Evans Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? No. Representative Morrow votes no. Representative McLaughlin is excused. Please close the machine. With 18 aye, 41 no, and six excused, the amendment is lost. Mr. Schiebel, please read the third Evans Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Representative Evans moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole Service Section taken by the Committee not, adop not adopting the following Evans Amendment, L33 to Senate Bill 188, to show that said amendment passed, that Senate Bill 188 as amended passed. Representative Evans. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the third Evans Amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole and ask for it to be displayed. It is properly, whoop, it is now properly displayed. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So as we've discussed at length, it's really fantastic when you have attorneys that are able to sit down and go over these bills at length and explain how to apply them. But we are writing these pieces of legislation for lots of individuals who will be reading them 
who are not attorneys. I've been that person. I've been the individual that's trying to figure out what in the world am I going to do with an out-of-state warrant, and that when that comes in, it's on a weekend, it's at a night, it's at a time where I don't have ready access to an attorney. And so my concern with all of this is given that there is a documented history of overlap between reproductive health care, domestic violence, um, human trafficking, and now to this amendment here, child abuse, I want to make sure that we are drawing specific awareness and attention to this facts so that when you have law enforcement officers who are trying to muddle their way through the law and figure out how to apply this, if there are situations where there are out-of-state investigations in which there is both some sort of suspected criminal activity, but there is also a nexus to a reproductive health care center that those individuals, those non-lawyers who are having to read and figure out this law for themselves as I have done on weekends, on nights, where there is not an attorney, have these specific call outs to raise awareness to the fact that these behaviors are something that is expressly um, excluded from the prohibition in the bill. So for these reasons, for that, that desire to raise awareness and to make completely clear exactly what the, the good Speaker Pro Tem had said, that yes, this is not looking to infringe upon any investigations into criminal matters, I would ask for an aye vote on this amendment. Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I appreciate where my colleague is coming from, but I would argue that this is still covered by the bill and only adds confusion by adding this language, so please vote no. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the third Evans Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? No. Representative Morrow votes no. Representative McLaughlin, please vote. Oop. Representative Armagost is excused. With 17, oh, please close the machine. With 17 I, 42 no, and six excused, the third Evans Amendment is lost. Mr. Schiebel, please read the Luck Amendment to the Committee of the Whole report. Representative Luck moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the committee in adopting the following Frelick Amendment L29 to Senate Bill 188 to show that said amendment lost and that Senate Bill 188 passed. Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the Luck Amendment to the Committee of the Whole and ask that it be displayed, which it is. It is properly displayed. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So this was hearkening back to the first part of the conversation we had today about changing the definition of reproductive health care to include gender affirming health care services in order that we might avoid a title challenge or have to strike sections of this bill. I am bringing this forth for, consider, for reconsideration, um, not only because of what was brought forth during the earlier dialogue, but also because as you scroll through or, or um, move through this bill in hard copy, if, if that's the copy you're looking at, you will note that there are a variety of sections where the bill distinguishes between gender-affirming health care services, reproductive health care, and other legally protected health care activity. Um, this is providing confusion within the law now because what we are saying is that the definition includes gender-affirming care, and then we have separate sections in this that also are referencing gender affirming health care. So what is the distinction? What is the distinction as we lay these out between those portions that are protected under reproductive health care and those portions that are protected under gender affirming health care services? Uh, what is that distinction? And so um, I am asking that we, we alter and go back to the original language 
um, and striking that. We did have a conversation offline where I explained um, that my understanding of reproductive health care does not include gender affirming health care. That reproductive health care talks about the process of reproduction, right? Fertility services, abortion, adoption, those kinds of things. Those all fall within the gamut of reproductive health care. Gender affirming health care, however, is a markedly different concept. It's a markedly different range of, of services. And so um, it is important that we are clear with these definitions. It's important that we provide understanding and that we're not just willy-nilly with our language. And so I ask for an aye vote. Thank you. Representative Titone. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I ask for a no vote. Uh, we need this amendment to conform with the title of the bill. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of the Luck Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? No. Representative Morrow votes no. Representative Wilford. Please close the machine. With 18 I, 41 no, and six excused, the luck amendment is lost. Mr. Schiebel, please read the first Puglisi amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Representative Puglisi moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to show that the Lynch motion to re-refer Senate Bill 188 to the Judiciary Committee did pass and that Senate Bill 188 was re-referred to the Judiciary Committee. Assistant Minority Leader Puglisi. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm bringing this forward. You know, uh, we raised some constitutional questions regarding the title, um, that it did not fit under single subject. Um, the Drafters agreed there was an amendment that was brought forward today um, that may or may not make it constitutional. Obviously, um, the drafters think it does. Um, we still have some questions. We do think there's some work that still needs to be done. We brought forward some implementation problems today um, and some serious inquiries about how this is going to move forward. Um, and I think that it will warrant further review and discussion. We should take our time and make sure we're doing it right. Um, and with that, I uh, respectfully would ask for an I vote on this motion. Thank you. Um, I move the first Puglisi amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole and ask that it be displayed. And this one was to show that um, to refer this back to the ju Judiciary Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Taggart. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of the first Puglisi Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? No. Representative Morrow votes no. Representatives Garcia, Hamrick, and Joseph, please vote. Please close the machine. With 18 aye, 41 no, and six excuse, the first Puglisi amendment is lost. Mr. Schiebel, please read the second Puglisi Amendment. 
Representative Puglisi moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the committee in not adopting the following Puglisi Amendment L30 to Senate Bill 188 to show that said amendment passed and that Senate Bill 188 is amended passed. Assistant Minority Leader Puglisi. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the second Puglisi Amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole and ask that it be displayed. It is properly displayed. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time talking about what implementation of that provision um, regarding local governments would be like from a real perspective by a real county attorney who really has to implement this. And it will be problematic. I also think, honestly, that this is a weird bill to usurp local government control for municipalities and counties. I just, I don't understand why it's in this bill. I don't understand how it accomplishes what the bill sponsors are trying to do. Um, and by making local government land use a matter of statewide um, concern, there's some real serious implications to that that, I, I, I just don't know if this body truly understands what this is going to mean and what it's going to do to counties and municipalities across the state. I sincerely ask you to think about it. Um, I'm telling you this is going to be incredibly difficult to implement. There are a lot of problems with that provision. It is not needed in this bill. And um, I, I don't, I just, I really want to impart the sentiment that we are opening a door and a very slippery slope that we really shouldn't be opening. Um, taking away local government land use authority is, we shouldn't be doing it. And so um, I really, um, we've got a lot of local government officials here who have implemented land use and how important it is to our communities. We engage in incredibly public processes. They are long, lengthy processes. They take a lot of time and consideration. And I just, I want you to think very seriously about what this will do to those communities without truly taking the time that we need to um, implement good policy in our counties and our municipalities. So I implore you to please think about this section again. Um, and I ask for an I vote. Thank you. Representative Frizzell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. You know, uh, I too rise in support of this amendment that the good representative from Colorado Springs brought forward. I find sections 26 and 27 particularly problematic for local governments, for the state. And it's particularly problematic because I forgot to make, bring my glasses down and I can't see very well. But I'm going to muddle through. Um, now, now, now. Specifically, Section 26 refers to the powers of local government as defined and sets forth some language. Oh my gosh, it's like my knight in shining armor. Oh, thanks. I know you all are so happy. <laughs> uh, oh, I am anyway. So it really speaks to limiting, um, first of all, it makes, makes a matter of statewide concern zoning and other land use planning and specifies facilities and, and all sorts of other information, but it really raises, to, raises the bar on what land use and zoning um, should be, I think, overseen by the state. But then, in section C, it says, nothing in this subsection 1G2 restricts or supersedes the authority of a local government to enact uniform zoning ordinances and other land use regulations that comply with this subsection 1G2. I am so confused. Color me confused because I don't understand why you would have in statute provisions that raise zoning and planning, land use planning, to a matter of statewide concern, which implies to my simple mind that they are 
creating a precedent of oversight, of superseding local government control. But then they say, not really. Nothing in this subsection restricts or supersedes the authority of a local government to enact uniform zoning ordinance and other land use regulations. So which is it? I think that this particular section is confusing. And again, um, you know, I, there are those far smarter than me who perhaps will speak to this matter after I um, am done and put my glasses down. Um, but the same thing is true with Section 27, which is really more addressing public welfare. So Section 26 is talking about the powers of local government, and then Section 27 speaks to public welfare. And it's really essentially the same type of verbiage where it's creating a precedent where this is a matter of statewide concern for purposes of zoning and other land use planning. And highlights facility use and how they are to be classified by a local government entity on behalf of, for, for the purposes of public welfare. So again, I'm very confused. I'm super confused because then there is this subsection C that says, oh, never mind, nothing in this subsection restricts or supersedes the authority of a local government to enact uniform zoning ordinances and other land use regulations that comply with this subsection. So I apologize for being so... Um, incapable of understanding this very complex topic and this very complex bill, but I feel, I feel that this bill, and Madam Speaker, I ask for your indulgence, not speaking specifically to this amendment, but from a larger, from, from a higher level, this bill talks about a lot of different things. A lot of different things. It's incredibly complex, actually. Everything from land use to law enforcement to courts. I, I really do think that the state needs to stay out of local control, because it is local control after all. And I ask for an I vote on this amendment and will hopefully be better informed after some of my colleagues from municipalities with municipal experience have had a couple of minutes to inform us. Thank you. I vote. Representative Taggart. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I too rise in support of this amendment. As a former mayor and city council member, local control is absolutely critical. And when this body starts to put in legislation that supersedes local control, it's problematic. And it sets a very dangerous precedent if this goes through that for any bill or for any legislation, we can say basically, except for, when does it stop? If you go back into the um, definitions here, which show up on section 27, it says such facilities fall within the meaning of medical office use. Well, we have zoning at a local level for medical office use. So why do we need this? If it fits within medical office use, for goodness sakes, it's already there. What are we doing? It's unnecessary. We don't need 26 and 27, and we do not need to supersede local control. 
We also have to be aware that there is a difference in local control between cities and counties. For this, the Assistant Minority Leader was very passionate to say, this will be very confusing to small counties. We need to listen to her. We can't ignore that particular situation and how confusing that can be. I just don't understand the need for 26, sections 26 and 27, especially when we already say such facilities fall within the meeting, meaning of medical office use. We also have to take into account we have overlays within our communities. In the city of Grand Junction, we have overlays for the purpose of business districts, and we have two of those. We have overlays for the purpose of the historical part of the city. We have a very critical overlay as it relates to our regional airport with the FAA. Those are hard enough to manage, much less us as a legislative body saying, oh, we're not gonna supersede your powers, but here we go, we just did supersede your power. It makes no sense to me, thank you. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, myself as a former mayor, reading this section, these two sections, is, is entertaining because at one point it's telling us that each local government with its respective jurisdiction has the authority to plan and to regulate the uses of land. Now, different communities are set up different ways. Some are home rules, some are statute. So within, in this section, it says within the meeting of a medical use, medical clinic use, a medical health care use, and other facilities, I believe my community has about six more of those same types of uses that we classify different things under. So are we having to classify it under this or do we happen to classify it under one of our other ones? We get down to topics even below those topics that would define exactly where something like reproductive health care would fall. Um, this could go on and as, as the ones before me mentioned, it's confusing, we have overlays, we have other, other things that we, we address, and I would ask you for a yes vote on this amendment. Representative Winter. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I also urge a yes vote on this. You've heard from the good rep from El Paso County, and she is an attorney for one of the small counties in the state, and it's a county within my district. And if she has a concern about this, and that concern is very serious, well, that perks up my ears, and then that means I have a concern about this. I represent the largest house district in this chamber, and many of the counties in my district are frontier counties. With limited staff and resources, how is this going to affect policy? How is this going to affect their budget? Why should they shoulder the burden of this? This is a place in this bill where we can get together. There's, there's actual concern here. And this is one thing that we can work on that isn't affecting any other portion of this bill that you're standing so strong on. This is something that rural Colorado is looking at you and saying, we take issue with this. Stop, take a look at this, and hear those concerns. This is coming from an attorney that represents one of the counties in my district. My other colleague from Akron always talks about the rural-urban divide. And these are the little things that my constituents see that doesn't close that gap, but widens that gap. Because their voice isn't being heard on small issues like this with inside of a bill. So I urge a yes vote. Please think about this. Representative Froelich. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you for uh, ensuring that we have a thorough long discussion on all of these uh, items. We are simply saying, and this is true for the whole bill, we reflect the status quo. So if you have a designation for land use already in place, 
um, and that's what sections A and B talk about. You cannot discriminate against gender affirming care or reproductive health clinics under the definition in this bill. That means these are legally protected health care services, and a municipality or a county can't discriminate against those facilities any, any more than they can discriminate against any other legally prescribed activity. I urge a no vote. Representative Taggart, it was a tie. We'll get you next, Representative Wilson. Representative Taggart, this is your second time to speak, and you have seven minutes, eight seconds remaining. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is not status quo. And this is not a section that, dis that under any circumstances talks about the decision making of whether a city or a county is going to accept one of these facilities, which by the way, we do have one in Grand Junction. That's not what it is. It is for the purpose of superseding our zoning laws. And I don't know how we can stand in front of this legislative body and say that's status quo. We're asking as a body to supersede local control. And that's not right. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This, again, entertaining. We, we do not have, as a municipality or as a county, the right to pick and choose um, what facilities are allowed in our communities, especially if you're a ta statutory community. So again, this means nothing because we can zone it down to a specific area that's maybe unappealing if we wanted to do that, or we could zone it to the most popular area of town. We could zone it in any of these categories how we want. So this, again, does not make sense. I don't know why it's difficult to see that. But I ask again for a yes vote to this amendment. Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm going to throw a pretty, just a wrench in this whole conversation because um, when we were discussing House Bill 22-1279, which is uh, known as RIA, we actually had a conversation, if I recall, about zoning and about how the prohibitions in RIA um, don't allow for any zoning at all around this space. It was my understanding that anyone could open up an abortion clinic wherever they wanted to because a public entity shall not deny, restrict, interfere with, or discriminate against an individual's fundamental right, blah, 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 in the regulation or provision of benefits, facilities, services, or information. And so I am confused. Are we, is it a fundamental right that is absolute, as was discussed in March of 2022? Or is it something that we can actually legislate around and, and actually put in regulations around because that's what this bill does. And so I'm just curious as to how these two things interact um, in, in light of this, this fundamental right that Colorado made last year. Representative Froelich, this is your second time to speak. I'll be brief. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, folks, this whole section was developed with local governments in a stakeholding process. They asked for this language. I asked for a no vote. Assistant, Assistant Minority Leader Puglisi, this is your second time to speak. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'll be brief as well. Um, I kind of take a little bit of offense at the thought that I would advise my clients to discriminate against any entity, um, because I don't do that, um, and I would never do that. And we already have provisions in our regulations that do not allow discrimination. Um, that is the regulations that we have in place, which you, people would know if they looked at the regulations we already have in place. So um, it takes a long time to draft regulations. It takes a long time to go through public processes. You have a safety clause on here, which does not give county attorneys the amount of time. And while you may have spoken to some local governments, I'm, I'm not sure how that stakeholder process was engaged. 
I know I wasn't engaged, and I'm actually someone who's going to have to implement this law once it's put into law. So um, I have some perspectives that um, I think, as a person who has to implement this, should be considered. And it, I don't know how much stronger I can say it. Um, this is not necessary to the intent of the bill and where the sponsors want to go, but the havoc it will create, especially on small rural governments across the state, is going to be immeasurable. And so I'm, I'm begging you to reconsider and just not put this pressure on county attorneys from across the state to have to figure out how to implement this. Thank you. Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Going back to this archaic document, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States. So if you, if you look at how we're supposed to run our government, the state is supposed to be serving the people of the county. Of the, it's supposed to be supporting the local municipalities. The local municipalities serve the people, and that is, in, and that is for the purpose of securing their rights. This, this type of state overreach seems to flip that upside down more in another category. Not that we don't do that on a regular basis, but I don't know if we're going to... No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States. The citizens, they run their own counties and communities. The state is supposed to support that instead of dictate to it, and we are quickly turning this into a uh, more of a feudal monarchy than a, uh, than a republic. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of the second Puglisi Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? No. Representative Morrow votes no. Please close the machine. With 19 aye, 42 no, and four excuse, the amendment is lost. Mr. Schiebel, please read the first Soper amendment to the Committee of the Whole report. Representative Soper moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole Server section taken by the committee not adopting the following Soper amendment, L24 to Senate Bill 188, to show that said amendment passed and that Senate Bill 188 as amended passed. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the first Soper Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report and ask that it be properly displayed. It is displayed. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, this amendment protects insurance companies and enables them to increase rates for reasons other than what is prohibited in the bill. Uh, in the bill, it clarifies that a prohibited action does not include a rate increase for any reason other than the reason described in subsection 1, which states an insurer that issues medical malpractice insurance shall not take a prohibited action against an applicant for or the name insured under a medical malpractice policy in this state solely because the applicant or insured has provided a legally protected health care activity so long as the care provided was consistent with generally accepted standards of practice under Colorado law. The issue that we're uh, quite concerned about here is as um, costs increases, but you've pre-negotiated a rate as a provider with your carrier, uh, that um, that not be seen as a prohibited action where the carrier is only going to reimburse the pre-negotiated contract rate. So even though your costs have gone up, it may look like the carrier is not reimbursing um, at the same uh, percentage, so, so your profit margin has actually gone down, but that if your profit margin has decreased, that that not be seen as a prohibited action. I'd ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, 
The question before us is the adoption of the first SOPER amendment to the Committee of the Whole report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? No. Representative Morrow votes no. Please close the machine. With 19 I, 42 no, and four excused, the first SOPER amendment is lost. Mr. Schiebel, please read the second SOPER amendment to the Committee of the Whole report. Representative SOPER moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse action taken by the Committee not adopting the following SOPER amendment, L26, to Senate Bill 188, to show that said amendment passed and that Senate Bill 188 is amended passed. Representative SOPER. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the second SOPER amendment to the Committee of the Whole report and ask that it be properly displayed. Properly displayed, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, members, um, the bill states that a peace officer shall not knowingly arrest any person who engages in a legally protected health care activity. What this amendment seeks to do is to protect police officers by specifying that the police officer must know the individual they are arresting engages in a legally protected health care activity. This will prevent the police officer from violating law if they arrest an individual for an offense that is unrelated to the person engaging in a legally protected health care activity. It's really important that we're clear with this. We um, had a little bit of a discussion uh, during the Committee of the Whole um, debate, and we, you know, of course, went back and forth about um, what could be reasonably known by law enforcement and what might not be reasonably known and whether they should know or shouldn't know at all. And we certainly believe that there shouldn't be a provision in law where someone can go ahead and, and claim as a defense their, their occupation, but the arrest actually has nothing to do with that particular occupation. And this adds the safeguards uh, for, for law enforcement that it could be for that other reason that they must actually know. I'd ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is another uh, simple amendment, and as our Speaker Pro Tem laid out, there are plenty of parameters in this bill to protect those, um, those wanting to do bad things. This piece and this amendment just keep the police officer from being held liable for any of those actions surrounding it, being issued a search warrant or, or a search and seizure, some of the other things that are in this bill. So I rise in support of the SOPER amendment. I ask for a yes vote. Seeing no further, Representative Froelich. Thank you, Madam Speaker. What's legal is legal, what's illegal is illegal. Uh, so I ask for a no vote. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of the second SOPER amendment to the Committee of the Whole report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? No. Representative Morrow votes no. Representative Woodrow. Please close the machine. With 20 aye, 41 no, and four excused, the second SOPER amendment is lost. Mr. Schiebel, please read the third SOPER amendment to the Committee of the Whole report. Representative SOPER moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the Committee not adopting the following SOPER amendment, L27 to Senate Bill 188, to show that Senate amendment passed and that Senate Bill 188 is amended passed. Representative SOPER. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the third SOPER amendment to the Committee of the Whole report and ask for it to be properly displayed. It is properly displayed. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, so uh, the bill states that a court shall not issue an ex parte order for wiretapping or eavesdropping to obtain any wire, oral, or electronic communication data that relates to an investigation into a legally protected healthcare activity. 
This amendment uh, creates an exemption that a court may issue an ex parte order for wiretapping or eavesdropping if the court finds there's a good faith basis for the order. Like I uh, mentioned during the debate earlier, this actually stems uh, from the lessons that we learned as a state from the Sunset Mesa atrocity because the same issue actually came up there and we actually had to later address that in law where they were engaging in illegal activity in uh, embalming and cremating. The problem was they also engaged in an activity that was not uh, legal and that was the sale of bodies and giving families um, instead of cremated remains uh, concrete and cat litter and so, you know, it was fraud and deception. Most of those families described uh, that act as their loved one having died and then been murdered after the fact. And the state definitely struggled to be able to investigate there and to be able to actually um, build a case uh, because they, uh, the, the owners of that particular business entity, held uh, behind this shield that they were engaging in a legally uh, protected activity, which is the funeral industry. And so very similar to that, uh, which is why when I read this language in this particular bill, I wanted to make sure we didn't have some issue uh, that could um, also happen in another uh, industry. So it, it really is important that we give tools to where someone, um, you, know, you know, we presume them always to be doing something legal. I, I think we give everyone uh, the benefit of the doubt. But we also ensure that law enforcement has the appropriate tools to where those once in a blue moon bad actors that we are able to go ahead and build a case and uh, make a prosecution after that. I would ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of the third SOPR amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? No. Representative Morrow votes no. Please close the machine. With 19 I, 42 no, and four excused, the third SOPR amendment is lost. Mr. Schiebel, please read the fourth SOPR amendment to the Committee of the Whole report. Representative Soper moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the committee in not adopting the following SOPR amendment, L28 to Senate Bill 188, to show that settlement and passed and that Senate Bill 188 is amended passed. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the fourth SOPR amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report and ask that it be properly displayed. It is displayed. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm working on building a herd here. The, uh, uh, this amendment um, uh, deals with a subsection uh, in the bill concerning when a pregnant person who is incarcerated, the way the bill is worded, it requires trans uh, uh, that the jail facility uh, transport uh, that particular pregnant person uh, to be able to access an abortion. What the amendment says is that um, that um, community-based provider or organization would need to reimburse the um, jail facility for the transportation costs. Uh, this is one that, um, you know, as governments are looking at building their budgets and uh, making sure that, you know, they understand these costs, that they would be able to reimburse here for, uh, for the transport costs. would ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Representative Frelick. We ask for a no vote. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of the fourth SOPR amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? No. Representative Morrow votes no. Please close the machine. With 19 aye, 42 no, and four excused, the fourth SOPR amendment is lost. Mr. Schiebel, please read the first Wilson amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Representative Wilson moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the Committee in not adopting the following Wilson amendment, L34 to Senate Bill 188, to show that Senate amendment passed and that Senate Bill 188 is amended passed. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move uh, the first Wilson Amendment and ask that it be displayed. It is properly displayed. Please proceed. 
Thank you. Oh, uh, sorry. Representative Wilson, we put the other Wilson Amendment up. Now it is properly displayed. Please proceed. Thank you again. This is uh, similar to the second SOPR Amendment, but again, trying to protect the liability of our police officers. Um, one huge concern that came up for me during this debate is the fact that it was supposedly stakeholded quite a bit by an individual with an individual who has a terrible record on crime. So why would we not want to protect our police officers? We've been beating up on them for the past several years. So I ask for a yes vote and that we help keep our police officers out of the mix of these things. Thank you. Representative Frelick. We ask for a no vote. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of the first Wilson Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? No. Representative Morrow votes no. Representative Soper, thank you. Please close the machine. With 19 I, 42 no, and four excused, the first Wilson Amendment is lost. Mr. Schiebel, please read the second Wilson Amendment. Representative Wilson moves to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the Committee in not adopting the following Puglisi Amendment, L21 to Senate Bill 188. Show that said amendment passed and that Senate Bill 188 is amended passed. Representative Wilson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move the second uh, Wilson Amendment and ask that it be displayed. It is properly displayed. Please proceed. Thank you. This amendment is just asking that we ensure that providers are able to do what's necessary when, in refusing to pay or, or failing to pay if, the, if it falls within uh, continued lawful reasons. I ask for an I vote. Representative Froelich. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Super appreciate the love for our abortion providers, but I'm going to ask for a no vote. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of the second Wilson Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? No. Representative Morrow votes no. Please close the machine. With 19 I, 42 no, and four excused, the second Wilson Amendment is lost. Mr. Schiebel, please read the Winter and Luck Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Representatives Winter and Luck move to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the committee in not adopting the following Luck Amendment, L36, the Senate Bill 188, to show that said amendment passed and that Senate Bill 188 as amended passed. Representative Winter. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to move the Winter Luck Amendment to the report to the Committee of the Whole and ask it to properly be displayed. It is properly displayed. Please proceed. Um, I'm just looking here that private citizens and business have the constitutional right to practice their religion without restrictions to that freedom and to act in accordance with their faith. I urge a I vote. Representative Bottoms. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I also urge an I vote on this. Um, we've seen a lot of persecution of Christians in the last week, specifically related to this bill. And so I would like to uh, urge us to make a, a good show of faith here by uh, voting this amendment in and try to curb some of this uh, anti-Christian rhetoric that's been so prevalent and strong this last two weeks. Representative Bottoms, I do not believe there's been anti-Christian rhetoric. Representative Froelich. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Woman of Faith here asking for a no vote. Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So this was actually an amendment that was brought to us by uh, members of the faith community who would be impacted by this bill, um, specifically organizations and businesses that are wholly run by a particular faith that wholly employ particular um, 
uh, members of, of a particular faith and who would like to not have to engage in contracts to provide certain um, services within the construct of this faith community. And so it is an amendment um, to language that is in existence uh, as a result of some Senate work, but the Senate didn't didn't address all of the problems, all of the concerns. It also added in the Senate, they added the, the term bona fide religious beliefs and it strikes that so that the court isn't engaging in a determination as to whether somebody has a belief or not um, it, to the degree that that, that you know, um, that we, as, that the court, that the government isn't actually um, trying to determine whether someone has a sincerely held belief under that term. And so they've just asked for that to be struck, and so I ask for an I vote. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of the Winter and Luck Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? No. Representative Morrow votes no. Please close the machine. With 19 I, 42 no, and four excuse, the winter and luck amendment is lost. There are no further amendments at the desk. The question before us is the adoption of the report of the Committee of the Whole. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Morrow, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Morrow votes yes. Assistant Minority Leader Puglisi. Please close the machine. With 41 aye, 20 no, and four excuse, the Committee of the, the, committee of the Whole Report is adopted. <laughs> Members, we will stand in a brief recess.
The House will come back to order. Representative Doherty. For the continuation of special. Members, you have heard the motion, seeing no objection. The House will now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for continuation of special orders. Representative Doherty will take the chair. The committee will come to order. With your unanimous consent, the bills will be read by title unless there's a request for reading a bill at length. Committee reports are printed and in your bill folders. Floor amendments will be shown on the screen and your iPads. Bills will be laid over upon motion of the majority leader. The coat rule is relaxed. Um, Mr. Shebel, please read the title of the Senate Bill 180. No, no Senate Bill 189 Nine. by Senators Moreno and Cutter, also Representatives Michelson, Janae, and Garcia. Representative Michelson Janae. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. Honor to serve with you. <laughs> Thank you. I move Senate Bill 189 and the committee report. One second. We're having problems with the, the volume here, so I'm going to start over. Mr. Shebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 189. Senate Bill 189 by Senators Moreno and Cutter, also Representatives Michelson, Janae, and Garcia. Concerning increasing access to reproductive health care services and a connection therewith making an appropriation. Representative Michael Sinjanay. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. Honor to serve with you. I move Senate Bill 189 and the committee report. To the committee report. In the committee, we had a very small amendment that added the word sub in front of the word section because it was pointing to the wrong place. I ask for an I vote. Is there any further discussion on the committee report? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the committee report. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. no. The committee report passes. To the bill. Representative Michelson, Janae. Madam Chair, I ask for your, um, a little bit of leeway as I, I get to the point of this story. Um, and for, uh, uh, yes, and uh, for the record, the debate has started at 5.40 p.m. Um, Representative Michael Sanjanae, please proceed. So it was about this time that um, I remember going out to my backyard and noticing, I, and I got this reminder on Facebook that I had posted a picture of the aspens starting to bloom. And I went outside and I took the picture of the aspens starting to bloom and I realized I hadn't seen my period in a while. What's important about that is that I had been trying very, very hard to get pregnant. My husband and I are a second marriage, are my second marriage, this is my second marriage. And we desperately wanted to have children together. 
We do each have, you know, my son, the Marine, comes from my husband's first marriage, and my son and daughter come from my first marriage. And so together we had three children. We had a, a bursting house, three children, two dogs, 14 fish. And it wasn't enough. I wanted more. I, I desperately, desperately, desperately wanted to have this man's child. And I knew that my time was limited. Um, I had been told that because of my history, or my family history of ovarian cancer, that I needed to have my ovaries removed. And I knew once I had my ovaries removed, my story was done. There was to be no baby for me. So we tried. We tried for a long time. We tried for over a year. I went to the doctor and she said, it's normal at this age to take over a year. And I didn't understand why, because I had given birth to two children. My body knew how to do this, right? I was convinced that my body knew how to do this, knew how to get pregnant, knew how to have a baby and I was not getting pregnant. So the day in late March that I went outside and saw the little blossoms on my aspen tree and realized that I hadn't seen my period, I went to the grocery store. I nervously, like a teenager, bought a pregnancy kit uh, or t a test kit. I brought my test kit home, did what you do on a test kit, and it came back pregnant. And I couldn't believe it. I called my husband at work and I said to him, honey, I'm pregnant. And he said, what? I said, I'm pregnant. I feel like I need to come in and show you the stick. And he said, no, I can wait to see the stick until I get home. So I didn't bring the stick into his office, although I really wanted to. And I started writing. I was a parenting examiner. There, we had a, there was a newspaper, an online newspaper called the National Examiner, and I wrote for the National Examiner, and I was the national parenting examiner for, not the national, the examiner. I was the national parenting um, expert for the examiner. And so I was writing all about parenting, and so here I was, just after my 40th birthday, pregnant and writing for the examiner about my pregnancy. I didn't do the traditional wait until 12 weeks because I couldn't wait. I was bursting with the most unbelievable joy I had ever felt. And I, I just, I couldn't even believe the luck um, and the grace that God had given me so that I could once again carry a baby. I wrote about the pregnancy almost every day. I wrote about my doctor's appointments. I wrote about um, different things that I was feeling. I wrote about morning sickness. I wrote about cravings, all the things that you can write about. I posted a gazillion pictures of ice cream sundaes because that's what I do when I'm pregnant. I ice cream sundae. It's a verb. On my 17-week appointment, there were concerning signs. And we um, scheduled we scheduled to have the heart of the baby. Um, there, I can't remember the name of the procedure, but they had to look at the heart. Something was wrong. Something was wrong with my baby's heart. They did um, blood work. I knew, I knew that my baby was a son. I knew that, that um, I was gonna have another boy. And I was very excited. And on my 20 week appointment, I was bleeding that morning 
And I went in and they did the ultrasound and there was no heartbeat. I remember feeling like I wasn't in my body. I can vaguely remember my presence being in the corner of the room watching what was going on. My husband was in shock. Uh, the whole office knew how excited I was to be pregnant because I had been coming for a year pretty regularly to get checked up and make sure everything was working okay and make sure my systems worked. And so they knew how excited and how, how desperately we wanted this baby. But I was 20 weeks along. And so at the culmination of the appointment, my doctor handed me a piece of paper with the name of an abortion clinic on it and the phone number. I didn't understand. Why are you sending me to an abortion clinic? And she said, I can't do the procedure here. This is where you'll go and you'll have the procedure. And that procedure is called an abortion. I had always been on the side of fighting for access to abortion. I always believed that it was something that someone should be able to receive if that's what they chose. I did not understand that the procedure that I was having was called an abortion. And when I went to the abortion clinic, I gave them my insurance card. And they said to me, you're gonna have to pay $500. And I said, I don't know if I have $500. What do I do if I don't have $500? And they said, you can go to the emergency department across the street. And my husband went down the block and he pulled out $500 because we are privileged enough to have $500 in the bank. At least we were then. I was a mess. The person tried to ask me to compose myself. I begged for my husband to come back with me, but they had strict policies that partners were not allowed back. I didn't understand any of this. And I know now it's for protection. There are many reasons. But all I wanted was my husband next to me, and I could not have my husband next to me while they performed this procedure. I knew from the bleeding and from my doctor that if I didn't have the procedure right away, I could become septic and I could die. So I had to have the procedure and I had to have my abortion at that time when I showed up at the clinic and they gave me the abortion. And I woke up in the chair afterwards, and there, I, I remember sitting in the recovery chair, and they finally let my husband come back and sit with me. And all I could think about was the future of this little boy that I dreamed of, that I wrote about, that we together had planned that our children had gotten so excited about. We took them to Sonic one night. <laughs> We're sitting outside, you know, the, if you've been to Sonic, the little outside patio kind of tables, sitting outside of the tables, and we showed them the ultrasound. And only our oldest understood what he was looking at. And he said, you're gonna have a baby? And the younger two got so excited, you're gonna have a baby, you're gonna have a baby. We called the baby Peanut. That's how we referred to the baby while, while he was alive. But afterwards, my son told me 
Mommy, his name was Jacob, my younger son. So we, in the, in the memorial book in synagogue, I have his name as Jacob Peanut Janae. <laughs> I tell you this not for gratuitous sadness. I tell you this because abortion is part of the spectrum of care. Abortion is sometimes needed desperately. We may not know all of the reasons behind it. I was 20 weeks pregnant and then I was not. I had a late term abortion. If I had not had access to that care, I was trying my luck. Would I naturally give birth to the baby in time to avoid sepsis? Would I die before the baby came out? Were there any other complications we didn't know about? The procedure saved my life. Please sit down, members. It is why I am so dedicated to working on access to abortion. I know that if I did not live in a state where I could go to an abortion clinic and I could get an abortion procedure, that my life would have been in grave danger. But I do. The challenge was that $500. And that's the part of this bill that I'm sharing with you today is that $500. How many people can go to the ATM and pull out $500? Not as many as you would think. In today's day and age, so many of us live paycheck to paycheck, every penny going to cover the expenses that we have, from food to gas to rent. Everything we have is spent. So if you need an abortion, you're going to have to find somewhere that's going to give it to you for free. And while those places do exist, do you have time for that? I didn't have time for that. My time was very limited and very precious. In this bill, we seek to cover abortion care with no copay and no coinsurance. That's a big deal. And it means not having to go to the ATM to pull out $500. It means not having to find charity care. It means that if you need an abortion, you can have access to an abortion. I care a lot about this issue. I've cared about it since I was young enough to know that it was a conversation to be had. And I want us to be in a place and a space where we can be a state where Daphna doesn't have to run down to the ATM and grab out $500. My husband did it, but. where I can go in to a clinic 
and have the services I need gently and readily. And this bill will do that. I'm going to call on my co-prime sponsor, who's going to continue introducing the other components of the bill. Representative Garcia. Thank you, Madam Chair. <sighs> Members, I'm going to start us off um, with a little poem. In a world of inequality, where economic disparity is felt by many far and wide, we strive for justice to provide. And in the realm of healthcare, where access to coverage is rare, the battle rages to ensure that women's rights are held secure. For too long, we've seen the plight of those who can't afford the fight to maintain their autonomy and make the choices that set them free. But now we come to create the seal, to level the playing field, and offer care that's just and fair, so everyone can fight despair. And among the many needs we see, one stands out clearly for you and me, the right to choose our own health care. Like I said before, it's only fair. So let us work to make it right, to offer care that shines a light on the importance of choice and care and economic justice everywhere. Members, Colorado voters have said loudly and clearly over and over again that access to the full range of reproductive health is something no one should mess with. Reproductive care is health care, and insurance should cover people's health care. Taking care of all people's health care needs is an investment in a thriving society. And comprehensive reproductive care is a critical piece of health care for everyone. Existing gaps in our health insurance of reproductive care can cause significant barriers to access. Ultimately, the decision to have children or not is one of the most emotionally and economically impactful decisions for families. It has implications for an individual's financial well-being, job security, workforce participation, and educational attainment. Studies show that unplanned births significantly reduce women's participation in the labor force. And the inability to obtain an abortion undermines career aspirations and achievement. People who are denied an abortion or are unable to afford one are nearly four times more likely to live below the poverty line. Studies have found that being denied an abortion increases the amount of debt 30 days or more past due by 78%. Being denied an abortion also increases the rate of negative public records such as bankruptcies and evictions by 81%. As was always the case, preventing or limiting easy, safe access to abortion are about power and control. Out-of-pocket costs only provide additional barriers to bodily autonomy. Efforts to control someone else's body are deeply rooted in systems of oppression and systemic racism. For all of these reasons, it is critically important to cover abortion care and reproductive care services, including STI treatment. 
STI cases have been increasing since 2013, and delayed care and untreated STIs lead to more serious complications which are more expensive. This bill closes several access gaps related to sexually transmitted infections and abortion care and will make for a stronger, healthier Colorado by every measure. This bill requires large employer plans to cover abortions without cost sharing. Smaller plans only cover if it doesn't cause defrayal. Prohibits cost sharing for vasectomies. Most plans only cover female steriliz sterilization in full. This is an inequity that we will fix. This bill allows healthcare providers to provide contraception, supplies, and information to a minor without notifying or getting consent from a parent, establishes a fund to reimburse for these costs, adds women's preventative services, federal guidelines to the mandatory preventative health coverage and insurance plans. It expands the reproductive health care program to include family planning services, and it modernizes some of our language and statute. I envision a world, and I imagine we all envision a world, where anyone who needs abortion care can get it without being shamed, punished, or going broke and better without having their health put at risk. We need to take Colorado from legal to accessible. I want to make sure that we all fully understand what is in this bill and what is not in this bill. Feel free to read along with me. A bill for an act. Concerning increasing access for reproductive health care services and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Bill summary, note. This summary applies to this bill as introduced and does not reflect any amendments that may be subsequently adopted. If this bill passes third reading in the House of Introduction, a bill summary that applies to the re-engrossed version of this bill will be available at http colon backslash backslash ledge.colorado.gov and parentheses. Sections one, two, three and five of the bill change the defined term HIV prevention, HIV infection prevention drug as it appears and is used in several areas of law to HIV prevention drug. Section two also adds the women's preventive services guidelines of health resources and services administration in the United States Department of Health and Human Services to the mandatory preventive health care services coverage for health benefit plans. It specifies that the mandatory preventive health care services benefit for counseling for prevention of and screening for sexually transmitted infections includes HIV, prevention drugs, and the services necessary for initiation and continued use of an HIV prevention drug as described in the bill based on the most recent guidelines and clinical guidance. Requires large employer plans on and after January 1, 2025 to provide coverage for the total cost of abortion care without policy deductibles, excuse me, <clears throat> co-payments, or co-insurance. Individual and small group plans must provide this coverage if the Federal Department of Health and Human Services confirms the state's determination that the coverage is not subject to state defrayal pursuant to federal law 
To the extent required by binding federal jurisprudence, employers are exempt from providing coverage if providing coverage conflicts with the employer's sincerely held religious belief. I want to say that again for some of my colleagues that to the extent required by binding federal jurisprudence, employers are exempt from providing coverage if providing coverage conflicts with employers' sincerely re held religious beliefs. Therefore, no amendments on religious exemption are necessary. Section three also prohibits a health insurance carrier from requiring a covered person to undergo step therapy or to receive prior authorization before a healthcare provider may prescribe or dispense a medication for the treatment of HIV. Section four prohibits a carrier from imposing deductibles, co-payments, co-insurance, annual or lifetime maximum benefits, or other cost sharing on coverage for the treatment of sexually transmitted infection or sterilization services, which Coverage must be provided regardless of the covered person's gender. With the minor's consent, Section 6 allows a healthcare provider acting within the scope of the healthcare provider's license, certificate, or registration to furnish contraceptive procedures, supplies, or information to the minor without notification to or the consent of the minor's parents or, or parents legal guardian, or any other person having custody of or decision-making responsibility for the minor. Section 7 and 8, expand the reproductive health care program administered by the Department of Health Care Policy and Financing Department to include additional family planning services and family planning related services to allow individuals under 19 years of age to apply for and enroll themselves in the program. Section 9 requires the department to reimburse licensed health care providers for family planning services and family planning related services provided to a minor that creates a cash fund from which the General Assembly may appropriate money to the department of this purpose. In case you all are following along and are lost, we are now at the top of page 3. Section 10 exempts the cash fund from the limit on uncommitted cash fund reserves. Section 11, requires non-emergency medical transportation services under the state medical assistance program to include expenses for transportation to medical services that are prohibited from coverage pursuant to section 50 of article five of the Colorado Constitution. Section 12 of the bill prohibits the use under the state medical assistance program of utilization management, including prior authorization and step therapy for prescription drugs prescribed for the treatment of prevention of HIV. Be it enacted by the General Assembly of the State of Colorado. Section one, in Colorado Revised Statutes 10-16-102, amend parentheses 38.5 and parentheses as follows, 10-16-102, 102, definitions as used in this article 16, unless the context otherwise requires. 38.5, HIV prevention drug means pre-exposure prophylaxis, post-exposure prophylaxis, or other drugs approved by the FDA for prevention of HIV infection. Section two. In Colorado Revised Statutes 10-16-104, amend 18AI, introductory portion 18BX and 18EI, and add 18B.3 and 26 as follows. 10-16-104, mandatory coverage provisions, definitions, rules. 18, preventative healthcare services. A, I, the following policies and contracts that are issued or renewed in this state must provide coverage for the total cost of the preventive health care services spe specified in subsections 18B, 18B3, and 18B7 of this section. The coverage required by this subsection 18 must include preventive health care services for the following in accordance with the A or B recommendations of the task force for the particular preventive healthcare service, XA 
any other preventive services included in the A or B recommendations of the task force or required by federal law, any other recommendations established by the ACIP, any other preventive care and screening as provided for in the comprehensive guidelines supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration of the United States Department of Health and Human Services for Women, and evidence-informed preventive care and screening provided for in the comprehensive guidelines supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration of the United States Department of Health and Human Services for infants, children, and adolescents. This subsection 18BX does not apply to grandfathered health benefit plans. B.3. If counseling prevention and screening for a sexually transmitted infection is required in subsection 18B11 of this section, our covered services, the health benefit plan must provide the coverage without cost sharing, regardless of the covered person's gender, and the coverage must include consistent with task force requirements coverage for HIV prevention drugs, and services necessary for initiation, for initiation and continued use of HIV prevention drugs, including office visits, testing, vaccinations, and monitoring services. E, I, a carrier shall reimburse the farm, I'm sorry, E1, a carrier shall reimburse a pharmacist employed by an in-network pharmacy for prescribing and dispensing HIV prevention drugs to a covered person, a carrier shall provide a pharmacist who prescribes and dispenses HIV prevention drugs to a covered person pursuant to section 12-280-125.7 an adequate consultative fee, or if medical billing is not available, an enhanced dispensing fee that is equivalent or that is provided to a physician or advanced practice registered nurse. 26, abortion care rules definition. Except as provide A, except as provided in subsections 26D and 26G of this section and subject to the provisions of subsections 26E and 26F of this section, all individual and small group health benefit plans issued or renewed in this state shall provide coverage for the total cost of abortion care. The coverage required pursuant to this subsection 26 is not subject to policy deductibles, co-payments, or co-insurance, except that co-payments may apply as required by a grandfathered health benefit plan. <coughs> C. The commissioner shall adopt rules consistent with and as are necessary to implement this subsection 26. D. An employer is not obligated to provide the coverage required in this subsection 26 if, one, providing the coverage conflicts with the employer's sincerely held religious beliefs, or two, the employer is a public entity prohibited by section 50 of Article 5 of the state constitution from using public funds to pay for induced abortions. E, this subsection 26 applies to and the division shall implement the requirements of this subsection 26 for large employer health benefit plans issued or renewed in this state on or after January 1st 2025. F, with respect to individual and small group health benefit plans, one, the division shall submit to the Federal Department of Health and Human Services. A, <laughs> The division's determination as to whether the benefits specified in this subsection 26 is in addition to essential health benefits and would be subject to defrayal by the state pursuant to 42U.S.C. section. 
18031D3B and B, a request that the Federal Department of Health and Human Services confirm the division's determination within 60 days after receipt of the division's request for confirmation of the determination. Two, this subsection 26 applies to and the division shall implement the requirements of this subsection 26 for individual and small group health benefit plans issued or renewed in this state upon the earlier of A, 12 months after the Federal Department of Health and Human Services confirms that the coverage specified in this subsection 26 does not constitute an additional benefit that requires defrayal by the state pursuant to 42 U.C.S. U.S.C. Sec. 18031D3B. B. 12 months after the Federal Department of Health and Human Services otherwise informs the division that the coverage in this subsection 26 does not require state defrayal pursuant to 42 U.S.C. Sec. 18031D3. B or C, the passage of more than 365 days since the division submitted its determination and request for confirmation pursuant to subsection 26 F1 of this section and the Federal Department of Health and Human Services has failed to respond to the request within that period, in which case the division shall consider the Federal Department's unreasonable delay a preclusion from requiring defrayal by the state. G. The provisions of this section do not apply to a high deductible health benefit plan pursuant to 26 U.S.C. Sec. 223 as amended, issued or renewed in this state until eligible insured deductible has been met unless allowed pursuant to federal law. H, as used in this subsection 26, abortion care has the same meaning as abortion, as defined in section 25-6-4021. Section three, in Colorado revised statutes amend 10-16-152 as follows. 10-16-152 HIV prevention and treatment medication limitations on carriers, step therapy, prior authorization, study repeal, a carrier shall not require a covered person to undergo step therapy or to receive prior authorization before a pharmacist may, pursuant to section 12.280-125.7, prescribe or dispense an HIV prevention drug. You know, members, I'm getting a little parched. And I would like to believe that all of you have already read this bill multiple times. But the point of this 
is that we have an obligation. Thank you. We have an obligation to do what's right for Colorado. And what's right for Colorado is economic justice. What's right for Colorado is ensuring that people are not left with having to scramble, with having to go bankrupt, with having to put their health at risk because certain health care is not covered. Representative Michael Sinjane. Sorry, Representative Garcia. I just want to share a story. I had a friend. He was diagnosed with HIV. He had health insurance. But at the time, his health insurance didn't cover his medication. It's not really a long story because the end of it is that he died of AIDS. Had he been able to access his treatment, he would still be here today. He would probably be up there because we were that close. This bill is about economic justice and it's about saving lives. And I urge an I vote. Representative Michelson Jane. I'm going to just summarize. Reproductive health care is an essential component of primary and preventative care. High deductibles and gaps in coverage create barriers to patient access, even for those who are fortunate to live in Colorado, where reproductive health care is protected and legal. This bill closes several access gaps related to sexually transmitted infections and abortion care. Bill action requires no cost sharing insurance coverage for all STI treatments, vasectomies, and abortion care. Creates a task force to make legislative and regulatory recommendations on closing the gaps for 93,000 Coloradans without access to family planning care. Prohibits step therapy and prior authorization for HIV medications through 2027 and requires the state to study the personal and financial impact of the policy on people living with HIV. Creates family planning related services coverage for undocumented people through the state reproductive health care program. Removes outdated language from the 1971 courts and court procedures statute about clergy referrals for minors accessing contraception and expands provider types for this access. Codifies federal preventive services coverage requirements from HRSA, ASIP, and the USPSTF into Colorado law. Eight states, California, Illinois, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New York, Oregon, and Washington require private health insurance plans to cover abortion care with no co-payments. Colorado STI surveillance reporting indicates continued increases in yearly STI diagnoses. 2020, the most recent year with a complete state epidemiology profile, was a historical high point for both gonorrhea and syphilis infections. Quarterly data from CDPHE indicate that chlamydia infections rates have returned to pre-pandemic highs. There has also been a consistent increase in reported cases of congenital syphilis and new HIV infections. SB 2116 created cost sharing free coverage for STI testing and prevention for all patients regardless of gender and protected and expanded coverage for family planning related services for patients on Medicaid. This bill continues that work 
to close lingering gaps in patient coverage. Patients have faced challenges in coverage for sterilization services. A February Division of Insurance Bulletin included a statement from Commissioner Conway that the division has recently become aware of instances where individuals may have received erroneous information that they would be responsible for some portion of costs for a surgical sterilization procedure. And we know there are gaps in the ACA with regard to vasectomies. This bill answers those questions and solves those problems. I strongly urge an I vote. Representative Hartzik. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. Honor to serve with you. We heard this bill in committee earlier this week, and I would like to take a moment to thank the co-sponsors. We had a discussion following her very emotional testimony. And I talked to her then, and I'm going to say it now in front of everyone. I thanked her then for it and her honesty and her courage to tell that story. And so I do it again. I would like to point out a couple things. And I also appreciate the reading, too. That would save me a lot of reading. That was great. That's why I got the bottle of water. I'm going to be reading, so. As a parent, we are concerned for the safety and welfare of our kids. You can't hear me. Usually I get accused of talking too loudly. Is this better? All right, don't tell them, don't. See, normally I get, you're too loud. As I was saying, as a parent, we are very concerned about the welfare health and safety of our kids. We don't want any harm to come to them. We want them to be very successful in life. We try and school them in the issues of life and the things that they will face as they grow up. Regarding this bill, I'd like to read what's under Section 6, what current statute is. So it says, birth control procedures, supplies, and information may be furnished by physicians licensed under Article 240 of Title 12 to any minor who is pregnant or a parent or married or who has the consent of the minor's parent or legal guardian or who has been referred for such services by another physician, a member of the clergy a family planning clinic, a school or institution of higher education, or any agency or instrumentality of this state or any subdivision thereof, or who requests and is in the need of birth control procedures, supplies, or information. There's a couple of key phrases I would like to draw our attention to. Current statute says birth control procedures. So I have a couple of questions because the new statute changes that wording a little bit. And then the very significant one is it says, who has the consent of the minor's parent? We vigorously debated earlier this week, ages and what's proper. When can a minor make a decision? We know by the law it's 16 to drive, it's 18 to vote. So how young of a minor are we talking about here? At what age are we saying that minor can make their own decisions regarding health care? And doing this at the exclusion of their parents. The people that love them most, that are most concerned with their health and welfare and their future the parents that want to ensure that their safety, their well-being is paramount. The 
the bill says, with the minor's consent, this is under section six, with the minor's consent, a healthcare provider licensed, certified, or registered pursuant to Title 12, who is acting with the healthcare provider's scope of practice may furnish contraceptive procedures, supplies, or information to a minor without notification or the consent of the minor's parent or parents. So two pretty significant changes. I don't know what the difference is, and I would like to know what the difference is between birth control procedures and contraceptive procedures. And then I think the other one is pretty clear. The current statute says with parental consent, and the new proposal says without their consent and without their notification. Now, as I stated earlier, Every parent wants the best for their children. Every parent wants to be involved with their lives, their well-being, their health care. My kids have played sports since they were little. I always had to have their physicals done. I had to have their immunizations current for school. I had to ensure all of this stuff was proper. Turning it into the fields or the teams that they were playing on. And a couple times when they got injured, we took them to the hospital. We were involved in every step. Elementary school, middle school, and high school. As the parent, it was my responsibility to be with them, to ensure they got the best care possible. That's my responsibility as a parent. That's my job. It's something I take very seriously, and I believe every parent does. I would like to know is what is the purpose in the section when it says if minors can already obtain contraception with the parental consent and their health care of the person that's most involved in ensuring that they have a healthy lifestyle, that we now want to exclude their parents from this. I'd also like to know was what other forms of contraceptive procedures does this section include? What age are we calling these minors? As we noted earlier in the week, we were debating many issues, and minors are of right of age, anything under 18. At what age are we talking about that a minor can make an informed decision regarding their own health care without their parents' consent? Where and when is that possible? I don't know, or nor would I presume, to know what every parent's response is or every parent's philosophy is. But I do think that every parent is concerned more with their younger children. And as they grow, part of that experience of being a parent is giving them a little bit more freedom, but you are still always involved. Thank you. You're still always involved in what they do. And you want to know what is going to happen to them. My oldest son is now 18. I still want to ensure that he has proper health care. 
He's still covered under my insurance until, well, until he actually gets sworn in into the military. But he's going to have more freedom at this point than he did when he was 16 or when he was 14 or 12 or 10. I'm the one or my wife that drove him to the hospital and our other son when they got injured. We're the ones that answered the doctor's questions about are they allergic to medication? What other injuries have they had? Are they on any medication? Because you know what? At least for my kids. They get asked questions, they're like, uh, I don't know. Uh, Mom, Dad, uh, you know, am I allergic to anything? You, of course, you tell them no every time, and they forget it because they got 10,000 things that's on their mind. The one thing that's not on their mind at 12, 14, 16, is, oh, wow, wow, let me, what, what, how's my insurance policy? What kind of health care do I have? What am I allergic to? They, they don't think about that. They ask us as their parents. We provide that information. We provide it because we want them to be well cared for and taken care of by their health care provider. We go in for their immunizations. When they were little, we had to hold them. Then when they get that shot and they're crying, you feel horrible as a parent. But we know that they need that shot. They need that immunization. Then as they get older, they're like, I hate this immunization. I hate this flu shot. I know, son, but. So they get that shot. But still, mom and dad are there. and We understand what's going on. Parents are involved. Parents should be involved. Yet this bill is proposing that some of the most critical health care that those children would be facing is done without, without parental information or consent. And members, I'm going to tell you, I 100% disagree with that. Parents should be involved. And on that, I move. Get this. I need who's. Here comes Matt. <laughs> I move. I move Amendment L042 to SB 189 and request that it properly be displayed. Amendment. L042 is properly displayed uh, to the amendment. Representative Hartsuck. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> this is a very simple amendment, and under six, section six, it simply states on page 11, line three, that we strike without the notification to or or, and we substitute with notification to and. Oops. <laughs> Might pay to no attention to the man behind the green curtain. As I was saying, we're striking line three without notification to or, and we're substituting with notification to and. Parents should be notified. Parents should be involved. Parents have the most at stake for their children. Parents love and care about their children's welfare, health care, and well-being more than anyone out there, any doctor, any counselor, any provider. The parents are the critical piece of that equation, and they must absolutely be involved. I urge and I vote on this amendment. Representative Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to issue a title challenge on this amendment. Committee of the Whole going to a brief recess.
Okay, the committee will come back to order. The chair rules that the amendment does not fit under the title. Representative Garcia. Thank you, members. Uh, it occurs to me that I probably should continue reading the rest of the bill so we know what's in and not in the bill. We'll start on page seven, section three. Line 22. Two, before July 1, 2027, a carrier shall not require a covered person to undergo step therapy or to receive prior authorization before a provider may, acting within the provider's scope of practice, prescribe or dispense any drug approved by the FDA and used for the treatment or prevention of HIV that is included on the carrier's prescription drug formulary as of March 1, 2023. Three, A, the division shall contract with one or more entities to conduct a study that includes qualitative patient and provider experience information and an actuarial review to consider the predicated cost and health impacts of removing the requirement for a covered person to undergo step therapy or to receive prior authorization before a provider may, acting within the provider's scope of practice, prescribe or dispense a drug for the treatment of HIV. Yes. In conducting the study, the entity contracted to perform the study must consult with community organizations led by people living with HIV. The division shall provide the completed study to the General Assembly no later than October 1, 2026. B, this subsection three is repealed effective July 1, 2027. Section four. In Colorado Revised Statutes add 10-16-158 and 10-16-159 as follows. 10-16-158, treatment of sexually transmitted infection cost sharing. One, if the treatment of a sexually transmitted infection as defined in section 25.4.402.10 is a covered service, the health benefit plan must provide the coverage without deductibles, co-payments, co-insurance, annual or lifetime maximum benefit limits, or other cost sharing for or limits on the coverage for the treatment of a sexually transmitted infection. Two. The provisions of this section do not apply to a high deductible health benefit plan pursuant to 26U.S.C. Sec.223 as amended, issued or renewed in this state until an eligible insured de deductible has been met, unless allowed pursuant to federal law. 10-16-159, coverage for sterilization services cost sharing. If sterilization services are a covered service, the health benefit plan must provide the coverage regardless of the covered person's sex or gender and without deductibles, co-payments, co-insurance, annual or lifetime maximum benefit limits or other cost sharing for or limits on the coverage for sterilization services. Two, the provisions of this section do not apply to a high deductible health benefit plan. Pursuant to 26U.S.C. Sec. 223 as amended, issued or renewed in this state until an eligible insured's deductible has been met, unless allowed pursuant to federal law. Section five, 
In Colorado Revised Statutes 12-280-125.7, amend one introductory portion, 1C2-3, introductory portion 5A and 5B as follows, 12-280-125.7, Pharmacists' authority to prescribe and dispense HIV prevention drugs, definitions, rules, as used in this section unless the context otherwise requires, HIV prevention drug means pre-exposure, prophylaxis, post-exposure, prophylaxis, or other drugs approved by the FDA for the prevention of HIV infection. A pharmacist may prescribe and dispense HIV prevention drugs in accordance with a standing order pursuant to section 25-1-130 or a statewide drug therapy protocol developed pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. 3. Before prescribing or dispensing HIV prevention drugs to a patient, a pharmacist must 5A, on or before six months after July 13, 2020, the State Board of Pharmacy, the Colorado Medical Board, and the State Board of Nursing shall, in collaboration with the Department of Public Health and Environment, and as described in Section 12, 280-601-1B develop statewide drug therapy protocols for pharmacists to prescribe and dispense HIV prevention drugs. B, if the State Board of Pharmacy, the Colorado Medical Board, and the State Board of Nursing are not able to agree in the time period required by subsection 5A of this section to statewide drug therapy protocols for pharmacists to prescribe and dispense HIV prevention drugs, the State Board of Pharmacy shall collaborate with the Department of Public Health and Environment to develop and implement statewide drug therapy protocols by January 1, 2021. Section 6 in Colorado Revised Statutes amends 13 dash 22 dash 105 as follows 13 dash 22 dash 105 minors consent contraception with the minors consent a health care provider licensed certified or registered pursuant to title 12 who is acting within the health care provider scope of practice may furnish contraceptive procedures supplies or information without notification to or the consent of minors, parents, or parent, parents, legal guardian, or any other person having custody of or decision-making responsibility for the minor. Section 7. In Colorado Revised Statutes 25.5-2-103, amend 2, 6, and 7C, repeal 1A, and add 1G and 5.5 as follows. 25.5-2-103, Reproductive Health Care Program Report Rules Definitions, as used in this section unless the context otherwise requires. Reproductive Health Care Services means Family Planning Services as defined in Section 25.5-4, dash 412 2B and family planning services as defined oh, and family planning related services as defined in section 25.5 dash 4 dash 412 2A 2 on and after July 1 2022 the state department shall administer a reproductive health care program referred to in this section as the program that provides reproductive health care services to participants. 5.5, to the extent practicable, 
the State Department shall ensure that eligible individuals seeking to participate in the program are able to apply for and enroll in the program through their local county office, a state medical assistance program site, an online application, or any other mechanism that is available to applicants for the state medical assistance program. The State Department shall provide reproductive health care services to participants without imposing any cost sharing requirements. Beginning in state fiscal year 2023 through 2024, the State Department shall analyze and report the cost effectiveness of the program to the public through the annual hearing pursuant to the State Measurement for Accountable, Responsive, and Transparent Government Act. Part two of Article seven of Title II, at a minimum, the report must include the cost of providing reproductive health care services to participants. Section 8, in Colorado Revised Statutes 25.5-1-201, amend introductory portion and 1, F.5, as follows. 25.5-1-201. Programs to be administered by the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing. The State Department shall administer the following programs and perform the following functions. F.5, the reproductive health care program that provides reproductive health care services as specified in Section 25.5-2-103. Section 9. In Colorado Revised Statutes, add 25.5-5-514 as follows. 25.5, you know what members? I need to get a glass of water, so I'm gonna step down and we'll keep reading in just a bit. Representative Wilford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It got so quiet after you said my name. People must be really interested in what I have to say. Well, so I wanted to first start by saying thank you to our good colleague from Douglas County for his questions about minors and contraceptive access. I'm here to provide a little bit of a historical uh, background and historical context so that we're all aware of the information that we're, that we're discussing today. In 1971, the legislature adopted the following law. Now, I'll admit that this law is written, written a little bit weirdly, so I, I, you know, I had to read through it a couple of times, so we may have to do that as well here. But the law that I'm referring to is located in Colorado, Colorado Revised Statute 13-22-105. Birth control procedures, supplies, and information may be furnished by physicians licensed under Article 240 of Title 12 to any minor who is pregnant or a parent or married or who has the consent of the minor's parent or legal guardian or who has been referred for such services by another physician, a member of the clergy, a family planning clinic, a school or institution of higher education, or any agency instrumentally of this state or any subdivision thereof who requests and is in need of birth control procedures, supplies, or information. As you can see, it's just a little confusing. I'm not sure why the legislature in 1971 thought that pregnant minors should be given contraception. But when I read it again, when I read that statute again, I realized it was a list. So I'm gonna share that list with you. Birth control procedures, supplies, and information may be furnished by physicians licensed under Article 240 of Title 12 to any minor who is pregnant or a parent or married 
or who has the consent of the minor's parent or legal guardian, or who has been referred for such services by another physician, which is I, admittedly a little weird one. One physician has to refer the minor to another physician first. It's kind of wacky, but I'll continue. A member of the clergy. Ooh, that one's interesting. Uh, I'm not aware of any other instance now where clergy are able to offer m and to refer minors for contraception, but sure, it's a noteworthy, noteworthy historical perspective, so let's continue. A family planning clinic a school or institution of higher education, or any agency or instrumentality of this state, or any subdivision thereof, or who request and is in need of birth control procedures, supplies, or information. That last one is where the ability of minors to access contraception, contraceptives totally on their own comes from. And it makes the rest of the, the, the list irrelevant. Because of that language, minors in Colorado, and actually all 50 states, can access contraception on their own consent without the consent or notification of their parents. Now that's not new. I repeat, minors can already access contraception entirely on their own. So again, Colorado Revised Statute 13-22-105. Again, like this. Third time's a charm, friends. Birth control procedures, supplies, and information may be furnished by physicians licensed under Article 240 of Title 12 to any minor who is pregnant or a parent or married or who has the consent of the minor's parent or legal guardian, or who has been referred for such services by another physician, a member of the clergy, a family planning clinic, a school or institution of higher education, or any agency of instrumentality of this state or any subdivision thereof, or who requests and is in need of birth control procedures, supplies, or information. Now, since the 1970s, we have a lot more provider types who regularly pre prescribe contraception within their scope of practice, like family nurse practitioners and physician assistants with prescriptive authority. So, we updated the statute to read on page 10 of the re-engrossed bill for everybody who is following along. With the minor's consent, a health care provider licensed, certified, or registered pursuant to Title 12 who is acting within the healthcare provider's scope of practice may furnish contraceptive procedures, supplies, or information to a minor without notification to or the consent of the minor's parent or parents, legal guardian, or any other persons having custody or decision-making responsibility for the minor. The language removes clergy referrals and updates provider types. That's it. No new ability to consent to contraception because minors have been able to do that on their own without parental consent or notification since the 1970s. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Assistant Minority Leader Puglisi. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Representative. I think that was really helpful. Um, one of the things I, I would really like to bring up, um, because I can't get any clarification, and I don't know, I don't see the bill sponsors right now, but, um, or maybe they're over there. The question I have is, can my 12-year-old get an abortion without my consent, without my knowledge or consent? Because nobody can seem to answer that question for me, and I'd really like to know the answer. So she can get an abortion? No, you talked about contraception. I'm asking about an abortion because the drafters couldn't answer it. So I'm asking if you can answer whether my 12-year-old can get an abortion without my consent or knowledge. Representative Froelich. Thank you very much for the question. We have statute on the books about parental notification. That remains on the books. 
Okay, so I still need to be notified before my child can have an abortion. Representative Froelich. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, we have a parental consent statute on the books that I can give you the citation for. Representative Garcia. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, but also to, to further clarify, abortion access for minors without consent of parents doesn't start until 16, but it's not just a free-for-all. When they're 16, they still have to go before a court and get a judge's permission to be able to access abortion. So they still have to plead their case before a judge. Your 12-year-old daughter would not be able to do so. Assistant Minority Leader Puglisi. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that clarification because when I asked the drafters, they, they said that the, the bill was silent and they couldn't find it in statute. So I guess I would really love to have that information so that I can digest it because that, I mean, that is definitely a huge concern for me. Um, my daughter has some severe medical issues. If you asked her what they were, she couldn't tell you that what she has. Um, her father can't even, hasn't even spent the time to figure out what she has, right? And so I get concerned about my daughter. Now, um, the representative did say that this is already in statute where she can go and get all sorts of drugs on her own without telling me, um, even though she doesn't know how those drugs would interact with the other medications she has um, or any of the issues that she has because she doesn't know what she has, right? Um, and so I get incredibly concerned about those issues. Um, I'm glad, and I really would like to understand better the abortion piece. I'm glad that it's 16 because nobody can answer that question for me. So I'd like to see where that says that in statute. Um, because I think that, and we talked about this around um, school mental health assessments. Just my 12 year old is not in a position to make these decisions for herself. Um, and I'm, it's just incredibly disturbing that that is the law that we have and that, that we're expanding that law. Um, but it would be really good to know that my 12 year old cannot get an abortion without my notification and consent um, because there's unintended consequences. I mean, just even just getting away from the policy of it, um, medication and medical issues are not something that my minor child can make decisions about on her own. Um, that's why I'm here, that's why I'm her parent, and I care about her and want to make sure she's getting the appropriate care for her needs um, without compromising the care that I've already gotten for her. So um, thank you, and I would love to see um, a little bit more information to kind of back up the statements that were made today. Thank you. Representative Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's quite an honor to serve with you. And quite an honor to serve with you. It's such an honor to serve with all of you. It's so great to be here this evening and get to really dig into this bill. And I want to thank our bill sponsors for, for bringing this legislation to our state. It's so important that <clears throat> the rights that Coloradans already have to exercise and to access care is truly accessible to them, regardless of what resources they might have available. So just, just to go over a few things that I've observed about this bill already, there's nothing, there's nothing changing about what procedures are legal. Um, there's, that, is, that is already off the table in the state of Colorado. I think it's well established that Coloradans don't want government interfering with our bodies, our bedrooms, telling us what we have to do with the pregnancy, um, or prohibiting us from having care for things like STIs. Um, I think we also all know kind of deep down to our core that People have sex. People have sex even when they're not trying to get pregnant. Uh, that includes adolescents, that includes single people, um, and that oftentimes can include uh, you know, younger folks whose parents are not, are not safe to go to or uh, who do not have, um, are not necessarily uh, in a trusting relationship. And so with that in mind, I do wanna look over some of the information that's available to us from our uh, Public Health and Environment Department about the about the state of things in Colorado when it comes to STIs. So just a statement on their, on structural inequity at the beginning of this report. Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment acknowledges that generations long social, economic, and environmental inequities result in adverse health outcomes. 
They affect communities differently and have greater influence on health outcomes than either individual choices or one's ability to access health care. Reducing health inequities through policies, practices, and organiza organizational systems can help improve opportunities for all Coloradans. CDPHE aspires to present data humbly, recognizing statistics and numbers never tell the complete story. The goal is to work collaboratively with individuals and communities to learn and share their stories and build a collective understanding. Knowing that people have different lived experiences and have inequitable opportunities to achieve optimum health, we commit to pair data and stories to inform programs and systems, programs and systems change to improve health for all. So just the executive summary here. The 2020 Sexually Transmitted Infection Annual Report is descriptive, and its purpose is to present the data in multiple ways for use by local public health agencies, healthcare professionals, nonprofit organizations, and the public. It is intended to be a resource to aid in prevention planning, funding applications, reports, and presentations. It presents statistics and trends for reportable sexually transmitted infections, or STIs, in Colorado. These include chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. STIs are one of the most commonly reported conditions in Colorado and are among the world's most common diseases. In 2020, 37,599 cases of chlamydia, 26,100, sorry, 37,599 cases of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis at all stages were newly reported in Colorado. This year has seen the highest reported cases of gonorrhea and syphilis in Colorado with a slight decrease in chlamydia cases reported. These trends mirror increases at the national level. For more information on national STI trends, please reference the CDC 2020 STD Surveillance Report. This report describes trends in reportable STIs in Colorado by person, place, and time. STI surveillance data are used to detect outbreaks, prioritize resources, develop and tailor interventions, and evaluate the effectiveness of interventions. Some of the reasons for preventing and controlling STIs include high rates of complications and adverse health outcomes. STIs can also, also can facilitate the transmission of HIV and are closely related to other comorbidities such as substance use and mental illness. STIs can also serve as a marker to identify health-related inequities that exist in Colorado communities. On chlamydia, in 2020, Colorado reported 451.9 cases of chlamydia per 100,000, a 13.1% decrease from 2019, and a 2.3% decrease from 2016. The majority of chlamydia cases were among women, 63.4%, and 67.5% of cases among women were between 15 and 24 years of age in 2020. For gonorrhea in 2020, there were 167.5 cases per 100,000, a 0.34% increase from 2019, and a 55% increase from 2016. Males represent a higher proportion of gonorrhea cases, 59.4% when compared to females, and 59.4% of all cases were among those 20 to 34 years of age. There were 30.7 cases of syphilis, at all stages per 100,000 in 2020, a 22.9% increase from 2019 and 129.6% increase from 2016. Males accounted for 81.6% of cases. However, the proportion of women diagnosed with syphilis has been increasing the past several years. Under Colorado law updated in May 2017, healthcare providers and laboratories must report all diagnosed cases of chlamydia and gonorrhea to the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment within four days and all syphilis cases within one workday. These case reports are entered into the statewide STI reporting database. Case reports entered into this database are the primary data source for diagnosed cases of STIs in Colorado. Chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis cases most often require laboratory confirmation. All laboratories submit STI reports to CDPHE, and all major laboratories report STIs electronically via secure data networks. Colorado's STI reporting system, Patient Reporting Investiga Investigating Surveillance Manager, PRISM, there's a new, there's a new uh, acronym for all of us to, to glom onto, is an event-based relational database. This system allows for electronic disease reporting for the vast majority of reports and helps, us, helps to reduce reporting delays due to a small minority of reporting still using a paper-based process. This has led to an improvement in the speed of partner management and treatment activities. Case information is updated as provider reports are received and interviews with patients are completed. 
Additionally, STI-related reports are now geocoded, providing assurance that cases are attributed to the right jurisdiction for official reporting purposes and allowing for more accurate circulation of rates at a geographical level. The National Electronic Telecommunication System for Surveillance is a mechanism for state and local health jurisdictions to transmit surveillance data weekly and the finalized year-end data to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. This year-end data is a primary source of the official STI numbers in this report. Rates of reported cases in this report were calculated based on cases diagnosed in the calendar year per 100,000 persons. The 2020 disease rates for all Colorado counties are calculated by dividing the number of cases diagnosed for that county <clears throat> in 2020 by the 2020 total population for each county estimated by the Colorado State Demography Office and multiplying by 100,000. Race ethnicity categories are in line with the U.S. Census Bureau. Age and sex specific rates of reported cases are presented in this report. The counts presented are summations of all valid data reported in the 2020 reporting year. Rates based on a small number of cases are often statistically unreliable, especially for counties with small populations or where rates are calculated for age, sex, or race and ethnicity with small cell sizes. So here's some guidelines for accurate use of this data. The following guidelines are provided to ensure an accurate understanding of the use, interpretation, and limitations of the data presented in this report. These guidelines can help prevent data misuse and increase understanding of the accuracy and correct use of the STA data. These guidelines may be considered when reviewing data from any source. Data in this report are primarily reported for new cases of STIs diagnosed in 2020. They are, not unique. they are not for unique persons diagnosed with a disease. For example, a person may have one or more occurrence of disease in a single year. Data in this report are based on cases reported to the STI HIV Surveillance Data and Analytics Program, Division of Disease Control and Environmental Ep Epidemiology. These data represent occurrences of disease among persons seeking and receiving care for STIs. Small, number, small changes in numbers from year to year can appear dramatic if the actual number of cases is small. For example, if two cases of gonorrhea are counted in a county in one year and three cases are counted the next year, this is an increase of 50%. While this may sound significant, a change of one case does not represent a meaningful increase in the burden of disease. Although disease rates were calculated for counties reporting fewer than five cases, rates based on low case counts are considered statistically unreliable. Caution is recommended in interpreting trends or comparing across counties. Data are presented for all reported cases and are known not to be 100% complete. Factors that impact the completeness and accuracy of STI data include level of STI screening by healthcare providers, individual test seeking behavior, awareness of illness depends on whether or not an individual is symptomatic, sensitivity of diagnostic tests, compliance with case reporting, completeness of case reporting, timeliness of case reporting, and COVID-19 related delays and supply shortages and reporting. Increases and decreases in STI rates can be due to actual changes in disease occurrence and or changes in one or more of the above factors. CDPHE does not maintain statistics for other non-reportable STIs, for example, herpes, HPV, genital warts, but does maintain statistics for HIV and hepatitis C, which are reported separately but not included here. Early syphilis comprises of primary and secondary syphilis, which is symptomatic, and non-primary, non-secondary, latent syphilis, which is asymptomatic. Syphilis in in infectivity varies based on its presentation. While primary and secondary syphilis is considered to be highly, highly infective, non-primary, non-secondary, latent syphilis is not. For this reason, public health programming may base interventions and evaluation methods on primary and secondary a syphilis infection rate alone. That said, given the morbidity of both primary and secondary and non-primary, non-secondary latent syphilis, we have included information on both presentations. For congenital syphilis, CDPHE previously reported only confirmed cases and not probable cases. After review, CDPHE will be reporting both confirmed and probable cases. Data in this report reflect corrected figures from prior years. And they list some limitations here as well. Due to the increasing number of STIs in Colorado, the percent of unknown, race or ethnicity, unknown by race or ethnicity increased from 2012 to 2017. This was most evident in chlamydia where the percent of unknown race or ethnicity went from 28.1% in 2012 to 50.2% in 2017. 
There was a slight reduction in percent of unknown race by race and ethnicity in 2019 and 2020, 35.8% 30, and 35.7% respectively. Gonorrhea also showed an increase in unknown race and ethnicity from 13.9% in 2012 to 35.3% in 2017, with a decrease in 2018 and 2019, followed by an increase in 2020 at 28.9%. All stages of syphilis, however, have seen a decrease in unknown race, race or ethnicity by 10.1% in 2013 to 5.1% in 2020. When looking specifically at primary and secondary syphilis, the percent of unknown by race and ethnicity went from 9.8% to 2.7% from 2013 to 2020. Non-primary, non-secondary latent syphilis follows the same pattern as chlamydia and gonorrhea, where the percent of unknown by race and ethnicity was 5.1% in 2013, and increased to 6.4% in 2017, with a decrease in 2020 to 3.3%. Race and ethnicity data for chlamydia and gonorrhea is primarily, primarily derived from labs, which often do not report by race and ethnicity and result in less data completeness. And that's just some, some more information I think that went into, that went into this bill that I think is important to know so that we can be preventing as many sexually transmitted infections as possible. And with that, I ask for a yes vote on this bill. Representative Frizzell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a couple of comments. Safe, rare, and legal. Safe, rare, and legal. We here in Colorado already have the most permissive abortion law in this United States. We've come a long, long way from trying to establish a woman's right to choose. So I'm asking, what happened to safe, rare, and legal? We are so far down the road from that that we can't even read that sign. We're talking about minors obtaining contraception, your parents' knowledge. You know, aside from the idea of obtaining an abortion with without having to pay for it, without being able to use insurance or some other means of payment, without a copay. You know, I get that. But I also look at the things that actually are killing us here in this state, the things that people are dying from, cancer, heart disease, lung disease, strokes, Alzheimer's, suicide, diabetes, liver disease. Those people don't get their health care for free. They're still paying co-pays. So how do we pick and choose those winners and losers, folks? I'm going to say this again. What happened to safe, rare, and legal? Because that's not what we're talking about anymore. We're talking about gender affirming care. We're talking about providing abortion, abortions for no cost. We're talking about STIs, candidly, you know, when I, when I was thinking about running for this amazing house of representatives, I never ever thought in my wildest dreams that I would hear um, that, that, that we'd be talking about STIs right here in the well. But as I've often remarked, I'm old and Just not that groovy, I guess. 
So, so my question, and, and I'm just, this is a rhetorical question, of course, because I don't see the cast of thousands out here excited to answer me, jumping up and down, waving their arms. This is, this is, the, this is the answer, Lisa, this is the answer. But my question is, how is it okay for us to pick medical winners and losers here? How is it okay that we don't acknowledge the things that are actually killing us in this state? And say that it's okay to not have to pay for an abortion because that's reproductive care. You know, my, my mother passed away from cancer. And she had to make a lot of decisions. That's a really expensive disease. I really think that this is a broader conversation and I really think that it is not the government's perspective to pick winners and losers on this. So I appreciate you letting me ramble. And I ask for a no vote on this bill. Thank you. Representative Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to state uh, briefly and want to um, express apologies to um, the good representative from El Paso. I had misstated what was actually allowable. And while uh, under Section 13, or Title 13, Section 22, um, 707, notification is not required um, for minors of any age, but um, minors of any age must still have to um, go through a judge to get permission granted. Representative Soper. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and it's an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you, sir. Members, uh, I heard this bill on health and insurance, and uh, one point that uh, I wanted to come down here and talk about is when you turn to page five of the bill, uh, one thing that's all talked about is uh, which health insurance plans are included. It's the individual market, the small group market, and large um, plans that are regulated by the Colorado Division of Insurance. Who's not included would be self-insured plans, also known as ERISA plans. So we actually have an inequity that's created uh, within the bill here. So we have some plans that uh, just won't be covered at all, and then we have uh, these specific plans that are included. And it says that insurance can't subject um, what's being included in the bill to policy deductibles, co-payments, or co-insurance. The one thing that I will talk about a deductible is on a family plan there's also uh, an inequality here, which is that's a family deductible. So if a person is seeking abortion care, that's going to cost anywhere from $700 to $2,000, according to our research. And to not have that count against the family's uh, your uh, deductible um, could actually injure the entire family because the family may have an ER visit that's going to be costing you know, a couple thousand dollars as well, at some point in time during the year, they're going to not be having to pay um, for their health care because they will have met their deductible. And I asked this question in committee, and the testimony that we received in committee was that they thought it was, uh, you know, not part of the bill. It was specifically drafted that way. We, we, we understand why it was. But there's definitely a way to be able to still thread that needle because you need to be able to 
still have it included because if the uh, covered individual, and that could be the, uh, the child in the family, uh, that should still also count against that family's deductible. Uh, even if you're not requiring um, co-payments or co-insurance, I, I, I understand the point that's being made here that you uh, don't want to have any payment that um, has to be made by the covered person. But still, it could lead to very challenging uh, financial times for the family down the road by not being able to include that. The um, other thing that uh, you know, we, we learned in committee and, uh, and talked about quite a bit was that an abortion can be quite um, a traumatic event. And that one thing that's also not included is any sort of um, counseling or uh, anything that would be provided by the healthcare provider as, as a follow-up which is uh, why uh, you know, we've had an, an amendment drafted uh, to help uh, improve this. I move amendment L041 and ask that it be properly displayed. Right, that is properly moved and properly displayed. Representative Soper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is quite reasonable um, to also tell um, health insurance that they would need to cover the follow-up uh, if there's uh, a need on the mental health side of the equation. Uh, we uh, picked five. That you know is a number that, that we just pulled out, but it does seem very important that that also be covered by health insurance. Because the ability to cover the mental health care of a patient who's going through something in very, very traumatic, incredibly traumatic, insurance should also have to cover that. And to say that we're not gonna have insurance cover any of that, that post-care, come on, that's ridiculous. We're going to let insurance now all of a sudden have the deductible kick in, the co-pays kick in, the co-insurance kick in. We're not going to view that as the continuity and the continuation of care. We need to have a heart for the patient. And we need to be able to talk about the patient in these particular cases. And we talk a lot about mental health in this building. But we need to be able to address the mental health needs of a patient. And I know that um, five is an arbitrary number. That's, that's something we can you know, work on. M maybe it's just the ability of one. But, but to have at least the option of uh, some um, post-care um, visit be able to be included as part of your health insurance plan also seems very reasonable. Would ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Representative Michael Sinjanae. Thank you, um, Madam, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> I was gonna call you Madam Speaker, Mr. Chair, and I apologize. Um, you know, I, I think that as far as therapy sessions go, um, probably no one comes up here and talks about therapy sessions more than I talk about therapy sessions. And um, I think, quite frankly, that everybody should be in therapy. You don't need to have an abortion to go to therapy. Um, therapy is very good and very helpful. However, in, in this scenario, um, we are putting on a mandate on top of a mandate, which is going to further increase the cost of our healthcare expenses. And I don't believe that putting that mandate on top of the um, requirement to cover the insurance and the coinsurance um, that we would be that we would be looked on very favorably by the insurance industry. Now, that being said, I have asked a lot of the insurance industry, and I I just think that requiring people to go through therapy after an, after an abortion in this way 
seems to indicate in some way, shape, or form that an abortion is bad. Now, I disagree that an abortion is bad. Um, did I need therapy after my abortion? Certainly, but I needed therapy before the abortion too. It didn't have to do with the abortion that I needed therapy. And as a result, asking for requiring, not only asking, but requiring post-abortive therapy sessions, I think is a real um, indecency. And um, Mr. Chair, I, I also, I, my, my belief here is that with a, an amendment like this, we would be increasing the cost of uh, premiums and therefore decreasing access to abortion. And so I ask for a title ruling. All right, members, the committee will stand in a brief recess to discuss whether the amendment fits under the title. Will Rep. Soper and the bill sponsors please join me up here?